Chapter Eleven of Robinson Crusoe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe, by Daniel Defoe, Chapter Eleven, finds print of man's foot on the sand. It would have made a stoic smile to have seen me and my little family sit down to dinner. There was my majesty the prince and lord of the whole island. I had the lives of all my subjects at my absolute command. I could hang, draw, give liberty, and take it away, and no rebels among all my subjects. Then, to see how like a king I dined, too, all alone, attended by my servants. Paul, as if he had been my favourite, was the only person permitted to talk to me. My dog— who was now grown old and crazy, and had found no species to multiply his kind upon, sat always at my right hand, and two cats, one on one side of the table and one on the other, expecting now and then a bit from my hand as a mark of a special favour. But these were not the two cats which I brought on shore at first, for they were both of them dead, and had been interred near my habitation by my own hand, but one of them having multiplied by I know not what kind of creature, these were two which I had preserved tame, whereas the rest ran wild in the woods, and became indeed troublesome to me at last, for they would often come into my house and plunder me too, till at last I was obliged to shoot them, and did kill a great many. At length they left me. With this attendance, and in this plentiful manner I lived, neither could I be said to want anything but society, and of that, some time after this, I was likely to have too much." I was something impatient, as I have observed, to have the use of my boat, though very loath to run any more hazards, and therefore sometimes I sat contriving ways to get her about the island, and at other times I sat myself down contented enough without her. But I had a strange uneasiness in my mind to go down to the point of the island where, as I have said in my last ramble, I went up the hill to see how the shore lay, and how the current set, that I might see what I had to do. This inclination increased upon me every day, and at length I resolved to travel thither by land, following the edge of the shore. I did so, but had any one in England met such a man as I was, it must either have frightened him, or raised a great deal of laughter, and as I frequently stood still to look at myself, I could not but smile at the notion of my travelling through Yorkshire with such an equipage, and in such a dress." be pleased to take a sketch of my figure, as follows. I had a great high shapeless cap, made of a goat's skin, with a flap hanging down behind, as well to keep the sun from me as to shoot the rain off from running into my neck, nothing being so hurtful in these climates as the rain upon the flesh under the clothes. I had a short jacket of goat's skin, the skirts coming down to about the middle of the thighs, and a pair of open-kneed breeches of the same, the breeches were made of the skin of an old he-goat, whose hair hung down such a length on either side that, like pantaloons, it reached to the middle of my legs. Stockings and shoes I had none, but it made me a pair of somethings, I scarce knew what to call them, like buskins, to flap over my legs, and lace on either side like spattered ashes, but of a most barbarous shape, as indeed were all the rest of my clothes. I had on a broad belt of goat-skin dried, which I drew together with two thongs of the same instead of buckles, and in a kind of a frog on either side of this, instead of a sword and dagger, hung a little saw and a hatchet, one on one side and one on the other. I had another belt not so broad, and fastened in the same manner, which hung over my shoulder, and at the end of it, under my left arm, hung two pouches, both made of goat-skin too, in one of which hung my powder, in the other my shot. At my back I carried my basket, and on my shoulder my gun, and over my head a great clumsy, ugly, goat-skin umbrella, but which, after all, was the most necessary thing I had about me, next to my gun. As for my face, the colour of it was really not so mulatto-like, as one might expect from a man not at all careful of it, and living within nine or ten degrees of the equinox. My beard I had once suffered to grow till it was about a quarter of a yard long, but as I had both scissors and razors sufficient, I had cut it pretty short, except what grew on my upper lip, 
which I had trimmed into a large pair of Mahometan whiskers, such as I had seen worn by some Turks at Sali. For the Moors did not wear such, though the Turks did, of these mustachios, or whiskers, I will not say they were long enough to hang my hat upon them, but they were of a length and shape monstrous enough, and such as in England would have passed for frightful. But all this is by the by, for as to my figure, I had so few to observe me that it was of no manner of consequence, so I say no more of that. In this kind of dress I went my new journey, and was out five or six days. I travelled first along the seashore, directly to the place where I first brought my boat to an anchor to get upon the rocks, and having no boat now to take care of, I went over the land a nearer way to the same height that I was upon before, when, looking forward to the points of the rocks which lay out, and which I was obliged to double with my boat, as is said above, I was surprised to see the sea all smooth and quiet, no rippling, no motion, no current, any more there than in other places. I was at a strange loss to understand this, and resolved to spend some time in the observing it, to see if nothing from the sets of the tide had occasioned it. But I was presently convinced how it was, that is, that the tide of ebb setting from the west, and joining with the current of waters from some great river on the shore, must be the occasion of this current, and that, according as the wind blew more forcibly from the west or from the north, this current came nearer or went farther from the shore. For waiting thereabouts till evening, I went up to the rock again, and then the tide of ebb being made, I plainly saw the current again as before, only that it ran farther off, being near half a league from the shore, whereas in my case it set close upon the shore, and hurried me and my canoe along with it, which at another time it would not have done. This observation convinced me that I had nothing to do but to observe the ebbing and the flowing of the tide, and I might very easily bring my boat about the island again. But when I began to think of putting it in practice, I had such terror upon my spirits at the remembrance of the danger I had been in, that I could not think of it again with any patience. But, on the contrary, I took up another resolution, which was more safe, though more laborious, and this was, that I would build— or rather make, me another periagua, or canoe, and so have one for one side of the island, and one for the other. You are to understand that now I had, as I may call it, two plantations in the island, one my little fortification or tent, with a wall about it, under the rock, with a cave behind me, which by this time I had enlarged into several apartments or caves, one within another. One of these, which was the driest and largest, and had a door out beyond my wall or fortification, that is to say, beyond where my wall joined to the rock, was all filled up with the large earthen pots of which I have given an account, and with fourteen or fifteen great baskets, which would hold five or six bushels each, where I laid up my stores of provisions, especially my corn, some in the ear, cut off short from the straw, and the other rubbed out with my hand. As for my wall, made as before, with long stakes or piles, those piles grew all like trees, and were by this time grown so big, and spread so very much, that there was not the least appearance to any one's view of any habitation behind them. Near this dwelling of mine, but a little farther within the land, and upon lower ground, lay my two pieces of corn-land, which I kept duly cultivated and sowed, and which duly yielded me their harvest in its season and whenever I had occasion for more corn, I had more land adjoining as fit as that. Besides this, I had my country seat, and I had now a tolerable plantation there also. For first, I had my little bower, as I called it, which I kept in repair. That is to say, I kept the hedge which encircled it and constantly fitted up to its usual height, the latter standing always in the inside. I kept the trees, which at first were no more than stakes, but were now grown very firm and tall, always cut, so that they might spread and grow thick and wild, and make the more agreeable shade, which they did effectually, to my mind. In the middle of this I had my tent always standing, being a piece of a sail spread over poles, set up for that purpose, and which never wanted any repair or renewing, and under this I had made me a squab or couch with the skins of the creatures I had killed, 
and with other soft things, and a blanket laid on them, such as belonged to our sea-bedding, which I had saved, and a great watch-coat to cover me. And here, whenever I had occasion to be absent from my chief seat, I took up my country habitation. Adjoining to this I had my enclosures for my cattle, that is to say, my goats, and I had taken an inconceivable deal of pains to fence and enclose this ground. I was so anxious to see it kept entire, lest the goats should break through, that I never left off till, with infinite labour, I had stuck the outside of the hedge so full of small stakes, and so near to one another, that it was rather a pale than a hedge, and there was scarce room to put a hand through between them, which afterwards, when those stakes grew, as they all did in the next rainy season, made the enclosure strong like a wall, indeed stronger than any wall. This will testify for me that I was not idle, and that I spared no pains to bring to pass whatever appeared necessary for my comfortable support, for I considered the keeping up a breed of tame creatures thus at my hand would be a living magazine of flesh, milk, butter, and cheese for me as long as I lived in the place, if it were to be forty years, and that keeping them in my reach depended entirely upon my perfecting my enclosures to such a degree that I might be sure of keeping them together, which by this method, indeed, I so effectually secured, that when these little stakes began to grow, I had planted them so very thick that I was forced to pull some of them up again. In this place also I had my grapes growing, which I principally depended on for my winter store of raisins, and which I never failed to preserve very carefully, as the best and most agreeable dainty of my whole diet and indeed they were not only agreeable, but medicinal, wholesome, nourishing, and refreshing to the last degree. As this was also about halfway between my other habitation and the place where I had laid up my boat, I generally stayed and lay here in my way thither, for I used frequently to visit my boat, and I kept all things about or belonging to her in very good order. Sometimes I went out in her to divert myself, but no more hazardous voyages would I go, scarcely ever above a stone's cast or two from the shore. I was so apprehensive of being hurried out of my knowledge again by the currents or winds, or any other accident. But now I come to a new scene of my life. It happened one day, about noon, going towards my boat. I was exceedingly surprised with the print of a man's naked foot on the shore, which was very plain to be seen on the sand. I stood like one thunderstruck, or as if I had seen an apparition. I listened, I looked round me, but I could hear nothing, nor see anything. I went up to a rising ground to look farther. I went up the shore and down the shore, but it was all one. I could see no other impression but that one. I went to it again to see if there were any more, and to observe if it might not be my fancy but there was no room for that, for there was exactly the print of a foot, toes, heel, and every part of a foot. How it came thither I knew not, nor could I in the least imagine, but after innumerable fluttering thoughts, like a man perfectly confused and out of myself, I came home to my fortification, not feeling, as we say, the ground I went on, but terrified to the last degree, looking behind me at every two or three steps, mistaking every bush and tree, and fancying every stump at a distance to be a man. Nor is it possible to describe how many various shapes my affrighted imagination represented things to me in, how many wild ideas were found every moment in my fancy, and what strange, unaccountable whimsies came into my thoughts by the way. When I came to my castle, for so I think I called it ever after this, I fled into it like one pursued. Whether I went over by the ladder, as first contrived, or went in at the hole in the rock, which I had called a door, I cannot remember. No, nor could I remember the next morning, for never frightened hare fled to cover, or fox to earth, with more terror of mind than I to this retreat. I slept none that night. The farther I was from the occasion of my fright, the greater my apprehensions were, which is something contrary to the nature of such things, and especially to the usual practice of all creatures in fear. But I was so embarrassed with my own frightful ideas of the thing, 
that I formed nothing but dismal imaginations to myself, even though I was now a great way off. Sometimes I fancied it must be the devil, and reason joined in with me in this supposition, for how should any other thing in human shape come into the place? Where was the vessel that brought them? What marks were there of any other footstep? And how was it possible a man should come there? But then, to think that Satan should take human shape upon him in such a place, where there could be no manner of occasion for it, but to leave the print of his foot behind him, and that even for no purpose too, for he could not be sure I should see it, this was an amusement the other way. I considered that the devil might have found out abundance of other ways to have terrified me than this of the single print of a foot, that as I lived quite on the other side of the island he would never have been so simple as to leave a mark in a place where it was ten thousand to one whether I should ever see it or not, and in the sand, too, which the first surge of the sea upon a high wind would have defaced entirely. All this seemed inconsistent with the thing itself with all the notions we usually entertain of the subtlety of the devil. Abundance of such things as these assisted to argue me out of all apprehensions of its being the devil, and I presently concluded then that it must be some more dangerous creature, that is, that it must be some of the savages of the mainland opposite who had wandered out to sea in their canoes, and either driven by the currents or by contrary winds, had made the island, and had been on shore, but were gone away again to sea, being as loath perhaps to have stayed in this desolate island as I would have been to have had them. While these reflections were rolling in my mind, I was very thankful in my thoughts that I was so happy as not to be thereabouts at that time, or that they did not see my boat, by which they would have concluded that some inhabitants had been in the place, and perhaps have searched farther for me. Then terrible thoughts racked my imagination about their having found out my boat, and that there were people here, and that, if so, I should certainly have them come again in greater numbers and devour me, that if it should happen that they should not find me, yet they would find my enclosure, destroy all my corn, and carry away all my flock of tame goats, and I should perish at last for mere want. Thus my fear banished all my religious hope, all that former confidence in God, which was founded upon such wonderful experience as I had had of His goodness, as if He that had fed me by miracle, hitherto, could not preserve by His power the provision which He had made for me by His goodness. I reproached myself with my laziness, that would not sow any more corn one year than would just serve me till the next season, as if no accident could intervene to prevent my enjoying the crop that was upon the ground and this I thought so just a reproof, that I resolved for the future to have two or three years' corn beforehand, so that, whatever might come, I might not perish for want of bread. How strange a checker work of providence is the life of man! And by what secret different springs are the affections hurried about, as different circumstances present! To-day we love what to-morrow we hate, to-day we seek what to-morrow we shun, Today we desire what tomorrow we fear, nay, even tremble at the apprehensions of. This was exemplified in me at this time, in the most lively manner imaginable, for I, whose only affliction was that I seemed banished from human society, that I was alone, circumscribed by the boundless ocean, cut off from mankind, and condemned to what I call silent life, that I was as one whom heaven thought not worthy to be numbered among the living, or to appear among the rest of his creatures, that to have seen one of my own species would have seemed to me a raising me from death to life, and the greatest blessing that heaven itself, next to the supreme blessing of salvation, could bestow. I say, that I should now tremble at the very apprehensions of seeing a man, and was ready to sink into the ground at but the shadow or silent appearance of a man having set his foot in the island. Such is the uneven state of human life, and it afforded me a great many curious speculations afterwards, when I had a little recovered my first surprise. I considered that this was the station of life the infinitely wise and good providence of God had determined for me, 
that as I could not foresee what the ends of divine wisdom might be in all this, so I was not to dispute his sovereignty, who, as I was his creature, had an undoubted right, by creation, to govern and dispose of me absolutely as he thought fit, and who, as I was a creature that had offended him, had likewise a judicial right to condemn me to what punishment he thought fit, and that it was my part to submit to bear his indignation, because I had sinned against him. I then reflected that as God, who was not only righteous but omnipotent, had thought fit thus to punish and afflict me, so he was able to deliver me, that if he did not think fit to do so, it was my unquestioned duty to resign myself absolutely and entirely to his will. And, on the other hand, it was my duty also to hope in him, pray to him, and quietly to attend to the dictates and directions of his daily providence. These thoughts took me up many hours, days, nay, I may say weeks and months, and one particular effect of my cogitations on this occasion I cannot omit. One morning early, lying in my bed, and filled with thoughts about my danger from the appearances of savages, I found it discomposed me very much, upon which these words of the Scripture came into my thoughts, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Upon this, rising cheerfully out of my bed, my heart was not only comforted, but I was guided and encouraged to pray earnestly to God for deliverance. When I had done praying, I took up my Bible, and opening it to read, the first words that presented to me were, Wait on the Lord, and be of good cheer, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. It is impossible to express the comfort this gave me. In answer, I thankfully laid down the book, and was no more sad, at least on that occasion. In the middle of these cogitations, apprehensions, and reflections, it came into my thoughts one day that all this might be a mere chimera of my own, and that this foot might be the print of my own foot when I came on shore from my boat. This cheered me up a little, too, and I began to persuade myself it was all a delusion, that it was nothing else but my own foot, and why might I not come that way from the boat, as well as I was going that way to the boat. Again, I considered also that I could by no means tell for certain where I had trod, and where I had not, and that if at last this was only the print of my own foot, I had played the part of those fools who try to make stories of spectres and apparitions, and then are frightened at them more than anybody. Now I began to take courage, and to peep abroad again, for I had not stirred out of my castle for three days and nights, so that I began to starve for provisions, for I had little or nothing within doors but some barley cakes and water. Then I knew that my goats wanted to be milked too, which usually was my evening diversion, and the poor creatures were in great pain and inconvenience for want of it, and indeed it almost spoiled some of them, and almost dried up their milk. Encouraging myself, therefore, with the belief that this was nothing but the print of one of my own feet, and that I might be truly said to start at my own shadow, I began to go abroad again, and went to my country house to milk my flock, but to see with what fear I went forward, how often I looked behind me, how I was ready every now and then to lay down my basket and run for my life, it would have made any one have thought I was haunted with an evil conscience, or that I had been lately most terribly frightened, and so, indeed, I had. However, I went down thus two or three days, and having seen nothing, I began to be a little bolder, and to think there was really nothing in it but my own imagination. But I could not persuade myself fully of this till I should go down to the shore again, and see this print of a foot, and measure it by my own, and see if there was any similitude or fitness, that I might be assured it was my own foot. But when I came to the place, first it appeared evidently to me that when I laid up my boat I could not possibly be on shore anywhere thereabouts. Secondly, when I came to measure the mark with my own foot, I found my foot not so large by a great deal. Both these things filled my head with new imaginations, and gave me the vapours again to the highest degree, 
so that I shook with cold like one in an ague, and I went home again, filled with the belief that some man or men had been on shore there, or, in short, that the island was inhabited, and I might be surprised before I was aware, and what course to take for my security I knew not. Oh, what ridiculous resolutions men take when possessed with fear! It deprives them of the use of those means which reason offers for their relief. The first thing I proposed to myself was, to throw down my enclosures, and turn all my tame cattle wild into the woods, lest the enemy should find them, and then frequent the island in prospect of the same or the like booty. Then the simple thing of digging up my two cornfields, lest they should find such a grain there, and still be prompted to frequent the island. Then to demolish my bower and tent, that they might not see any vestiges of habitation, and be prompted to look farther in order to find out the persons inhabiting. These were the subjects of the first night's cogitations after I was come home again, while the apprehensions which had so overrun my mind were fresh upon me, and my head was full of vapours. Thus fear of danger is ten thousand times more terrifying than danger itself, when apparent to the eyes, and we find the burden of anxiety greater by much than the evil which we are anxious about. And what was worse than all this, I had not that relief in this trouble that from the resignation I used to practice I hoped to have. I looked, I thought, like Saul, who complained not only that the Philistines were upon him, but that God had forsaken him, for I did not now take due ways to compose my mind, by crying to God in my distress, and resting upon his providence, as I had done before, for my defence and deliverance which, if I had done, I had at least been more cheerfully supported under this new surprise, and perhaps carried through it with more resolution. This confusion of my thoughts kept me awake all night, but in the morning I fell asleep, and having, by the amusement of my mind, been as it were tired, and my spirits exhausted, I slept very soundly, and waked much better composed than I had ever been before. And now I began to think sedately, and upon debate with myself, I concluded that this island, which was so exceedingly pleasant, fruitful, and no farther from the mainland than I had seen, was not so entirely abandoned as I might imagine, that although there were no stated inhabitants who lived on the spot, yet that there might sometimes come boats off from the shore, who, either with design, or perhaps never but when they were driven by cross winds, might come to this place, that I had lived there fifteen years now, and had not met with the least shadow or figure of any people yet, and that, if at any time they should be driven here, it was probable they went away again as soon as ever they could, seeing they had never thought fit to fix here upon any occasion, that the most I could suggest any danger from was from any casual accidental landing of straggling people from the main, who, as it was likely, if they were driven hither, were here against their wills. So they made no stay here, but went off again with all possible speed, seldom staying one night on shore, lest they should not have the help of the tides and daylight back again. And that, therefore, I had nothing to do but to consider of some safe retreat, in case I should see any savages land upon the spot." Now I began sorely to repent that I had dug my cave so large as to bring a door through again, which door, as I said, came out beyond where my fortification joined to the rock. Upon maturely considering this, therefore, I resolved to draw me a second fortification, in the manner of a semicircle, at a distance from my wall, just where I had planted a double row of trees about twelve years before, of which I made mention these trees having been planted so thick before, they wanted but few piles to be driven between them, that they might be thicker and stronger, and my wall would be soon finished. So that I had now a double wall, and my outer wall was thickened with pieces of timber, old cables, and everything I could think of to make it strong, having in it seven little holes, about as big as I might put my arm out at. In the inside of this I thickened my wall to about ten feet thick, with continually bringing earth out of my cave, and laying it at the foot of the wall, and walking upon it, and through the seven holes I contrived to plant the muskets, of which I took notice that I had got seven on shore, out of the ship. These I planted like my cannon, 
and fitted them into frames that held them like a carriage, so that I could fire all the seven guns in two minutes' time. This wall I was many a weary month in finishing, and yet never thought myself safe till it was done. When this was done, I stuck all the ground without my wall, for a great length every way, as full with stakes or sticks of the osher-like wood, which I found so apt to grow, as they could well stand, insomuch that I believe I might set in near twenty thousand of them, leaving a pretty large space between them and my wall, that I might have room to see an enemy, and that they might have no shelter from the young trees, if they attempted to approach my outer wall. Thus in two years' time I had a thick grove, and in five or six years' time I had a wood before my dwelling, growing so monstrously thick and strong that it was indeed perfectly impassable, and no man, of what kind soever, could ever imagine that there was anything beyond it, much less a habitation. As to the way which I proposed to myself to go in and out, for I left no avenue, it was by setting two ladders— one to a part of the rock which was low, and then broke in, and left room to place another ladder upon that. So when the two ladders were taken down, no man living could come down to me without doing himself mischief, and if they had come down, they were still on the outside of my outer wall. Thus I took all the measures human prudence could suggest for my own preservation, and it will be seen at length that they were not altogether without just reason though I foresaw nothing at that time more than my mere fear suggested to me. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of Robinson Crusoe This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. THE LIFE AND ADVENTURES OF ROBINSON CRUSOE by Daniel Defoe CHAPTER Twelve: A CAVE RETREAT While this was doing, I was not altogether careless of my other affairs, for I had a great concern upon me for my little herd of goats. They were not only a ready supply to me on every occasion, and began to be sufficient for me, without the expense of powder and shot, but also without the fatigue of hunting after the wild ones and I was loath to lose the advantage of them, and to have them all to nurse up over again. For this purpose, after long consideration, I could think of but two ways to preserve them. One was, to find another convenient place to dig a cave underground, and to drive them into it every night, and the other was to enclose two or three little bits of land, remote from one another, and as much concealed as I could, where I might keep about half a dozen young goats in each place so that if any disaster happened to the flock in general, I might be able to raise them again with little trouble in time. And this, though it would require a good deal of time and labor, I thought was the most rational design. Accordingly, I spent some time to find out the most retired parts of the island, and I pitched upon one which was as private indeed as my heart could wish. It was a little damp piece of ground in the middle of the hollow and thick woods, where, as is observed, I almost lost myself once before, endeavouring to come back that way from the eastern part of the island. Here I found a clear piece of land, nearly three acres, so surrounded with woods that it was almost an enclosure by nature. At least it did not want near so much labour to make it so as the other piece of ground I had worked so hard at. I immediately went to work with this piece of ground, and in less than a month's time I had so fenced it round that my flock, or herd, call it which you please, which were not so wild now as at first they might be supposed to be, were well enough secured in it. So, without any further delay, I removed ten young she-goats and two he-goats to this piece, and when they were there I continued to perfect the fence till I had made it as secure as the other, which, however, I did at more leisure, and it took me up more time by a great deal. All this labour I was at the expense of, purely for my apprehensions on account of the print of a man's foot, for as yet I had never seen any human creature come near the island, and I had now lived two years under this uneasiness, which, indeed, made my life much less comfortable than it was before, 
as may be well imagined by any who know what it is to live in the constant snare of the fear of man. And this I must observe, with grief, too, that the discomposure of my mind had great impression also upon the religious part of my thoughts, for the dread and terror of falling into the hands of savages and cannibals lay so upon my spirits, that I seldom found myself in a due temper for application to my Maker, at least not with the sedate calmness and resignation of soul which I was wont to do. I rather prayed to God as under great affliction and pressure of mind, surrounded with danger, and in expectation every night of being murdered and devoured before morning. And I must testify, from my experience, that a temper of peace, thankfulness, love, and affection is much the more proper frame for prayer than that of terror and discomposure, and that under the dread of mischief impending, a man is no more fit for a comforting performance of the duty of praying to God than he is for a repentance on a sickbed. For these discomposures affect the mind as the others do the body, and the discomposure of the mind must necessarily be as great a disability as that of the body, and much greater, praying to God being properly an act of the mind, not of the body. But to go on. After I had thus secured one part of my little living stock, I went about the whole island searching for another private place to make such another deposit, when, wandering more to the west point of the island than I had ever done yet, and looking out to sea, I thought I saw a boat upon the sea at a great distance. I had found a perspective glass or two in one of the seamen's chests, which I saved out of our ship, but I had it not about me and this was so remote that I could not tell what to make of it, though I looked at it till my eyes were not able to hold to look any longer. Whether it was a boat or not, I do not know. But as I descended from the hill I could see no more of it, so I gave it over. Only I resolved to go no more out without a perspective glass in my pocket. When I was come down the hill to the end of the island, where, indeed, I had never been before, I was presently convinced that the seeing the print of the man's foot was not such a strange thing in the island as I imagined, but that it was a special providence that I was cast upon the side of the island where the savages never came, I should easily have known that nothing was more frequent than for the canoes from the main, when they happened to be a little too far out at sea, to shoot over to that side of the island for harbour. Likewise, as they often met and fought in their canoes, the victors, having taken any prisoners, would bring them over to the shore, where, according to their dreadful customs, being all cannibals, they would kill and eat them, of which hereafter. When I was come down the hill to the shore, as I said above, being the southwest point of the island, I was perfectly confounded and amazed, nor is it possible for me to express the horror of my mind at seeing the shore spread with skulls hands, feet, and other bones of human bodies, and particularly I observed a place where there had been a fire made, and a circle dug in the earth, like a cockpit, where I supposed the savage wretches had sat down to their human feastings upon the bodies of their fellow creatures. I was so astonished with the sight of these things, that I entertained no notions of any danger to myself from it for a long while. All my apprehensions were buried in the thoughts of such a pitch of inhuman, hellish brutality, and the horror of the degeneracy of human nature, which, though I had heard of it often, yet I never had so near a view of before. In short, I turned away my face from the horrid spectacle, my stomach grew sick, and I was just at the point of fainting, when nature discharged the disorder from my stomach, and having vomited with uncommon violence, I was a little relieved, but could not bear to stay in the place a moment. So I got up the hill again with all the speed I could, and walked on towards my own habitation. When I came a little out of that part of the island, I stood still a while, as amazed, and then, recovering myself, I looked up with the utmost affection of my soul, and with a flood of tears in my eyes, gave God thanks that had cast my first lot in a part of the world where I was distinguished from such dreadful creatures as these, and that, though I had esteemed my present condition very miserable, had yet given me so many comforts in it, 
that I had still more to give thanks for than to complain of, and this, above all, that I had, even in this miserable condition, been comforted with the knowledge of himself, and the hope of his blessing, which was a felicity more than sufficiently equivalent to all the misery which I had suffered or could suffer. In this frame of thankfulness I went home to my castle and began to be much easier now, as to the safety of my circumstances, than ever I was before, for I observed that these wretches never came to this island in search of what they could get, perhaps not seeking, not wanting, or not expecting anything here, and having often, no doubt, been up the covered, woody part of it without finding anything to their purpose. I knew I had been here now almost eighteen years, and never saw the least footsteps of human creature there before, and I might be eighteen years more as entirely concealed as I was now, if I did not discover myself to them, which I had no manner of occasion to do, it being my only business to keep myself entirely concealed where I was, unless I found a better sort of creatures than cannibals to make myself known to. Yet I entertain such an abhorrence of the savage wretches that I have been speaking of, and of the wretched, inhuman custom of their devouring and eating one another up, that I continued pensive and sad, and kept close within my own circle for almost two years after this. When I say my own circle, I mean by it my three plantations, that is, my castle, my country seat, which I called my bower, and my enclosure in the woods nor did I look after this for any other use than an enclosure for my goats, for the aversion which nature gave me to these hellish wretches was such that I was as fearful of seeing them as of seeing the devil himself. I did not so much as go to look after my boat all this time, but began rather to think of making another, for I could not think of ever making any more attempts to bring the other boat round the island to me, lest I should meet with some of these creatures at sea, in which case, if I had happened to have fallen into their hands, I knew what would have been my lot. Time, however, and the satisfaction I had that I was in no danger of being discovered by these people, began to wear off my uneasiness about them, and I began to live just in the same composed manner as before, only with this difference, that I used more caution and kept my eyes more about me than I did before, lest I should happen to be seen by any of them, and particularly I was more cautious of firing my gun, lest any of them, being on the island, should happen to hear it. It was, therefore, a very good providence to me that I had furnished myself with a tame breed of goats, and that I had no need to hunt any more about the woods or shoot at them, and if I did catch any of them after this, it was by traps and snares, as I had done before, so that for two years after this I believe I never fired my gun once off, though I never went out without it, and what was more, as I saved three pistols out of the ship, I always carried them out with me, or at least two of them, sticking them in my goatskin belt. I also furbished up one of the great cutlasses that I had out of the ship, and made me a belt to hang it on also so that I was now a most formidable fellow to look at when I went abroad, if you add to the former description of myself the particular of two pistols and a broadsword hanging at my side in a belt, but without a scabbard. Things going on thus, as I have said, for some time, I seemed, accepting these cautions, to be reduced to my former calm, sedate way of living. All these things tended to show me more and more how far my condition was from being miserable, compared to some others, nay, to many other particulars of life, which it may have pleased God to have made my lot. It put me upon reflecting how little repining there would be among mankind, at any condition of life, if people would rather compare their condition with those that were worse, in order to be thankful, than by always comparing them with those which are better, to assist their murmurings and complainings. As in my present condition there were not really many things which I wanted, so indeed I thought that the frights I had been in about these savage wretches, and the concern I had been in for my own preservation, had taken off the edge of my invention, for my own conveniences, 
and I had dropped a good design, which I had once bent my thoughts upon, and that was to try if I could not make some of my barley into malt, and then try to brew myself some beer. This was really a whimsical thought, and I reproved myself often for the simplicity of it, for I presently saw there would be the want of several things necessary to the making my beer that it would be impossible for me to supply, as first, casks to preserve it in, which was a thing that, as I have observed already, I could never compass. No, though I spent not only many days, but weeks, nay, months, in attempting it, but to no purpose. In the next place, I had no hops to make it keep, no yeast to make it work, no copper or kettle to make it boil, and yet with all these things wanting, I verily believe, had not the frights and terrors I was in about the savages intervened, I had undertaken it, and perhaps brought it to pass, too, for I seldom gave anything over without accomplishing it, when once I had it in my head to begin it. But my invention now ran quite another way. For night and day I could think of nothing but how I might destroy some of the monsters in their cruel, bloody entertainment, and if possible save the victim they should bring hither to destroy. It would take up a larger volume than this whole work is intended to be, to set down all the contrivances I hatched, or rather brooded upon, in my thoughts, for the destroying these creatures, or at least frightening them so as to prevent their coming hither any more. But all this was abortive, nothing could be possible to take effect, unless I was to be there to do it myself, and what could one man do among them? when perhaps there might be twenty or thirty them together with their darts, or their bows and arrows, with which they could shoot as true to a mark as I could with my gun. Sometimes I thought of digging a hole under the place where they made their fire, and putting in five or six pounds of gunpowder, which, when they kindled their fire, would consequently take fire and blow up all that was near it. <laughs> but— as in the first place I should be unwilling to waste so much powder upon them, my store being now within the quantity of one barrel, so neither could I be sure of its going off at any certain time, when it might surprise them, and at best that it would do little more than just blow the fire about their ears and fright them, but not sufficient to make them forsake the place. So I laid it aside, and then proposed that I would place myself in ambush in some convenient place, with my three guns all double-loaded, and in the middle of their bloody ceremony let fly at them, when I should be sure to kill or wound perhaps two or three at every shot, and then falling in upon them with my three pistols and my sword, I made no doubt but that, if there were twenty, I should kill them all. This fancy pleased my thoughts for some weeks, and I was so full of it that I often dreamed of it and sometimes that I was just going to let fly at them in my sleep. I went so far with it in my imagination that I employed myself several days to find out proper places to put myself in ambuscade, as I said, to watch for them, and I went frequently to the place itself, which was now grown more familiar to me. But while my mind was thus filled with thoughts of revenge, and a bloody putting twenty or thirty of them to the sword, as I may call it, the horror I had at the place, and the signals of the barbarous wretches devouring one another, abetted my malice. Well, at length I found a place in the side of the hill where I was satisfied I might securely wait till I saw any of their boats coming, and might then, even before they would be ready to come on shore, convey myself unseen into some thickets of trees, in one of which there was a hollow large enough to conceal me entirely and there I might sit and observe all their bloody doings, and take my full aim at their heads, when they were so close together as that it would be next to impossible that I should miss my shot, or that I could fail wounding three or four of them at the first shot. In this place, then, I resolved to fulfil my design, and accordingly I prepared two muskets and my ordinary fowling-piece. The two muskets I loaded with a brace of slugs each, and four or five smaller bullets, about the size of pistol bullets, and the fowling piece I loaded with near a handful of swan shot of the largest size. I also loaded my pistols with about four bullets each, and in this posture, well provided with ammunition for a second and third charge, I prepared myself for my expedition. 
After I had thus laid the scheme of my design, and in my imagination put it into practice, I continually made my tour every morning to the top of the hill, which was from my castle, as I call it, about three miles or more, to see if I could observe any boats upon the sea, coming near the island, or standing over towards it. But I began to tire of this hard duty, after I had for two or three months constantly kept my watch, but came always back without any discovery, there having not in all that time been the least appearance, not even on or near the shore, but on the whole ocean, so far as my eye or glass could reach every way. As long as I kept my daily tour to the hill, to look out, so long also I kept up the vigour of my design and my spirit seemed to be all the while in a suitable frame for so outrageous an execution as the killing of twenty or thirty naked savages, for an offence which I had not at all entered into any discussion of in my thoughts, any farther than my passions were at first fired by the horror I conceived at the unnatural custom of the people of that country, who, it seems, had been suffered by Providence, in his wise disposition of the world, to have no other guide than that of their own abominable and vitiated passions, and consequently were left, and perhaps had been so for some ages, to act such horrid things, and receive such dreadful customs, as nothing but nature, entirely abandoned by heaven, and actuated by some hellish degeneracy, which could have run them into. But now, when, as I have said, I began to be weary of the fruitless excursion which I made so long and so far every morning in vain. So my opinion of the action itself began to alter, and I began, with cooler and calmer thoughts, to consider what I was going to engage in, what authority or call I had to pretend to be judge and executioner upon these men as criminals, whom heaven had thought fit for so many ages to suffer unpunished to go on and to be, as it were, the executioners of his judgments one upon another. How far these people were offenders against me, and what right I had to engage in the quarrel of that blood which they shed promiscuously upon one another. I debated this very often with myself thus. How do I know what God himself judges in this particular case? It is certain these people do not commit this as a crime. It is not against their own consciences reproving, or their light reproaching them. They do not know it to be an offence, and then commit it in defiance of divine justice, as we do in almost all the sins we commit. They think it no more a crime to kill a captive taken in war than we do to kill an ox, or to eat human flesh than we do to eat mutton. When I considered this a little, it followed necessarily that I was certainly in the wrong, that these people were not murderers, in the sense that I had before condemned them in my thoughts, any more than those Christians were murderers who often put to death the prisoners taken in battle, or more frequently, upon many occasions, put whole troops of men to the sword, without giving quarter, though they threw down their arms and submitted. In the next place, it occurred to me that although the usage they gave one another was thus brutish and inhuman, yet it was really nothing to me. These people had done me no injury, that if they attempted, or I saw it necessary, for my own immediate preservation, to fall upon them, something might be said for it, but that I was yet out of their power, and they really had no knowledge of me, and consequently no design upon me, and therefore it could not be just for me to fall upon them that this would justify the conduct of the Spaniards in all their barbarities practised in America, where they destroyed millions of these people, who, however they were idolaters and barbarians, and had several bloody and barbarous rites in their customs, such as sacrificing human bodies to their idols, were yet, as to the Spaniards, very innocent people, and that the rooting them out of the country is spoken of with the utmost abhorrence and detestation by even the Spaniards themselves at this time, and by all other Christian nations of Europe, as a mere butchery, a bloody and unnatural piece of cruelty, unjustifiable either to God or man, and for which the very name of a Spaniard is reckoned to be frightful and terrible to all people of humanity or of Christian compassion. 
as if the kingdom of Spain were particularly eminent for the produce of a race of men who were without principles of tenderness, or the common bowels of pity to the miserable, which is reckoned to be a mark of generous temper in the mind. These considerations really put me to a pause, and to a kind of a full stop, and I began by little and little to be off my design, and to conclude I had taken wrong measures in my resolution to attack the savages, and that it was not my business to meddle with them unless they first attacked me, and this it was my business, if possible, to prevent. But that, if I were discovered and attacked by them, I knew my duty. On the other hand, I argued with myself that this really was the way not to deliver myself, but entirely to ruin and destroy myself, for unless I was sure to kill every one that not only should be on shore at that time, but that should ever come on shore afterwards, if but one of them escaped to tell their country people what had happened, they would come over again by thousands to revenge the death of their fellows, and I should only bring upon myself a certain destruction, which at present I had no manner of occasion for. Upon the whole, I concluded that I ought, neither in principle nor in policy, one way or other, to concern myself in this affair, that my business was, by all means possible, to conceal myself from them, and not to leave the least sign for them to guess by that there were any living creatures upon the island, I mean of human shape. Religion joined in with this prudential resolution, and I was convinced now, many ways, that I was perfectly out of my duty when I was laying all my bloody schemes for the destruction of innocent creatures, I mean, innocent as to me. As to the crimes they were guilty of towards one another, I had nothing to do with them. They were national, and I ought to leave them to the justice of God, who is the governor of nations, and knows how, by national punishments, to make a just retribution for national offences, and to bring public judgments upon those who offend in a public manner, by such ways as best please him. This appeared so clear to me now that nothing was a greater satisfaction to me than that I had not been suffered to do a thing which I now saw so much reason to believe would have been no less a sin than that of willful murder if I had committed it. And I gave most humble thanks on my knees to God that He had thus delivered me from blood guiltiness, beseeching Him to grant me the protection of His providence, that I might not fall into the hands of the barbarians, or that I might not lay my hands upon them, unless I had a more clear call from heaven to do it, in defence of my own life. In this disposition I continued for near a year after this, and so far was I from desiring an occasion for falling upon these wretches, that in all that time I never once went up the hill to see whether there were any of them in sight, or to know whether any of them had been on shore there or not that I might not be tempted to renew any of my contrivances against them, or be provoked by any advantage that might present itself to fall upon them. Only this I did. I went and removed my boat, which I had on the other side of the island, and carried it down to the east end of the whole island, where I ran it into a little cove, which I found under some high rocks, and where I knew, by reason of the currents, the savages durst not, at least would not come with their boats upon any account whatever. With my boat I carried away everything that I had left there belonging to her, though not necessary for the bear going thither, that is, a mast and sail which I had made for her, and a thing like an anchor, but which indeed could not be called either anchor or grapnel. However, it was the best I could make of its kind. All these I removed, that there might not be the least shadow for discovery, or appearance of any boat, or of any human habitation, upon the island. Besides this, I kept myself, as I said, more retired than ever, and seldom went from my cell except upon my constant employment to milk my she-goats and manage my little flock in the wood, which, as it was quite on the other part of the island, was out of danger, for certain. It was these savage people who sometimes haunted this island, never came with any thoughts of finding anything here, and consequently never wandered off from the coast, and I doubt not but they might have been several times on shore after my apprehensions of them had made me cautious, 
as well as before. Indeed, I looked back with some horror upon the thoughts of what my condition would have been if I had chopped upon them and been discovered before that, when, naked and unarmed except with one gun, and that loaded often only with small shot, I walked everywhere, peeping and peering about the island, to see what I could get. What a surprise should I have been in if, when I discovered the print of a man's foot, I had, instead of that, seen fifteen or twenty savages, and found them pursuing me, and by the swiftness of their running no possibility of my escaping them. The thoughts of this sometimes sank my very soul within me, and distressed my mind so much that I could not soon recover it, to think what I should have done, and how I should not only have been unable to resist them, but even should not have had presence of mind enough to do what I might have done, much less what now, after so much consideration and preparation, I might be able to do. Indeed, after serious thinking of these things, I would be melancholy, and sometimes it would last a great while. But I resolved it all at last into thankfulness to that providence which had delivered me from so many unseen dangers, and had kept me from those mischiefs which I could have no way been the agent in delivering myself from, because I had not the least notion of any such thing depending, or the least supposition of its being possible. This renewed a contemplation which often had come into my thoughts in former times, when first I began to see the merciful dispositions of heaven. In the dangers we run through in this life, how wonderfully we are delivered when we know nothing of it, how, when we are in a quandary, as we call it, a doubt or hesitation whether to go this way or that way, a secret hint shall direct us this way, when we intended to go that way. Nay, when sense, our own inclination, and perhaps business has called us to go the other way, yet a strange impression upon the mind, from we know not what springs, and by we know not what power, shall overrule us to go this way and it shall afterwards appear that had we gone that way, which we should have gone, and even to our imagination ought to have gone, we should have been ruined and lost. Upon these and many like reflections, I afterwards made it a certain rule with me, that whenever I found those secret hints or pressings of mine to doing or not doing anything that presented, or going this way or that way, I never failed to obey the secret dictate though I knew no other reason for it than such a pressure or such a hint hung upon my mind. I could give many examples of the success of this conduct in the course of my life, but more especially in the latter part of my inhabiting this unhappy island, because, besides many occasions which it is very likely I might have taken notice of, if I had seen with the same eyes that I see with now. But it is never too late to be wise and I cannot but advise all considering men, whose lives are attended with such extraordinary incidents as mine, and even though not so extraordinary, not to slight such secret intimations of providence, let them come from what invisible intelligence they will. That I shall not discuss, and perhaps cannot account for, but certainly they are a proof of the converse of spirits, and a secret communication between those embodied and those unembodied, and such a proof as can never be understood, of which I shall have occasion to give some remarkable instances in the remainder of my solitary residence in this dismal place. I believe the reader of this will not think it strange if I confess that these anxieties, these constant dangers I lived in, and the concern that was now upon me, put an end to all invention, and to all the contrivances that I had laid for my future accommodations and conveniences. I had the care of my safety more now upon my hands than that of my food. I cared not to drive a nail or chop a stick of wood now, for fear the noise I might make should be heard. Much less would I fire a gun for the same reason, and above all I was intolerably uneasy at making any fire, lest the smoke, which is visible at a great distance in the day, should betray me. For this reason I removed that part of my business which required fire, such as burning of pots and pipes, etc., into my new apartment in the woods, where, after I had been some time, 
I found, to my unspeakable consolation, a mere natural cave in the earth which went in a vast way, and where, I dare say, no savage, had he been at the mouth of it, would be so hardy as to venture in, nor indeed would any man else but one who, like me, wanted nothing so much as a safe retreat. The mouth of this hollow was at the bottom of a great rock, where, by mere accident, I would say, if I did not see abundant reason to ascribe all such things now to providence, I was cutting down some thick branches of trees to make charcoal, and before I go on, I must observe the reason of my making this charcoal, which was this. I was afraid of making a smoke about my habitation, as I said before, and yet I could not live there without baking my bread, cooking my meat, etc. So I contrived to burn some wood here, as I had seen done in England, under turf, till it became chark or dry coal, and then putting the fire out, I preserved the coal to carry home, and perform the other services for which fire was wanting, without danger of smoke. But this is by the by. While I was cutting down some wood here, I perceived that, behind a very thick branch of low brushwood or underwood, there was a kind of hollow place. I was curious to look in it, and getting with difficulty into the mouth of it, I found it was pretty large, that is to say, sufficient for me to stand upright in it, and perhaps another with me. But I must confess to you that I made more haste out than I did in, when looking farther into the place, and which was perfectly dark, I saw two broad shining eyes of some creature, whether devil or man I knew not, which twinkled like two stars, the dim light from the cave's mouth shining directly in, and making the reflection. However, after some pause, I recovered myself, and began to call myself a thousand fools, and to think that he that was afraid to see the devil was not fit to live twenty years in an island all alone, and that I might well think there was nothing in this cave that was more frightful than myself. Upon this, plucking up my courage, I took up a firebrand, and in I rushed again, with the stick flaming in my hand. I had not gone three steps in before I was almost as frightened as before, for I heard a very loud sigh, like that of a man in some pain, and it was followed by a broken noise, as of words half expressed, and then a deep sigh again. I stepped back, and was indeed struck with such a surprise that it put me into a cold sweat, and if I had had a hat on my head, I will not answer for it that my hair might not have lifted it off but still plucking up my spirits as well as I could, and encouraging myself a little with considering that the power and presence of God was everywhere, and was able to protect me, I stepped forward again, and by the light of the firebrand, holding it up a little over my head, I saw lying on the ground a monstrous, frightful old he-goat, just making his will, as we say, and gasping for life, and dying indeed of mere old age. I stirred him a little to see if I could get him out, and he essayed to get up, but was not able to raise himself, and I thought with myself he might even lie there, for if he had frightened me, so he would certainly fright any of the savages, if any of them should be so hardy as to come in there while he had any life in him. I was now recovered from my surprise, and began to look round me, when I found the cave was but very small. That is to say, it might be about twelve feet over, but in no manner of shape, neither round nor square, no hands having ever been employed in making it but those of mere nature. I observed also that there was a place at the farther side of it that went in further, but was so low that it required me to creep upon my hands and knees to go into it, and whither it went I knew not. So, having no candle, I gave it over for that time but resolved to go again the next day, provided with candles and a tinder-box, which I had made of the lock of one of the muskets, with some wildfire in the pan. Accordingly, the next day I came provided with six large candles of my own making, for I made very good candles now of goat's tallow, but was hard set for candle-wick, using sometimes rags or rope-yarn, and sometimes the dried rind of a weed like nettles. And going into this low place I was obliged to creep upon all fours, as I have said, almost ten yards, which, by the way, 
I thought was a venture bold enough, considering that I knew not how far it might go, nor what was beyond it. When I had got through the strait, I found the roof rose higher up, I believe near twenty feet, but never was such a glorious sight seen in the island, I dare say, as it was to look round the sides and roof of this vault, or cave. The wall reflected a hundred thousand lights to me from my two candles. What it was in the rock, whether diamonds or any other precious stones, or gold which I rather supposed it to be, I knew not. The place I was in was a most delightful cavity, or grotto, though perfectly dark. The floor was dry and level, and had a sort of a small loose gravel upon it, so that there was no nauseous or venomous creature to be seen, neither was there any damp or wet on the sides or roof. The only difficulty in it was the entrance, which, however, as it was a place of security, and such a retreat as I wanted, I thought was a convenience, so that I really rejoiced at the discovery, and resolved without any delay to bring some of those things which I was most anxious about to this place. Particularly, I resolved to bring hither my magazine of powder and all my spare arms, that is, two fowling pieces, for I had three in all, and three muskets, for of them I had eight in all. So I kept in my castle only five, which stood ready mounted like pieces of cannon on my outmost fence, and were ready also to take out upon any expedition. Upon this occasion of removing my ammunition I happened to open the barrel of powder which I took up out of the sea, and which had been wet, and I found that the water had penetrated about three or four inches into the powder on every side, which, caking and growing hard, had preserved the inside like a kernel in the shell, so that I had near sixty pounds of very good powder in the centre of the cask. This was a very agreeable discovery to me at that time so I carried all away thither, never keeping above two or three pounds of powder with me in my castle, for fear of a surprise of any kind. I also carried thither all the lead I had left for bullets. I fancied myself now like one of the ancient giants who were said to live in caves and holes in the rocks, where none could come at them, for I persuaded myself, while I was here, that if five hundred savages were to hunt me, they could never find me out or if they did, they would not venture to attack me here. The old goat whom I found expiring died in the mouth of the cave the next day after I made this discovery, and I found it much easier to dig a great hole there, and throw him in and cover him with earth, than to drag him out. So I interred him there, to prevent offence to my nose. End of chapter 12 Chapter Thirteen of Robinson Crusoe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. Chapter Thirteen Wreck of a Spanish Ship. I was now in the twenty third year of my residence in this island and was so naturalized to the place and the manner of living that, could I but have enjoyed the certainty that no savages would come to the place to disturb me, I could have been content to have capitulated for spending the rest of my time there, even to the last moment, till I had laid me down and died, like the old goat in the cave. I had also arrived to some little diversions and amusements, which made the time pass a great deal more pleasantly with me than it did before. First I had taught my Paul, as I noted before, to speak, and he did it so familiarly, and talked so articulately and plain, that it was very pleasant to me, and he lived with me no less than six and twenty years. How long he might have lived afterwards I know not, though I know they have a notion in the Brazils that they live a hundred years. My dog was a pleasant and loving companion to me for no less than sixteen years of my time, and then died of mere old age. As for my cats, they multiplied, as I have observed, to that degree that I was obliged to shoot several of them at first, to keep them from devouring me and all I had. But at length, when the two old ones I brought with me were gone, and after some time continually driving them from me, and letting them have no provision with me, 
they all ran wild into the woods, except two or three favourites, which I kept tame, and whose young, when they had any, I always drowned, and these were part of my family. Besides these I always kept two or three household kids about me, whom I taught to feed out of my hand, and I had two more parrots, which talked pretty well, and would all call, Robin Crusoe, but none like my first, nor indeed did I take the pains with any of them that I had done with him. I had also several tame sea-fowls, whose name I knew not, that I caught upon the shore, and cut their wings, and the little stakes which I had planted before my castle wall being now grown up to a good thick grove, these fowls all lived among these low trees, and bred there, which was very agreeable to me, so that, as I said above, I began to be very well contented with the life I led, if I could have been secured from the dread of the savages. But it was otherwise directed, and it may not be amiss for all people who shall meet with my story, to make this just observation from it. How frequently, in the course of our lives, the evil which in itself we seek most to shun, and which, when we are fallen into, is the most dreadful to us, is oftentimes the very means or door of our deliverance, by which alone we can be raised again from the affliction we are fallen into. I could give many examples of this in the course of my unaccountable life, but in nothing was it more particularly remarkable than in the circumstances of my last years of solitary residence in this island. It was now the month of December, as I said above, in my twenty-third year, and this, being the southern solstice, for winter I cannot call it, was the particular time of my harvest, and required me to be pretty much abroad in the fields, when, going out early in the morning, even before it was thorough daylight, I was surprised with seeing a light of some fire upon the shore, at a distance from me of about two miles, toward that part of the island where I had observed some savages had been, as before, and not on the other side, but to my great affliction it was on my side of the island. I was indeed terribly surprised at the sight, and stopped short within my grove, not daring to go out, lest I might be surprised. And yet I had no more peace within, from the apprehensions I had that if these savages, in rambling over the island, should find my corn standing or cut, or any of my works or improvements, they would immediately conclude that there were people in the place, and would then never rest till they had found me out. In this extremity I went back directly to my castle, pulled up the ladder after me, and made all things without look as wild and natural as I could. Then I prepared myself within, putting myself in a posture of defence. I loaded all my cannon, as I called them, that is to say, my muskets, which were mounted upon my new fortification, and all my pistols, and resolved to defend myself to the last gasp not forgetting seriously to commend myself to the divine protection, and earnestly to pray to God to deliver me out of the hands of the barbarians. I continued in this posture about two hours, and began to be impatient for intelligence abroad, for I had no spies to send out. After sitting a while longer, and musing what I should do in this case, I was not able to bear sitting in ignorance longer, so setting up my ladder to the side of the hill, where there was a flat place, as I observed before, and then pulling the ladder after me, I set it up again and mounted the top of the hill, and pulling out my perspective glass, which I had taken on purpose, I laid me down flat on my belly on the ground, and began to look for the place. I presently found there were no less than nine naked savages sitting round a small fire they had made, not to warm them, for they had no need of that, the weather being extremely hot, but, as I supposed, to dress some of their barbarous diet of human flesh which they had brought with them, whether alive or dead I could not tell. They had two canoes with them, which they had hauled up on to the shore, and as it was then ebb of tide, they seemed to me to wait for the return of the flood to go away again. It is not easy to imagine what confusion this sight put me into, especially seeing them come on my side of the island, and so near to me. But when I considered their coming must be always with the current of the ebb, I began afterwards to be more sedate in my mind, being satisfied that I might go abroad with safety all the time of the flood of tide, if they were not on shore before. 
and having made this observation, I went abroad about my harvest work with the more composure. As I expected, so it proved, for as soon as the tide made to the westward I saw them all take boat and row, or paddle as we call it, away. I should have observed that for an hour or more before they went off they were dancing, and I could easily discern their postures and gestures by my glass. I could not perceive, by my nicest observation, but that they were stark naked, and had not the least covering upon them, but whether they were men or women I could not distinguish. As soon as I saw them shipped and gone, I took two guns upon my shoulders, and two pistols in my girdle, and my great sword by my side without a scabbard, and with all the speed I was able to make went away to the hill where I had discovered the first appearance of all. And as soon as I get thither, which was not in less than two hours, for I could not go quickly, being so loaded with arms as I was, I perceived there had been three canoes more of the savages at that place, and looking out farther, I saw they were all at sea together, making over for the main. This was a dreadful sight to me, especially as, going down to the shore, I could see the marks of horror which the dismal work they had been about had left behind it, that is, the blood, the bones, and part of the flesh of human bodies eaten and devoured by those wretches with merriment and sport. I was so filled with indignation at the sight, that I now began to premeditate the destruction of the next that I saw there, let them be whom or how many soever. It seemed evident to me that the visits which they made thus to this island were not very frequent, for it was above fifteen months before any more of them came on shore there again. That is to say, I never saw them or any footsteps or signals of them in all that time, for as to the rainy seasons, then they are sure not to come abroad, at least not so far. Yet all this while I lived uncomfortably, by reason of the constant apprehensions of their coming upon me by surprise, from whence I observe that the expectation of evil is more bitter than the suffering, especially if there is no room to shake off that expectation or those apprehensions. During all this time I was in a murdering humour, and spent most of my hours, which should have been better employed, in contriving how to circumvent and fall upon them the very next time I should see them, especially if they should be divided, as they were the last time, into two parties. Nor did I consider at all that if I killed one party, suppose ten or a dozen, I was still the next day, or week, or month, to kill another, and so another, even ad infinitum, till I should be, at length, no less a murderer than they were in being man-eaters, and perhaps much more so. I spent my days now in great perplexity and anxiety of mind, expecting that I should one day or other fall into the hands of these merciless creatures, and if I did at any time venture abroad, it was not without looking around me with the greatest care and caution imaginable. And now I found, to my great comfort, how happy it was that I had provided a tame flock or herd of goats, for I durst not upon any account fire my gun, especially near that side of the island where they usually came, lest I should alarm the savages, and if they had fled from me now, I was sure to have them come again with perhaps two or three hundred canoes with them in a few days, and then I knew what to expect. However, I wore out a year and three months more before I ever saw any more of the savages, and then I found them again, as I shall soon observe. It is true they might have been there once or twice, but Either they made no stay, or at least I did not see them, but in the month of May, as near as I could calculate, and in my four-and-twentieth year, I had a very strange encounter with them, of which in its place. The perturbation of my mind during this fifteen or sixteen months' interval was very great. I slept unquietly, dreamed always frightful dreams, and often started out of my sleep in the night. In the day great troubles overwhelmed my mind, and in the night I dreamed often of killing the savages, and of the reasons why I might justify doing it. But to waive all this for a while. It was in the middle of May, on the sixteenth day, I think, as well as my poor wooden calendar would reckon, for I marked all upon the post still. I say, it was on the sixteenth of May that it blew a very great storm of wind all day 
with a great deal of lightning and thunder, and a very foul night it was after it. I knew not what was the particular occasion of it, but as I was reading in the Bible, and taken up with very serious thoughts about my present condition, I was surprised with the noise of a gun, as I thought, fired at sea. This was, to be sure, a surprise quite of a different nature from any I had met with before, for the notions this put into my thoughts were quite of another kind. I started up in the greatest haste imaginable, and in a trice clapped my ladder to the middle place of the rock, and pulled it up after me, and mounting it the second time, got to the top of the hill the very moment that a flash of fire bid me listen for a second gun, which accordingly, in about half a minute, I heard, and by the sound I knew that it was from that part of the sea where I was driven down the current in my boat. I immediately considered that this must be some ship in distress, and that they had some comrade, or some other ship in company, and fired these for signals of distress, and to obtain help. I had the presence of mind at that minute to think, that though I could not help them, it might be that they might help me, so I brought together all the dry wood I could get at hand, and making a good handsome pile, I set it on fire upon the hill. The wood was dry, and blazed freely, and though the wind blew very hard, yet it burned fairly out, so that I was certain, if there was any such thing as a ship, they must needs see it. And no doubt they did, for as soon as ever my fire blazed up, I heard another gun, and after that several others, all from the same quarter. I plied my fire all night long, till daybreak, and when it was broad day and the air cleared up, I saw something at a great distance at sea, full east of the island, whether a sail or a hull I could not distinguish, no, not with my glass. The distance was so great, and the weather still something hazy also, at least it was so out at sea. I looked frequently at it all that day, and soon perceived that it did not move, so I presently concluded that it was a ship at anchor, and being eager, you may be sure, to be satisfied, I took my gun in my hand and ran towards the south side of the island to the rocks where I had formerly been carried away by the current, and getting up there, the weather by this time being perfectly clear, I could plainly see, to my great sorrow, the wreck of a ship, cast away in the night upon those concealed rocks which I found when I was out in my boat, and which rocks, as they checked the violence of the stream, and made a kind of counter-stream, or eddy, were the occasion of my recovering from the most desperate, hopeless condition that ever I had been in all my life. Thus what is one man's safety is another man's destruction, for it seems these men, whoever they were, being out of their knowledge, and the rocks being wholly under water, had been driven upon them in the night, the wind blowing hard at east-northeast. Had they seen the island, as I must necessarily suppose they did not, they must, as I thought, have endeavoured to have saved themselves on shore by the help of their boat. But their firing off guns for help, especially when they saw, as I imagined, my fire, filled me with many thoughts. First, I imagined that upon seeing my light they might have put themselves into their boat, and endeavoured to make the shore, but that the sea running very high, they might have been cast away. Other times I imagined that they might have lost their boat before, as might be the case many ways, particularly by the breaking of the sea upon their ship, which many times obliged men to stave, or take in pieces, their boat, and sometimes to throw it overboard with their own hands. Other times I imagined they had some other ship or ships in company, who, upon the signals of distress they made, had taken them up and carried them off. Other times I fancied they were all gone off to sea in their boat, and being hurried away by the current that I had been formerly in, were carried out into the great ocean, where there was nothing but misery and perishing, and that, perhaps, they might by this time think of starving, and of being in a condition to eat one another. As all these were but conjectures at best, so, in the condition I was in, I could do no more than look upon the misery of the poor men and pity them, which had still this good effect upon my side, that it gave me more and more cause to give thanks to God, who had so happily and comfortably provided for me in my desolate condition, 
and that of two ships' companies, who were now cast away upon this part of the world, not one life should be spared but mine. I learned here again to observe that it is very rare that the providence of God casts us into any condition so low, or any misery so great, but we may see something or other to be thankful for, and may see others in worse circumstances than our own. Such certainly was the case of these men, of whom I could not so much as see room to suppose any were saved. Nothing could make it rational so much as to wish or expect that they did not all perish there, except the possibility only of their being taken up by another ship and company. And that this was but mere possibility indeed, for I saw not the least sign or appearance of any such thing. I cannot explain, by any possible energy of words, what a strange longing I felt in my soul upon this sight, breaking out sometimes thus, Oh, that there had been but one or two, nay, or but one soul saved out of this ship, to have escaped to me, that I might but have had one companion, one fellow-creature, to have spoken to me, and to have conversed with. In all the time of my solitary life I never felt so earnest, so strong a desire after the society of my fellow-creatures, or so deep a regret at the want of it. These were some secret springs in the affections which, when they are set a-going by some object in view, or, though not in view, yet rendered present to the mind by the power of imagination, that motion carries out the soul, by its impetuosity, to such violent, eager embracings of the object, that the absence of it is insupportable. Such were these earnest wishings that but one man had been saved. I believe I repeated the words, Oh, that it had been but one! A thousand times! And my desires were so moved by it, that when I spoke the words my hands would clinch together, and my fingers would press the palms of my hands, so that if I had had any soft thing in my hand, I should have crushed it involuntarily, and the teeth of my head would strike together, and set against one another so strong, that for some time I could not part them again. Let the naturalists explain these things, and the reason and manner of them. All I can do is to describe the fact, which was even surprising to me when I found it, though I knew not from whence it proceeded. It was doubtless the effect of ardent wishes, and of strong ideas formed in my mind, realizing the comfort which the conversation of one of my fellow Christians would have been to me. But it was not to be. Either their fate or mine, or both, forbade it. For, till the last year of my being on this island, I never knew whether any were saved out of that ship or no, and had only the affliction, some days after, to see the corpse of a drowned boy come on shore at the end of the island which was next the shipwreck. He had no clothes on but a seaman's waistcoat, a pair of open-kneed linen drawers, and a blue linen shirt, but nothing to direct me so much as to guess what nation he was of. He had nothing in his pockets but two pieces of eight and a tobacco pipe. The last was to me of ten times more value than the first. It was now calm, and I had a great mind to venture out of my boat to this wreck, not doubting but I might find something on board that might be useful to me. But that did not altogether press me so much as the possibility that there might be yet some living creature on board, whose life I might not only save, but might, by saving that life, comfort my own to the last degree and this thought clung so to my heart that I could not be quiet night or day, but I must venture out of my boat on board this wreck, and committing the rest to God's providence, I thought the impression was so strong upon my mind that it could not be resisted, that it must come from some invisible direction, and that I should be wanting to myself if I did not go. Under the power of this impression I hastened back to my castle, prepared everything for my voyage, took a quantity of bread, a great pot of fresh water, a compass to steer by, a bottle of rum, for I had still a great deal of that left, and a basket of raisins, and thus loading myself with everything necessary. I went down to my boat, got the water out of her, got her afloat, loaded all my cargo in her, and then went home again for more. 
My second cargo was a great bag of rice, the umbrella to set up over my head for a shade, another large pot of water, and about two dozen of small loaves or barley cakes, more than before, with a bottle of goat's milk and a cheese, all which with great labour and sweat I carried to my boat, and praying to God to direct my voyage, I put out, and rowing or paddling the canoe along the shore, came at last to the utmost point of the island on the northeast side. And now I was to launch out into the ocean, and either to venture or not to venture. I looked on the rapid currents which ran constantly on both sides of the island at a distance, and which were very terrible to me from the remembrance of the hazard I had been in before. And my heart began to fail me, for I foresaw that if I was driven into either of those currents, I should be carried a great way out to sea and perhaps out of my reach or sight of the island again, and that then, as my boat was but small, if any little gale of wind should rise, I should be inevitably lost. These thoughts so oppressed my mind that I began to give over my enterprise, and having hauled my boat into a little creek on the shore, I stepped out and sat down upon a rising bit of ground, very pensive and anxious, between fear and desire, about my voyage, when, as I was musing, I could perceive that the tide was turned and the flood come on, upon which my going was impracticable for so many hours. Upon this, presently it occurred to me that I should go up to the highest piece of ground I could find, and observe, if I could, how the sets of the tide or currents lay when the flood came in, that I might judge whether, if I was driven one way out, I might not expect to be driven another way home, with the same rapidity of the currents. This thought was no sooner in my head than I cast my eye upon a little hill which sufficiently overlooked the sea both ways, and from whence I had a clear view of the currents or sets of the tide, and which way I was to guide myself in my return. Here I found that, as the current of ebb set out close by the south point of the island, so the current of the flood set in close by the shore of the north side, and that I had nothing to do but to keep to the north side of the island in my return, and I should do well enough. Encouraged by this observation, I resolved the next morning to set out with the first of the tide, and reposing myself for the night in my canoe, under the watch-coat I mentioned, I launched out. I first made a little out to sea, full north, till I began to feel the benefit of the current, which set eastward, and which carried me at a great rate, and yet did not so hurry me as the current on the south side had done before, so as to take from me all government of the boat, but having a strong steerage with my paddle, I went at a great rate directly for the wreck, and in less than two hours I came up to it. It was a dismal sight to look at. The ship, which by its building was Spanish, stuck fast, jammed in between two rocks. All the stern and quarter of her were beaten to pieces by the sea, and as her forecastle, which stuck in the rocks, had run on with great violence, her mainmast and foremast were brought by the board, that is to say, broken short off, but her bowsprit was sound, and the head and bow appeared firm. When I came close to her, a dog appeared upon her, who, seeing me coming, yelped and cried, and as soon as I called him, jumped into the sea to come to me. I took him into the boat, but found him almost dead with hunger and thirst. I gave him a cake of my bread, and he devoured it like a ravenous wolf that had been starving a fortnight in the snow. I then gave the poor creature some fresh water, with which, if I would have let him, he would have burst himself. After this I went on board, but the first sight I met with was two men drowned in the cook-room, or forecastle of the ship, with their arms fast about one another. I concluded, as is indeed probable, that when the ship struck, it being in a storm, the sea broke so high and so continually over her, that the men were not able to bear it, and were strangled with the constant rushing in of the water, as much as if they had been under water. Besides the dog, there was nothing left in the ship that had life, nor any goods that I could see, but what were spoiled by the water. There were some casks of liquor, whether wine or brandy I knew not which lay lower in the hold, and which, the water being ebbed out, I could see, but they were too big to meddle with. 
I saw several chests, which I believe belonged to some of the seamen, and I got two of them into the boat, without examining what was in them. Had the stern of the ship been fixed, and the forepart broken off, I am persuaded I might have made a good voyage, for by what I found in those two chests I had room to suppose the ship had a great deal of wealth on board, and, if I may guess from the course she steered, she must have been bound from Buenos Aires, or the Rio de la Plata, in the south part of America, beyond the Brazils to the Havana, in the Gulf of Mexico, and so perhaps to Spain. She had, no doubt, a great treasure in her, but of no use at that time to anybody, and what became of the crew I then knew not. I found, besides these chests, a little cask full of liquor, of about twenty gallons, which I got into my boat with much difficulty. There were several muskets in the cabin, and a great powder horn, with about four pounds of powder in it. As for the muskets, I had no occasion for them, so I left them, but took the powder horn. I took a fire shovel and tongs, which I wanted extremely, as also two little brass kettles, a copper pot to make chocolate, and a gridiron, and with this cargo and the dog I came away, the tide beginning to make home again, and the same evening, about an hour within night, I reached the island again, weary and fatigued to the last degree. I reposed that night in the boat, and in the morning I resolved to harbour what I had got in my new cave, and not carry it home to my castle. After refreshing myself, I got all my cargo on shore, and began to examine the particulars. The cask of liquor I found to be a kind of rum, but not such as we had at the Brazils, and in a word, not at all good. But when I came to open the chests, I found several things of great use to me. For example, I found in one a fine case of bottles, of an extraordinary kind, and filled with cordial waters, fine and very good. The bottles held about three pints each, and were tipped with silver. I found two pots of very good succades, or sweetmeats, so fastened also on the top that the salt water had not hurt them, and two more of the same which the water had spoiled. I found some very good shirts, which were very welcome to me, and about a dozen and a half of white linen handkerchiefs and coloured neckcloths. The former were also very welcome, being exceedingly refreshing to wipe my face in a hot day. Besides this, when I came to the till in the chest, I found there three great bags of pieces of eight, which held about eleven hundred pieces in all, and in one of them, wrapped up in a paper, six doubloons of gold, and some small bars or wedges of gold. I suppose they might all weigh near a pound. In the other chest were some clothes, but of little value. But, by the circumstances, it must have belonged to the gunner's mate, though there was no powder in it, except two pounds of fine glaze powder, and three flasks, kept, I suppose, for charging their fowling pieces on occasion. Upon the whole I got very little by this voyage that was of any use to me, for, as to the money, I had no manner of occasion for it. It was to me as the dirt under my feet, and I would have given it all for three or four pair of English shoes and stockings, which were things I greatly wanted, but had had none on my feet for many years. I had, indeed, got two pair of shoes now, which I took off the feet of two drowned men whom I saw in the wreck, and I found two pair more in one of the chests, which were very welcome to me, but they were not like our English shoes, either for ease or service, being rather what we call pumps than shoes. I found in this seaman's chest about fifty pieces of eight, in reals, but no gold. I suppose this belonged to a poorer man than the other, which seemed to belong to some officer. Well, however, I lugged this money home to my cave, and laid it up, as I had done that before which I had brought from our own ship. But it was a great pity, as I said, that the other part of this ship had not come to my share, for I am satisfied I might have loaded my canoe several times over with money, and, thought I, if I ever escape to England, it might lie here safe enough till I come again and fetch it. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of Robinson Crusoe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. 
The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe Chapter 14 A Dream Realized Having now brought all my things on shore and secured them, I went back to my boat and rowed or paddled her along the shore to her old harbour, where I laid her up and made the best of my way to my old habitation, where I found everything safe and quiet. I began now to repose myself, live after my old fashion, and take care of my family affairs. And for a while I lived easy enough, only that I was more vigilant than I used to be, looked out oftener, and did not go abroad so much. And if at any time I did stir with any freedom, it was always to the east part of the island, where I was pretty well satisfied the savages never came, and where I could go without so many precautions, and such a load of arms and ammunition as I always carried with me if I went the other way. I lived in this condition near two years more, but my unlucky head, that was always to let me know it was born to make my body miserable, was all these two years filled with projects and designs how, if it were possible, I might get away from this island, for sometimes I was for making another voyage to the wreck, though my reason told me there was nothing left there worth the hazard of my voyage, sometimes for a ramble one way, sometimes another, and I believe verily, if I had had the boat that I went from Salih in, I should have ventured to sea, bound anywhere, I knew not whither. I have been, in all my circumstances, a memento to those who are touched with the general plague of mankind, whence, for aught I know, one half of their miseries flow. I mean that of not being satisfied with the station wherein God and nature hath placed them, for, not to look back upon my primitive condition, and the excellent advice of my father, the opposition to which was, as I may call it, my original sin, my subsequent mistakes of the same kind had been the means of my coming into this miserable condition, for had that providence which so happily seated me at the Brazils, as a planter, blessed me with confined desires, and I could have been contented to have gone on gradually, I might have been by this time, I mean in the time of my being in this island, one of the most considerable planters in the Brazils. Nay, I am persuaded that by the improvements I had made in that little time I lived there, and the increase I should probably have made if I remained, I might have been worth a hundred thousand moidares. And what business had I to leave a settled fortune, a well-stocked plantation, improving and increasing, to turn supercargo to Guinea to fetch negroes, when patience and time would have so increased our stock at home, that we could have bought them at our own door from those whose business it was to fetch them. And though it cost us something more, yet the difference of that price was by no means worth saving at so great a hazard. But as this is usually the fate of young heads, so reflection upon the folly of it is as commonly the exercise of more years, or of the dear-bought experience of time. So it was with me now, and yet so deep had the mistake taken root in my temper, that I could not satisfy myself in my station, but was continually poring upon the means and possibility of my escape from this place, and that I may, with greater pleasure to the reader, bring on the remaining part of my story, it may not be improper to give some account of my first conceptions on the subject of this foolish scheme for my escape and how, and upon what foundation, I acted. I am now to be supposed retired into my castle, after my late voyage to the wreck, my frigate laid up and secured under water as usual, and my condition restored to what it was before. I had more wealth, indeed, than I had before, but was not at all the richer, for I had no more use for it than the Indians of Peru had before the Spaniards came there. It was one of the nights in the rainy season in March, the four-and-twentieth year of my first setting foot in this island of solitude. I was lying in my bed or hammock, awake, very well in health, had no pain, no distemper, no uneasiness of body, nor any uneasiness of mind more than ordinary, but could by no means close my eyes, that is, so as to sleep, no, not a wink all night long, otherwise than as follows. It is impossible to set down the innumerable crowd of thoughts that whirled through that great thoroughfare of the brain, the memory, in this night's time. 
I ran over the whole history of my life in miniature, or by abridgment, as I may call it, to my coming to this island, and also of that part of my life since I came to this island. In my reflections upon the state of my case since I came on shore on this island, I was comparing the happy posture of my affairs in the first years of my habitations here, with the life of anxiety, fear, and care which I had lived in ever since I had seen the print of a foot in the sand. Not that I did not believe the savages had frequented the island even all the while, and might have been several hundreds of them at times on shore there, but I had never known it, and was incapable of any apprehensions about it. My satisfaction was perfect, though my danger was the same, and I was as happy in not knowing my danger as if I had never really been exposed to it. This furnished my thoughts with very many profitable reflections, and particularly this one. How infinitely good that providence is, which has provided, in its government of mankind, such narrow bounds to his sight and knowledge of things, and though he walks in the midst of so many thousand dangers, the sight of which, if discovered to him, would distract his mind and sink his spirits, he is kept serene and calm by having the events of things hid from his eyes, and knowing nothing of the dangers which surround him. After these thoughts had for some time entertained me, I came to reflect seriously upon the real danger I had been in for so many years in this very island, and how I had walked about in the greatest security, and with all possible tranquillity, even when perhaps nothing but the brow of a hill, a great tree, or the casual approach of night, had been between me and the worst kind of destruction, that is, that of falling into the hands of cannibals and savages, who would have seized on me with the same view as I would on a goat or turtle, and would have thought it no more crime to kill and devour me than I did of a pigeon or a curlew. I would unjustly slander myself if I should say I was not sincerely thankful to my great preserver, to whose singular protection I acknowledged, with great humanity, all these unknown deliverances were due, and without which I must inevitably have fallen into their merciless hands. When these thoughts were over, my head was for some time taken up in considering the nature of these wretched creatures, I mean the savages, and how it came to pass in the world that the wise governor of all things should give up any of his creatures to such inhumanity, nay, to something so much below even brutality itself, as to devour its own kind. But as this ended in some, at that time, fruitless speculations, it occurred to me to inquire what part of the world these wretches lived in, how far off the coast was from whence they came, what they ventured over so far from home for, what kind of boats they had, and why I might not order myself and my business so that I might be able to go over thither as they were to come to me. I never so much as troubled myself to consider what I should do with myself when I went thither, what would become of me if I fell into the hands of these savages, or how I should escape them if they attacked me. No, nor so much as how it was possible for me to reach the coast, and not to be attacked by some or other of them, without any possibility of delivering myself, and if I should not fall into their hands what I should do for provision, or whither I should bend my course. None of these thoughts, I say, so much as came in my way, but my mind was wholly bent upon the notion of my passing over in my boat to the mainland. I looked upon my present condition as the most miserable that could possibly be, that I was not able to throw myself into anything but death that could be called worse, and if I reached the shore of the main I might perhaps meet with relief, or I might coast along as I did on the African shore, till I came to some inhabited country, and where I might find some relief, and after all, perhaps I might fall in with some Christian ship that might take me in, and if the worst came to the worst, I could but die, which would put an end to all these miseries at once. Pray note, all this was the fruit of a disturbed mind, an impatient temper, made desperate, as it were, by the long continuance of my troubles, and the disappointments I had met in the wreck I had been on board of, and where I had been so near obtaining what I so earnestly longed for, somebody to speak to and to learn some knowledge from them of the place where I was, and of the probable means of my deliverance. 
I was agitated wholly by these thoughts, all my calm of mind, in my resignation to providence, and waiting the issue of the dispositions of heaven, seemed to be suspended, and I had, as it were, no power to turn my thoughts to anything but to the project of a voyage to the main, which came upon me with such force and such an impetuosity of desire, that it was not to be resisted. When this had agitated my thoughts for two hours or more, with such violence that it set my very blood into a ferment, and my pulse beat as if I had been in a fever, merely with the extraordinary fervour of my mind about it, nature, as if I had been fatigued and exhausted with the very thoughts of it, threw me into a sound sleep. One would have thought I should have dreamed of it, but I did not, nor of anything relating to it but I dreamed that as I was going out in the morning as usual from my castle, I saw upon the shore two canoes and eleven savages coming to land, and that they brought with them another savage whom they were going to kill in order to eat him, when on a sudden the savage that they were going to kill jumped away and ran for his life, and I thought in my sleep that he came running into my little thick grove before my fortification to hide himself, and that I seeing him alone, and not perceiving that the others sought him that way, showed myself to him, and smiling upon him, encouraged him, that he kneeled down to me, seeming to pray me to assist him, upon which I showed him my ladder, made him go up, and carried him into my cave, and he became my servant, and that as soon as I had got this man, I said to myself, Now I may certainly venture to the mainland, for this fellow will serve me as a pilot, and will tell me what to do, and whither to go for provisions, and whither not to go for fear of being devoured, what places to venture into, and what to shun. I waked with this thought, and was under such inexpressible impressions of joy at the prospect of my escape in my dream, that the disappointments which I felt upon coming to myself, and finding that it was no more than a dream, were equally extravagant the other way, and threw me into a very great dejection of spirits. Upon this, however, I made this conclusion, that my only way to go about to attempt an escape was, to endeavour to get a savage into my possession, and if possible it should be one of their prisoners, whom they had condemned to be eaten, and should bring hither to kill. But these thoughts still were attended with this difficulty, that it was impossible to effect this without attacking a whole caravan of them, and killing them all, and this was not only a very desperate attempt, and might miscarry, but on the other hand, I had greatly scrupled the lawfulness of it to myself, and my heart trembled at the thoughts of shedding so much blood, though it was for my deliverance. I need not repeat the arguments which occurred to me against this, they being the same mentioned before, but though I had other reasons to offer now, that is, that those men were enemies to my life, and would devour me if they could, that it was self-preservation, in the highest degree, to deliver myself from this death of a life, and was acting in my own defence as much as if they were actually assaulting me, and the like. I say, though these things argued for it, yet the thoughts of shedding human blood for my deliverance were very terrible to me, and such as I could by no means reconcile myself to for a great while. However, at last, after many secret disputes with myself, and after great perplexities about it, for all these arguments, one way and another, struggled in my head a long time. The eager prevailing desire of deliverance at length mastered all the rest, and I resolved, if possible, to get one of these savages into my hands, cost what it would. My next thing was to contrive how to do it, and this indeed was very difficult to resolve on, but as I could pitch upon no probable means for it, so I resolved to put myself upon the watch, to see them when they came on shore, and leave the rest to the event, taking such measures as the opportunity should present, let what would be. With these resolutions in my thoughts, I set myself upon the scout as often as possible, and indeed so often that I was heartily tired of it, for it was above a year and a half that I waited, and for great part of that time went out to the west end, and to the southwest corner of the island almost every day, to look for canoes, but none appeared. This was very discouraging, 
and began to trouble me much, though I cannot say that it did in this case, as it had done some time before, wear off the edge of my desire to the thing, but the longer it seemed to be delayed, the more eager I was for it. In a word, I was not at first so careful to shun the sight of these savages, and avoid being seen by them, as I was now eager to be upon them. Besides, I fancied myself able to manage one, nay, two or three savages, if I had them, so as to make them entirely slaves to me, to do whatever I should direct them, and to prevent their being able at any time to do me any hurt. It was a great while that I pleased myself with this affair, but nothing still presented itself. All my fancies and schemes came to nothing, for no savages came near me for a great while. About a year and a half after I entertained these notions, and by long musing had, as it were, resolved them all into nothing, for want of an occasion to put them into execution, I was surprised one morning by seeing no less than five canoes all on shore together on my side of the island, and the people who belonged to them all landed and out of my sight. The number of them broke all my measures, for seeing so many, and knowing that they always came four or six, or sometimes more, in a boat, I could not tell what to think of it, or how to take my measures to attack twenty or thirty men single-handed, so lay still in my castle, perplexed and discomforted. However, I put myself into the same position for an attack that I had formerly provided, and was just ready for action, if anything had presented. Having waited a good while, listening to hear if they made any noise, at length, being very impatient, I set my guns at the foot of my ladder, and clambered up to the top of the hill, by my two stages, as usual. Standing so, however, that my head did not appear above the hill, so they could not perceive me by any means. Here I observed, by the help of my perspective glass, that they were no less than thirty in number, that they had a fire kindled, and that they had meat dressed. How they had cooked it I knew not, or what it was, but they were all dancing, and I know not how many barbarous gestures and figures, their own way, round the fire. While I was thus looking on them, I perceived, by my perspective, two miserable wretches dragged from the boats, where it seems they were laid by, and were now brought out for the slaughter. I perceived one of them immediately fall, being knocked down, I suppose, with a club or wooden sword, for that was their way, and two or three others were at work immediately, cutting him open for their cookery, while the other victim was left standing by himself, till they should be ready for him. In that very moment this poor wretch, seeing himself a little at liberty and unbound, nature inspired him with hopes of life, and he started away from them, and ran with incredible swiftness along the sands, directly towards me, I mean, towards that part of the coast where my habitation was. I was dreadfully frightened, I must acknowledge, when I perceived him run my way, and especially when, as I thought, I saw him pursued by the whole body and now I expected that part of my dream was coming to pass, and that he would certainly take shelter in my grove. But I could not depend, by any means, upon my dream, that the other savages would not pursue him thither and find him there. However, I kept my station, and my spirits began to recover when I found that there was not above three men that followed him, and still more was I encouraged when I found that he outstripped them exceedingly in running, and gained ground on them so that, if he could but hold out for half an hour, I saw easily he would fairly get away from them all. There was between them and my castle the creek, which I mentioned often in the first part of my story, where I landed my cargoes out of the ship, and this I saw plainly he must necessarily swim over, or the poor wretch would be taken there. But when the savage escaping came thither, he made nothing of it, though the tide was then up but plunging in, swam through in about thirty strokes, or thereabouts, landed, and ran with exceeding strength and swiftness. When the three persons came to the creek, I found that two of them could swim, but the third could not, and that, standing on the other side, he looked at the others, but went no farther, and soon after went softly back again, which, as it happened, was very well for him in the end. I observed that the two who swam were yet more than twice as strong swimming over the creek as the fellow was that fled from them, 
it came very warmly upon my thoughts, and indeed irresistibly, that now was the time to get me a servant, and perhaps a companion or assistant, and that I was plainly called by Providence to save this poor creature's life. I immediately ran down the ladders with all possible expedition, fetched my two guns, for they were both at the foot of the ladders, as I observed before, and getting up again with the same haste to the top of the hill, I crossed towards the sea, and having a very short cut, and all down hill, placed myself in the way between the pursuers and the pursued, hallowing aloud to him that fled, who, looking back, was at first perhaps as much frightened at me as at them, but I beckoned with my hand to him to come back, and in the meantime I slowly advanced towards the two that followed, then rushing at once upon the foremost, I knocked him down with a stock of my piece. I was loath to fire, because I would not have the rest here, though at that distance it would not have been easily heard, and being out of sight of the smoke, too, they would not have known what to make of it. Having knocked this fellow down, the other who pursued him stopped, as if he had been frightened, and I advanced towards him, but as I came nearer, I perceived presently he had a bow and arrow, and was fitting it to shoot at me so I was then obliged to shoot at him first, which I did, and killed him at the first shot. The poor savage who fled, but had stopped, though he saw both his enemies fallen and killed, as he thought, yet was so frightened with the fire and noise of my peace that he stood stock still, and neither came forward nor went backward, though he seemed rather inclined to fly than to come on. I hallooed again to him, and made signs to come forward, which he easily understood, and came a little way, then stopped again, and then a little farther, and stopped again, and I could then perceive that he stood trembling, as if he had been taken prisoner, and had just been to be killed, as his two enemies were. I beckoned to him again to come to me, and gave him all the signs of encouragement that I could think of, and he came nearer and nearer, kneeling down every ten or twelve steps, in token of acknowledgment for saving his life. I smiled at him, and looked pleasantly, and beckoned to him to come still nearer. At length he came close to me, and then he kneeled down again, kissed the ground, and laid his head upon the ground, and taking me by the foot, set my foot upon his head. This, it seems, was in token of swearing to be my slave for ever. I took him up and made much of him, and encouraged him all I could. But there was more work to do yet, for I perceived the savage whom I had knocked down was not killed, but stunned with a blow, and began to come to himself. So I pointed to him, and showed him the savage, that he was not dead. Upon this he spoke some words to me, and though I could not understand them, yet I thought they were pleasant to hear, for they were the first sound of a man's voice that I had heard, my own accepted, for above twenty-five years. But there was no time for such reflections now. The savage who was knocked down recovered himself so far as to sit up upon the ground, and I perceived that my savage began to be afraid. But when I saw that, I presented my other piece at the man, as if I would shoot him. Upon this my savage, for so I call him now, made a motion to me to lend him my sword, which hung naked in a belt by my side, which I did. He no sooner had it, but he runs to his enemy, and at one blow cut off his head so cleverly, no executioner in Germany could have done it sooner or better, which I thought very strange for one who, I had reason to believe, never saw a sword in his life before, except their own wooden swords. However, it seems, as I learned afterwards, they make their wooden swords so sharp, so heavy, and the wood is so hard, that they will even cut off heads with them, aye, and arms and that at one blow, too. When he had done this, he comes laughing to me in sign of triumph, and brought me the sword again, and with abundance of gestures which I did not understand, laid it down, with the head of the savage that he had killed, just before me. But that which astonished him most was to know how I killed the other Indian so far off. So pointing to him he made signs to me to let him go to him, and I bade him go, as well as I could, when he came to him, he stood like one amazed, looking at him, turning him first on one side, then on the other, looking at the wound the bullet had made, which it seems was just in his breast, where it had made a hole, and no great quantity of blood had followed, but he had bled inwardly, for he was quite dead. 
He took up his bow and arrows, and came back. So I turned to go away, and beckoned him to follow me, making signs to him that more might come after them. Upon this he made signs to me that he should bury them with sand, that they might not be seen by the rest, if they followed, and so I made signs to him again to do so. He fell to work, and in an instant he had scraped a hole in the sand with his hands big enough to bury the first in, and then dragged him into it and covered him, and did so by the other also. I believe he had buried them both in a quarter of an hour. Then, calling away, I carried him, not to my castle, but quite away to my cave, on the farther part of the island, so I did not let my dream come to pass in that part, that he came into my grove for shelter. Here I gave him bread and a bunch of raisins to eat, and a draught of water, which I found he was indeed in great distress for, from his running, and having refreshed him I made signs for him to go and lie down to sleep, showing him a place where I had laid some rice straw and a blanket upon it, which I used to sleep upon myself sometimes, so the poor creature lay down and went to sleep. He was a comely, handsome fellow, perfectly well made, with straight, strong limbs, not too large, tall and well shaped, and as I reckon about twenty-six years of age. He had a very good countenance, not a fierce and surly aspect, but seemed to have something very manly in his face, and yet he had all the sweetness and softness of a European in his countenance, too, especially when he smiled. His hair was long and black, not curled like wool, his forehead very high and large, and a great vivacity and sparkling sharpness in his eyes. The colour of his skin was not quite black, but very tawny, and yet not an ugly, yellow, nauseous tawny, as the Brazilians and Virginians and other natives of America are, but of a bright kind of a dun olive colour, that had in it something very agreeable, though not very easy to describe. His face was round and plump, his nose small, not flat, like the negroes, a very good mouth, thin lips, and his fine teeth well set, and as white as ivory. After he had slumbered, rather than slept, about half an hour, he awoke again, and came out of the cave to me, for I had been milking my goats which I had in the enclosure just by. When he espied me he came running to me, laying himself down again upon the ground, with all the possible signs of a humble, thankful disposition, making a great many antic gestures to show it. At last he lays his head flat upon the ground, close to my foot, and sets my other foot upon his head, as he had done before, and after this made all the signs to me of subjection, servitude, and submission imaginable, to let me know how he would serve me so long as he lived. I understood him in many things, and let him know I was very well pleased with him. In a little time I began to speak to him, and teach him to speak to me, and first I let him know his name should be Friday, which was the day I saved his life. I called him so for the memory of the time. I likewise taught him to say Master, and then let him know that was to be my name. I likewise taught him to say Yes and No, and to know the meaning of them. I gave him some milk in an earthen pot, and let him see me drink it before him, and sop my bread in it, and gave him a cake of bread to do the like, which he quickly complied with, and made signs that it was very good for him. I kept there with him all that night, but as soon as it was day I beckoned to him to come with me, and let him know I would give him some clothes, at which he seemed very glad, for he was stark naked. As we went by the place where he had buried the two men, he pointed exactly to the place, and showed me the marks that he had made to find them again, making signs to me that we should dig them up again, and eat them. At this I appeared very angry, expressed my abhorrence of it, made as if I would vomit at the thoughts of it, and beckoned with my hand to him to come away, which he did immediately, with great submission. I then led him up to the top of the hill to see if his enemies were gone, and pulling out my glass I looked, and saw plainly the place where they had been, but no appearance of them or their canoes. So it was plain they were gone, and had left their two comrades behind them, without any search after them. But I was not content with this discovery, but having now more courage, and consequently more curiosity, I took my man Friday with me, 
giving him the sword in his hand, with the bow and arrows at his back, which I found he could use very dexterously, making him carry one gun for me, and I too for myself, and away we marched to the place where these creatures had been, for I had a mind now to get some further intelligence of them. When I came to the place my very blood ran chill in my veins, and my heart sunk within me, at the horror of the spectacle. Indeed, it was a dreadful sight, at least it was so to me, though Friday made nothing of it. The place was covered with human bones, the ground died with their blood, and great pieces of flesh left here and there, half-eaten, mangled and scorched, and in short all the tokens of the triumphant feast they had been making there, after a victory over their enemies. I saw three skulls, five hands, and the bones of three or four legs and feet, and abundance of other parts of the bodies. And Friday, by his signs, made me understand that they brought over four prisoners to feast upon, that three of them were eaten up, and that he, pointing to himself, was the fourth, that there had been a great battle between them and their next king, of whose subjects, it seems, he had been one, and that they had taken a great number of prisoners, all which were carried to several places by those who had taken them in the fight, in order to feast upon them, as was done here by these wretches upon those they brought hither. I caused Friday to gather all the skulls, bone, flesh, and whatever remained, and lay them together in a heap, and make a great fire upon it, and burn them all to ashes. I found Friday had still a hankering stomach after some of the flesh, and was still a cannibal in his nature, but I showed so much abhorrence at the very thoughts of it, and at the least appearance of it, that he durst not discover it, for I had by some means let him know that I would kill him if he offered it. When he had done this, we came back to our castle, and there I fell to work for my man Friday, and first of all I gave him a pair of linen drawers, which I had out of the poor gunner's chest I mentioned, which I found in the wreck, and which with a little alteration fitted him very well and then I made him a jerkin of goat-skin, as well as my skill would allow, for I was now grown a tolerably good tailor, and I gave him a cap which I made of hare's skin very convenient and fashionable enough, and thus he was clothed, for the present, tolerably well, and was mighty well pleased to see himself almost as well clothed as his master. It is true he went awkwardly in these clothes at first, wearing the drawers was very awkward to him, and the sleeves of the waistcoat galled his shoulders and the inside of his arms, but a little easing them where he complained they hurt him, and using himself to them, he took to them at length very well. The next day, after I came home to my hutch with him, I began to consider where I should lodge him, and that I might do well for him and yet be perfectly easy myself, I made a little tent for him in the vacant place between my two fortifications, in the inside of the last, and in the outside of the first. As there was a door or entrance there into my cave, I made a formal framed door-case, and a door to it, of boards, and set it up in the passage, a little within the entrance, and causing the door to open in the inside, I barred it up in the night, taking in my ladders, too, so that Friday could no way come at me in the inside of my innermost wall, without making so much noise in getting over that it must needs awaken me for my first wall had now a complete roof over it of long poles, covering all my tent, and leaning up to the side of the hill, which was again laid across with smaller sticks, instead of laths, and then thatched over a great thickness with the rice straw, which was strong like reeds, and at the hole or place which was left to go in or out by the ladder I had placed a kind of trap-door, which, if it had been attempted on the outside, would not have opened at all, but would have fallen down and made a great noise. As to weapons, I took them all into my side every night. But I needed none of all this precaution, for never man had a more faithful, loving, sincere servant than Friday was to me, without passions, sullenness, or designs, perfectly obliged and engaged. His very affections were tied to me, like those of a child to a father." and I dare say he would have sacrificed his life to save mine upon any occasion whatsoever. The many testimonies he gave me of this put it out of doubt, and soon convinced me that I needed to use no precautions for my safety on his account. This frequently gave me occasion to observe, and that with wonder, 
that however it had pleased God in his providence, and in the government of the works of his hands, to take from so great a part of the world of his creatures the best uses to which their faculties and the powers of their souls are adapted, yet that he has bestowed upon them the same powers, the same reason, the same affections, the same sentiments of kindness and obligation, the same passions and resentments of wrongs, the same sense of gratitude, sincerity, fidelity, and all the capacities of doing good and receiving good that he has given to us, and that when he pleases to offer them occasions of exerting these, they are as ready, nay, more ready, to apply them to the right uses for which they were bestowed than we are. This made me very melancholy sometimes, in reflecting, as the several occasions presented, how mean a use we make of all these, even though we have these powers enlightened by the great lamp of instruction, the Spirit of God, and by the knowledge of His Word added to our understanding. And why it has pleased God to hide the like saving knowledge from so many millions of souls, who, if I might judge by this poor savage, would make a much better use of it than we did. From hence I sometimes was led too far, to invade the sovereignty of providence, and, as it were, arraign the justice of so arbitrary a disposition of things, that should hide that sight from some, and reveal it to others, and yet expect a like duty from both. But I shut it up, and checked my thoughts with this conclusion. First, that we did not know by what light and law these should be condemned, but that as God was necessarily, and by the nature of His being, infinitely holy and just, so it could not be, but if these creatures were all sentenced to absence from Himself, it was on account of sinning against that light which, as the Scripture says, was a law to themselves, and by such rules as their consciences would acknowledge to be just, though the foundation was not discovered to us. And secondly, that still as we are all the clay in the hand of the potter, no vessel could say to him, Why hast thou formed me thus? But to return to my new companion. I was greatly delighted with him, and made it my business to teach him everything that was proper to make him useful, handy, and helpful, but especially to make him speak, and understand me when I spoke, and he was the aptest scholar that ever was, and particularly was so merry, so constantly diligent, and so pleased when he could but understand me, or make me understand him, that it was very pleasant for me to talk to him. Now my life began to be so easy that I began to say to myself, that could I but have been safe from more savages, I cared not if I was never to remove from the place where I lived. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of Robinson Crusoe this LibriVox recording is in the public domain, and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe Chapter 15 Friday's Education After I had been two or three days returned to my castle, I thought that, in order to bring Friday off from his horrid way of feeding, and from the relish of a cannibal's stomach, I ought to let him taste other flesh, so I took him out with me one morning to the woods. I went, indeed, intending to kill a kid out of my own flock, and bring it home and dress it, but as I was going I saw a she-goat lying down in the shade, and two young kids sitting by her. I catched hold of Friday. Hold, said I, stand still, and made signs to him not to stir. Immediately I presented my piece, shot, and killed one of the kids. The poor creature, who at a distance indeed, seen me kill the savage, his enemy, but did not know, nor could imagine how it was done, was sensibly surprised, trembled and shook, and looked so amazed that I thought he would have sunk down. He did not see the kid I shot at, or perceive I had killed it, but ripped up his waistcoat to feel whether he was not wounded, and as I found presently, thought I was resolved to kill him, for he came and kneeled down to me, and embracing my knees, said a great many things I did not understand, but I could easily see the meaning was to pray me not to kill him. 
I soon found a way to convince him that I would do him no harm, and taking him up by the hand, laughed at him, and pointing to the kid which I had killed, beckoned to him to run and fetch it, which he did, and while he was wandering and looking to see how the creature was killed, I loaded my gun again. By and by I saw a great fowl like a hawk, sitting upon a tree within shot, so, to let Friday understand a little what I would do, I called him to me again, pointed at the fowl, which was indeed a parrot, though I thought it had been a hawk. I say, pointing to the parrot and to my gun, and to the ground under the parrot, to let him see I would make it fall, I made him understand that I would shoot and kill that bird. Accordingly I fired and bade him look, and immediately he saw the parrot fall. He stood like one frightened again notwithstanding all I had said to him, and I found he was the more amazed, because he did not see me put anything into the gun, but thought that there must be some wonderful fund of death and destruction in that thing, able to kill man, beast, bird, or anything near or far off. And the astonishment this created in him was such as could not wear off for a long time, and I believe, if I would have let him, he would have worshipped me and my gun." As for the gun itself, he would not so much as touch it for several days after, but he would speak to it and talk to it, as if it had answered him when he was by himself, which, as I afterwards learned of him, was to desire it not to kill him. Well, after his astonishment was a little over at this, I pointed to him to run and fetch the bird I had shot, which he did, but stayed some time, for the parrot not being quite dead, had fluttered away a good distance from the place where she fell. However, he found her, took her up, and brought her to me, and as I had perceived his ignorance about the gun before, I took this advantage to charge the gun again, and not to let him see me do it, that I might be ready for any other mark that might present, but nothing more offered at that time. So I brought home the kid, and the same evening I took the skin off, and cut it out as well as I could, and having a pot fit for that purpose, I boiled or stewed some of the flesh, and made some very good broth. After I had begun to eat some, I gave some to my man, who seemed very glad of it, and liked it very well, but that which was strangest to him was to see me eat salt with it. He made a sign to me that the salt was not good to eat, and putting a little into his own mouth, he seemed to nauseate it, and would spit and sputter at it, washing his mouth with fresh water after it. On the other hand, I took some meat into my mouth without salt, and I pretended to spit and sputter for want of salt, as much as he had done at the salt. But it would not do, he would never care for salt with meat or in his broth, at least, not for a great while, and then but a very little. Having thus fed him with boiled meat and broth, I was resolved to feast him the next day by roasting a piece of the kid. This I did by hanging it before the fire on a string, as I had seen many people do in England, setting two poles up, one on each side of the fire, and one across the top, and tying the string to the cross-stick, letting the meat turn continually. This Friday admired very much, but when he came to taste the flesh, he took so many ways to tell me how well he liked it, that I could not but understand him, and at last he told me, as well as he could, he could never eat man's flesh any more, which I was very glad to hear. The next day I set him to work beating some corn out, and sifting it in the manner I used to do, as I observed before, and he soon understood how to do it as well as I, especially after he had seen what the meaning of it was, and that it was to make bread of, for after that I let him see me make my bread, and bake it too and in a little time Friday was able to do all the work for me as well as I could do it myself. I began now to consider that having two mouths to feed instead of one, I must provide more ground for my harvest and plant a larger quantity of corn than I used to do. So I marked out a larger piece of land and began to fence in the same manner as before, in which Friday worked not only very willingly and very hard, but did it very cheerfully, and I told him what it was for, that it was for corn to make more bread, because he was now with me, and that I might have enough for him and myself too. He appeared very sensible of that part, and let me know that he thought I had much more labor upon me on his account than I had for myself, and that he would work the harder for me if I would tell him what to do. 
This was the pleasantest year of all the life I led in this place. Friday began to talk pretty well, and understand the names of almost everything I had occasion to call for, and of every place I had to send him to, and talked a great deal to me, so that, in short, I began now to have some use for my tongue again, which, indeed, I had very little occasion for before. Besides the pleasure of talking to him, I had a singular satisfaction in the fellow himself. His simple, unfeigned honesty appealed to me more and more every day, and I began really to love the creature, and on his side I believed he loved me more than it was possible for him ever to love anything before. I had a mind once to try if he had any inclination for his own country again, and having taught him English so well that he could answer me almost any question, I asked him whether the nation that he belonged to never conquered in battle, at which he smiled and said, "'Yes, yes, we always fight the better.' That is, he meant always get the better in a fight, and so we began the following discourse. Master, you always fight the better? How came you to be taken prisoner then, Friday? Friday, my nation beat much for all that. Master, how beat? If your nation beat them, how came you to be taken? Friday, they more many than my nation, in the place where me was. They take one, two, three, and me. My nation overbeat them in the yonder place, where me no was. There my nation take one, two, great thousand. Master, but why did not your side recover you from the hands of your enemies, then? Friday, they run one, two, three, and me, and make go in the canoe. My nation have no canoe that time. Master, well, Friday, and what does your nation do with the men they take? Do they carry them away and eat them, as these did? Friday. Yes, my nation eats man's too, eat all up. Master. Where do they carry them? Friday. Go to other place, where they think. Master. Do they come hither? Friday. Yes, yes, they come hither. Come other else place. Master. Have you been here with them? Friday. Yes, I have been here. Points to the northwest side of the island, which it seems was their side. By this I understood that my man Friday had formerly been among the savages who used to come on shore on the farther part of the island, on the same man-eating occasions he was now brought for, and some time after, when I took the courage to carry him to that side, being the same I formerly mentioned, he presently knew the place, and told me he was there once, when they ate up twenty men, two women, and one child. He could not tell twenty in English, but he numbered them by laying so many stones in a row, and pointing to me to tell them over. I have told this passage because it introduces what follows, that after this discourse I had with him, I asked him how far it was from our island to the shore, and whether the canoes were not often lost. He told me there was no danger, no canoes ever lost, but that after a little way out to sea there was a current and wind, always one side in the morning, and the other in the afternoon. This I understood to be no more than the sets of the tide, as going out or coming in, but I afterwards understood it was occasioned by the great draft and reflux of the mighty river Orinoco, in the mouth or gulf of which river, as I found afterwards, our island lay, and that this land, which I perceived to be west and northwest, was the great island Trinidad, on the north point of the mouth of the river. I asked Friday a thousand questions about the country, the inhabitants, the sea, the coast, and what nations were near. He told me all he knew with the greatest openness imaginable. I asked him the names of the several nations of his sort of people, but could get no other name than Caribs, from whence I easily understood that these were the Caribbees, which our maps place on the part of America which reaches from the mouth of the river Orinoco to Guiana, and onwards to St. Martha. He told me that up a great way beyond the moon, that was beyond the setting of the moon, which must be west from their country, there dwelt white-bearded men like me, and pointed to my great whiskers, which I mentioned before, and that they had killed much mans, 
that was his word, by all which I understood he meant the Spaniards, whose cruelties in America had been spread over the whole country, and were remembered by all the nations from father to son. I inquired if he could tell me how I might go from this island, and get among those white men. He told me, "'Yes, yes, you may go in two canoe." I could not understand what he meant, or make him describe to me what he meant by two canoe, till at last, with great difficulty, I found he meant it must be in a large boat, as big as two canoes. This part of Friday's intercourse I began to relish very well, and from this time I entertained some hopes that, one time or other, I might find an opportunity to make my escape from this place, and that this poor savage might be a means to help me. During the long time that Friday had now been with me, and that he began to speak to me and understand me, I was not wanting to lay a foundation of religious knowledge in his mind. Particularly, I asked him one time, who made him? The creature did not understand me at all, but thought I had asked who was his father. But I took it up by another handle, and asked him who made the sea, the ground we walked on, and the hills and woods. He told me, it was one Benumucky that lived beyond all. He could describe nothing of this great person but that he was very old, much older, he said, than the sea or land, than the moon or the stars. I asked him then, if this old person had made all things, why did not all things worship him? He looked very grave, and with a perfect look of innocence said, All things say, O oh, to him. I asked him if the people who die in his country went away anywhere? He said, Yes, they all went to Benamucky. Then I asked him whether those they eat up went thither too. He said, Yes. From these things I began to instruct him in the knowledge of the true God. I told him that the great Maker of all things lived up there, pointing up towards heaven, that he governed the world by the same power and providence by which he made it, that he was omnipotent, and could do everything for us, give everything to us, take everything from us, and thus by degrees I opened his eyes. He listened with great attention, and received with pleasure the notion of Jesus Christ being sent to redeem us, and of the manner of making our prayers to God, and his being able to hear us, even in heaven. He told me one day, that if our God could hear us, up beyond the sun, he must needs be a greater God than their Benamucky, who lived but a little way off, and yet could not hear till they went up to the great mountains where he dwelt, to speak to them. I asked him if he ever went thither to speak to him. He said, No, they never went that were young men, none went thither but the old men, whom he called their Oo Wokaki, that is, as I made him explain to me, their religious or clergy and what they went to say, oh, so he called saying prayers, and then came back and told them what Benamucky said. By this I observed that there is priestcraft even among the most blinded, ignorant pagans in the world, and the policy of making a secret of religion in order to preserve the veneration of the people to the clergy, not only to be found in the Roman, but perhaps, among all religions in the world, even among the most brutish and barbarous savages. I endeavoured to clear up this fraud to my man Friday, and told him that the pretense of their old men going up to the mountains to say O oh to their god Benamucky was a cheat, and their bringing word from thence what he said was much more so, that if they met with any answer, or spake with any one there, it must be with an evil spirit. And then I entered into a long discourse with him about the devil, the origin of him, his rebellion against God, his enmity to man, the reason of it, his setting himself up in the dark parts of the world to be worshipped instead of God and as God, and the many stratagems he made use of to delude mankind to their ruin, how he had a secret access to our passions and to our affections, and to adapt his snares to our inclinations, so as to cause us even to be our own tempters, and run upon our destruction by our own choice." I found it was not so easy to imprint right notions in his mind about the devil as it was about the being of a god. 
Nature assisted all my arguments to evidence to him even the necessity of a great first cause, an overruling governing power, a secret directing providence, and of the equity and justice of paying homage to him that made us, and the like. But there appeared nothing of this kind in the notion of an evil spirit, of his origin, his being, his nature, and above all, of his inclination to do evil, and to draw us to do so too, and the poor creature puzzled me once in such a manner, by a question merely natural and innocent, that I scarce knew what to say to him. I had been talking a great deal to him of the power of God, his omnipotence, his aversion to sin, his being a consuming fire to the workers of iniquity, how, as he had made us all, he could destroy us and all the world in a moment, and he listened with great seriousness to me all the while. After this I had been telling him how the devil was God's enemy in the hearts of men, and used all his malice and skill to defeat the good designs of providence, and to ruin the kingdom of Christ in the world, and the like. Well, says Friday, but you say God is so strong, so great. Is he not much strong, much might as the devil? Yes, yes, says I. Friday, God is stronger than the devil. God is above the devil, and therefore we pray to God to tread him down under our feet, and enable us to resist his temptations and quench his fiery darts. But, says he again, if God much stronger, much might as the wicked devil, why God no kill the devil, so make him no more do wicked? I was strangely surprised at this question, and after all, though I was now an old man, yet I was but a young doctor, and ill-qualified for a casuist or a solver of difficulties, and at first I could not tell what to say. So I pretended not to hear him, and asked him what he said, but he was too earnest for an answer to forget his question, so that he repeated it in the very same broken words as above. By this time I had recovered myself a little, and I said, God will at last punish him severely. He is reserved for the judgment, and is to be cast into the bottomless pit, to dwell with everlasting fire. This did not satisfy Friday, but he returns upon me, repeating my words. Reserve at last, me no understand. But why not kill the devil now, not kill great ago? You may as well ask me, said I. Why God does not kill you or me, when we do wicked things here that offend him? We are preserved to repent and be pardoned. He mused some time on this. Well, well, says he, mighty affectionately, that well. So you, I, devil, all wicked, all preserve, repent, God pardon all. Here I was run down again by him to the last degree, and it was a testimony to me how the mere notions of nature, though they will guide reasonable creatures to the knowledge of a God, and of a worship or homage due to the supreme being of God, as the consequence of our nature, yet nothing but divine revelation can form the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and of redemption purchased for us, of a mediator of the new covenant, and of an intercessor at the footstool of God's throne. I say, nothing but a revelation from heaven can form these in the soul, and that therefore the gospel of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, I mean the word of God, and the Spirit of God, promise for the guide and sanctifier of his people, are the absolutely necessary instructors of the souls of men in the saving knowledge of God and the means of salvation. I therefore diverted the present discourse between me and my man, rising up hastily as upon some sudden occasion of going out, then sending him for something a good way off, I seriously prayed to God that he would enable me to instruct savingly this poor savage, assisting, by his spirit, the heart of the poor ignorant creature to receive the light of the knowledge of God in Christ, reconciling him to himself, and would guide me so to speak to him from the word of God, that his conscience might be convinced, his eyes opened, and his soul saved. When he came again to me, I entered into a long discourse with him upon the subject of the redemption of man by the Saviour of the world, and of the doctrine of the gospel preached from heaven, that is, of repentance towards God, 
and faith in our blessed Lord Jesus. I then explained to him as well as I could why our blessed Redeemer took not on him the nature of angels, but the seed of Abraham, and how, for that reason, the fallen angels had no share in the redemption, that he came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and the like. I had, God knows, more sincerity than knowledge in all the methods I took for this poor creature's instruction, and must acknowledge what I believe all that act upon the same principle will find, that in laying things open to him, I really informed and instructed myself in many things that either I did not know, or had not fully considered before, but which occurred naturally to my mind upon searching into them, for the information of this poor savage, and I had more affection in my inquiry after things after this occasion than ever I felt before, so that, whether this poor wild wretch was better for me or no, I had great reason to be thankful that ever he came to me, my grief sat lighter upon me, my habitation grew comfortable to me beyond measure, and when I reflected that in this solitary life which I had been confined to, I had not only been moved to look up to heaven myself, and to seek the hand that had brought me here, but was now to be made an instrument under providence to save the life and for aught I knew, the soul of a poor savage, and bring him to the true knowledge of religion and of the Christian doctrine, that he might know Christ Jesus, in whom is life eternal. I say, when I reflected upon all these things, a secret joy ran through every part of my soul, and I frequently rejoiced that ever I was brought to this place, which I had so often thought the most dreadful of all afflictions that could possibly have befallen me. I continued in this thankful frame all the remainder of my time, and the conversation which employed the hours between Friday and me was such as made the three years which we lived there together perfectly and completely happy, if any such thing as complete happiness can be formed in a sublunary state. This savage was now a good Christian, a much better than I, though I have reason to hope, and bless God for it, that we were equally penitent and comforted, restored penitents. We had here the word of God to read, and no farther off from his spirit to instruct than if we had been in England. I always applied myself in reading the scripture to let him know, as well as I could, the meaning of what I read, and he again, by his serious inquiries and questionings, made me, as I said before, a much better scholar in the scripture knowledge than I ever should have been by my own mere private reading. Another thing I cannot refrain from observing here also, from experience in this retired part of my life, that is, how infinite and inexpressible a blessing it is that the knowledge of God, and of the doctrine of salvation by Christ Jesus, is so plainly laid down in the word of God, so easy to be received and understood, that, as the bare reading the scripture made me capable of understanding enough of my duty, to carry me directly on to the great work of sincere repentance for my sins, and laying hold of a Saviour for life and salvation, to a stated reformation in practice, and obedience to all God's commands, and this without any teacher or instructor, I mean human, so the same plain instructions sufficiently served to the enlightening the savage creature, and bringing him to be such a Christian as I have known few equal to him in my life. As to all the disputes, wrangling, strife, and contention which have happened in the world about religion, whether niceties in doctrines or schemes of church government, they were all perfectly useless to us, and for aught I can yet see, they have been so to the rest of the world. We had the sure guide to heaven, that is, the word of God, and we had, blessed be God, comfortable views of the Spirit of God teaching and instructing by His word, leading us into all truth, and making us both willing and obedient to the instruction of His word. And I cannot see the least use that the greatest knowledge of the disputed points of religion, which have made such confusion in the world, would have been to us, if we could have obtained it. But I must go on with the historical part of things, and take every part in its order. After Friday and I became more intimately acquainted, and that he could understand almost all I said to him, and speak pretty fluently, though in broken English, to me, I acquainted him with my own history, 
or at least so much of it as related to my coming to this place, how I had lived there, and how long, I led him into the mystery, for such it was to him, of gunpowder and bullet, and taught him how to shoot. I gave him a knife, which he was wonderfully delighted with, and I made him a belt, with a frog hanging to it, such as in England we wear hangers in, and in the frog, instead of a hanger, I gave him a hatchet, which was not only as good a weapon in some cases, but much more useful upon other occasions. I described to him the country of Europe, particularly England, which I came from, how we lived, how we worshipped God, how we behaved to one another, and how we traded in ships to all parts of the world. I gave him an account of the wreck which I had been on board of, and showed him, as near as I could, the place where she lay, but she was all beaten in pieces before, and gone. I showed him the ruins of our boat, which we lost when we escaped, and which I could not stir with my whole strength then, but was now fallen almost all to pieces. Upon seeing this boat, Friday stood, musing a great while, and said nothing. I asked him what it was he studied upon. At last, says he, Me see such boat like come to place at my nation. I did not understand him a good while, but at last, when I had examined further into it, I understood by him that a boat, such as that had been, came on shore upon the country where he lived, that is, as he explained it, was driven thither by stress of weather. I presently imagined that some European ship must have been cast away upon their coast, and the boat might get loose and drive ashore, but was so dull that I never once thought of men making their escape from a wreck thither, much less whence they might come, so I only inquired after a description of the boat. Friday described the boat to me well enough, but brought me better to understand him when he added with some warmth, We save the white mans from drown. Then I presently asked if there were any white mans, as he called them, in the boat. Yes, he said. The boat full of white mans. I asked him how many. He told upon his fingers seventeen. I asked him then what became of them. He told me, They live, they dwell at my nation. This put new thoughts into my head, for I presently imagined that these might be the men belonging to the ship that was cast away in the sight of my island, as I now call it, and who, after the ship was struck on the rock, and they saw her inevitably lost, had saved themselves in their boat, and were landed upon that wild shore among the savages. Upon this I inquired of him more critically what was become of them. He assured me they lived still there, that they had been there about four years, that the savages left them alone and gave them victuals to live on. I asked him how it came to pass they did not kill and eat them. He said, No, they make brother with them. That is, as I understood him, a truce. And then he added, They no eat mans but when make the war fight. That is to say, they never eat any men but such as come to fight with them and are taken in battle. It was after this some considerable time, that being upon the top of the hill at the east side of the island, from whence, as I have said, I had in a clear day discovered the main or continent of America, Friday, the weather being very serene, looks very earnestly towards the mainland, and in a kind of surprise falls a-jumping and dancing, and calls out to me, for I was at some distance from him. I asked him what was the matter. "'Oh, joy!' says he. "'Oh, glad! There see my country, there my nation!' I observed an extraordinary sense of pleasure appeared in his face, and his eyes sparkled, and his countenance discovered a strange eagerness, as if he had a mind to be in his own country again. This observation of mine put a great many thoughts into me, which made me at first not so easy about my new man Friday as I was before, and I made no doubt but that, if Friday could get back to his own nation again, he would not only forget all his religion but all his obligation to me, and would be forward enough to give his countrymen an account of me, and come back, perhaps with a hundred or two of them, and make a feast upon me, at which he might be as merry as he used to be with those of his enemies when they were taken in war. But I wronged the poor honest creature very much, 
for which I was very sorry afterwards. However, as my jealousy increased, and held some weeks, I was a little more circumspect, and not so familiar and kind to him as before, in which I was certainly wrong too, the honest, grateful creature having no thought about it but what consisted with the best principles, both as a religious Christian and as a grateful friend, as appeared afterwards to my full satisfaction. While my jealousy of him lasted, you may be sure I was every day pumping him to see if he would discover any of the new thoughts which I suspected were in him. But I found everything he said was so honest and so innocent that I could find nothing to nourish my suspicion. And in spite of all my uneasiness, he made me at last entirely his own again, nor did he in the least perceive that I was uneasy, and therefore I could not suspect him of deceit. One day, walking up the same hill, but the weather being hazy at sea, so that we could not see the continents, I called to him and said, "'Friday, do you not wish yourself in your own country, your own nation?' "'Yes,' he said. "'I be much, oh, glad to be at my own nation.' "'What would you do there?' said I. "'Would you turn wild again, eat men's flesh again, and be a savage as you were before?' He looked full of concern, and shaking his head said, No, no, Friday tell them to live good, tell them to pray God, tell them to eat cornbread, cattle flesh, milk, no eat man again. Why then, said I to him, they will kill you. He looked grave at that, and then said, No, no, they no kill me, they willing love learn. He meant by this they would be willing to learn. He added, they learned much of the bearded mans that came in the boat. Then I asked him if he would go back to them. He smiled at that, and told me that he could not swim so far. I told him I would make a canoe for him. He told me he would go if I would go with him. I go, says I. Why, they will eat me if I come there. No, no, says he. Me make they no eat you, me make they much love you. He meant he would tell them how I had killed his enemies and saved his life, and so he would make them love me. Then he told me, as well as he could, how kind they were to seventeen white men, or bearded men, as they called them, who came on shore there in distress. From this time, I confess, I had a mind to venture over, and see if I could possibly join with those bearded men, who I made no doubt were Spaniards and Portuguese, not doubting but, if I could, we might find some method to escape from thence, being upon the continent, and a good company together, better than I could from an island forty miles off the shore, alone and without help. So, after some days, I took Friday to work again by way of discourse, and told him I would give him a boat to go back to his own nation, and accordingly I carried him to my frigate, which lay on the other side of the island, and having cleared it of water, for I always kept it sunk in water, I brought it out, showed it him, and we both went into it. I found he was a most dexterous fellow at managing it, and would make it go almost as swift again as I could. So when he was in, I said to him, "'Well now, Friday, shall we go to your nation?' He looked very dull at my saying so which it seems was because he thought the boat was too small to go so far. I then told him I had a bigger, so the next day I went to the place where the first boat lay which I had made, and which I could not get into the water. He said that was big enough, but then, as I had taken no care of it, and it had lain two or three and twenty years there, the sun had so split and dried it that it was rotten. Friday told me such a boat would do very well, and would carry— much enough fiddle, drink bread. That was his way of talking. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of Robinson Crusoe this LibriVox recording is in the public domain, and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe Chapter 16 
Rescue of Prisoners from Cannibals. Upon the whole I was by this time so fixed upon my design of going over with him to the continent, that I told him we would go and make one as big as that, and he should go home in it. He answered not one word, but looked very grave and sad. I asked him what was the matter with him. He asked me again, "'Why you angry mad with Friday? What me done?' I asked him what he meant. I told him I was not angry with him at all. "'No angry!' says he, repeating the word several times, "'Why send Friday home away to my nation?' "'Why,' says I, "'Friday, did you not say you wished you were there?' "'Yes, yes,' says he, "'wish we both there. No wish Friday there, no master there.' In a word, he would not think of going there without me. "'I go there Friday,' says I. "'What shall I do there?' He turned very quick upon me at this. "'You do great deal much good,' says he. "'You teach wild mans be good, sober, tame mans. You tell them no God, pray God, and live new life.' "'Alas, Friday,' says I, "'thou knowest not what thou sayest. I am but an ignorant man myself.' "'Yes, yes,' says he. "'You teach ye me good. You teach ye them good.' No, no, Friday, says I, you shall go without me. Leave me here to live by myself as I did before. He looked confused again at that word, and running to one of the hatchets which he used to wear, he takes it up hastily and gives it to me. What must I do with this? says I to him. You take you, Friday, says he. What must I kill you for? said I again. He returns very quick. What you send Friday away for? Take kill Friday, no send Friday away. This he spoke so earnestly that I saw tears stand in his eyes. In a word, I so plainly discovered the utmost affection in him to me, and a firm resolution in him, that I told him then and often after, that I would never send him away from me if he was willing to stay with me. Upon the whole, as I found by all his discourse, a settled affection to me, and that nothing could part him from me, so I found all the foundation of his desire to go to his own country was laid in his ardent affection to the people, and his hopes of my doing them good, a thing which, as I had no notion of myself, so I had not the least thought or intention or desire of undertaking it. But still I found a strong inclination to attempting my escape, founded on the supposition gathered from the discourse, that there were seventeen bearded men there, and therefore, without any more delay, I went to work with Friday to find out a great tree proper to fell, and make a large periagua, or canoe, to undertake the voyage. There were trees enough in the island to have built a little fleet, not of periaguas or canoes, but even of good large vessels, but the main thing I looked at was, to get one so near the water that we might launch it when it was made, to avoid the mistake I committed at first. At last Friday pitched upon a tree, for I found he knew much better than I what kind of wood was fittest for it, nor can I tell to this day what wood to call the tree we cut down, except that it was very like the tree we call fustic, or between that and the Nicaragua wood, for it was much of the same color and smell. Friday wished to burn the hollow or cavity of this tree out, to make it for a boat, but I showed him how to cut it with tools, which, after I had showed him how to use, he did very handily, and in about a month's hard labour we finished it and made it very handsome, especially when, with our axes, which I showed him how to handle, we cut and hewed the outside into the true shape of a boat. After this, however, it cost us near a fortnight's time to get her along, as it were, inch by inch, upon great rollers, into the water. But when she was in, she would have carried twenty men with great ease. When she was in the water, though she was so big, it amazed me to see with what dexterity and how swift my man Friday could manage her, turn her, and paddle her along. So I asked him if he would, and if we might venture over in her. Yes, he said, we venture over in her very well though great blow wind. However, I had a further design that he knew nothing of, and that was to make a mast and a sail, 
and to fit her with an anchor and cable. As to a mast, that was easy enough to get, so I pitched upon a straight young cedar tree, which I found near the place, and which there were great plenty of in the island, and I set Friday to work to cut it down, and gave him directions how to shape and order it. But as to the sail, that was my particular care. I knew I had old sails, or rather pieces of old sails, enough, but as I had had them now six and twenty years by me, and had not been very careful to preserve them, not imagining that I should ever have this kind of use for them, I did not doubt but they were all rotten, and indeed most of them were so. However, I found two pieces which appeared pretty good, and with these I went to work, and with a great deal of pains and awkward stitching, you may be sure, for want of needles, I at length made a three-cornered ugly thing, like what we call in England a shoulder of mutton sail, to go with a boom at bottom, and a little short sprit at the top, such as usually our ship's longboats sail with, and such as I best knew how to manage, as it was such a one as I had to the boat in which I made my escape from Barbary, as related in the first part of my story. I was near two months performing this last work, that is, rigging and fitting my masts and sails, for I finished them very complete, making a small stay and a sail or foresail to it, to assist if we should turn to windward, and, what was more than all, I fixed a rudder to the stern of her to steer with. I was but a bungling shipwright, yet as I knew the usefulness and even necessity of such a thing, I applied myself with so much pains to do it, that at last I brought it to pass." though, considering the many dull contrivances I had for it that failed, I think it cost me almost as much labour as making the boat. After this was done, I had my man Friday to teach as to what belonged to the navigation of my boat. Though he knew very well how to paddle a canoe, he knew nothing of what belonged to a sail and a rudder, and was the most amazed when he saw me work the boat to and again in the sea by the rudder and how the sail jibbed and filled this way or that way as the course we sailed changed. I say when he saw this he stood like one astonished and amazed. However, with a little use I made all these things familiar to him, and he became an expert sailor, except that of the compass I could make him understand very little. On the other hand, as there was very little cloudy weather, and seldom or never any fogs in these parts, there was the less occasion for a compass, seeing the stars were always to be seen by night, and the shore by day, except in the rainy seasons, and then nobody cared to stir abroad either by land or sea. I was now entered on the seven and twentieth year of my captivity in this place, though the three last years that I had this creature with me ought rather to be left out of the account, my habitation being quite of another kind than in all the rest of the time. I kept the anniversary of my landing here with the same thankfulness to God for His mercies as at first, and if I had such cause of acknowledgment at first, I had much more so now, having such additional testimonies of the care of Providence over me, and the great hopes I had of being effectually and speedily delivered, for I had an invincible impression upon my thoughts that my deliverance was at hand, and that I should not be another year in this place. I went on, however, with my husbandry, digging, planting, and fencing as usual. I gathered and cured my grapes, and did every necessary thing as before. The rainy season was in the meantime upon me, when I kept more within doors than at other times. We had stowed our new vessel as secure as we could, bringing her up into the creek, where, as I said in the beginning, I landed my rafts from the ship, and hauling her up to the shore at high water mark, I made my man Friday dig a little dock, just big enough to hold her, and just deep enough to give her water enough to float in. And then, when the tide was out, we made a strong dam across the end of it, to keep the water out. And so she lay, dry as to the tide from the sea, and to keep the rain off we laid a great many boughs of trees, so thick that she was as well thatched as a house, and thus we waited for the months of November and December, in which I designed to make my adventure. When the settled season began to come in, as the thought of my design returned with the fair weather, I was preparing daily for the voyage, and the first thing I did was to lay by a certain quantity of provisions, being the stores for our voyage, and intended in a week or a fortnight's time to open the dock 
and launch out our boat. I was busy one morning upon something of this kind, when I called to Friday, and bid him to go to the seashore and see if he could find a turtle or a tortoise, a thing which we generally got once a week, for the sake of the eggs as well as the flesh. Friday had not been long gone when he came running back, and flew over my outer wall or fence, like one that felt not the ground or the steps he set his foot on, and before I had time to speak to him he cries out to me, "'O oh, master! O oh, master! O oh, sorrow! O oh, bad!' "'What's the matter, Friday?' says I. "'Oh, yonder there!' says he. "'One, two, three canoes! One, two, three! By this way of speaking I concluded there were six, but on inquiry I found there were but three. "'Well, Friday,' says I, "'do not be frightened.' So I heartened him up as well as I could. However, I saw the poor fellow was most terribly scared, for nothing ran in his head but that they were come to look for him, and would cut him in pieces and eat him, and the poor fellow trembled so that I scarcely knew what to do with him. I comforted him as well as I could, and told him I was in as much danger as he, and that they would eat me as well as him. But, says I, Friday, we must resolve to fight them. Can you fight, Friday? Me shoot, says he, but there come many great number. No matter for that, said I again. Our guns will fright them that we do not kill. So I asked him whether, if I resolved to defend him, he would defend me, and stand by me, and do just as I bid him. He said, Me die when you bid die, master. So I went and fetched a good dram of rum and gave him, for I had been so good a husband of my rum that I had a great deal left. When we had drunk it, I made him take the two fowling pieces, which we always carried, and loaded them with large swan shot, as big as small pistol bullets. Then I took four muskets, and loaded them with two slugs and five small bullets each, and my two pistols I loaded with a brace of bullets each. I hung my great sword, as usual, naked by my side, and gave Friday his hatchet. When I had thus prepared myself, I took my perspective glass, and went up to the side of the hill, to see what I could discover. And I found quickly by my glass that there were one and twenty savages, three prisoners, and three canoes, and that their whole business seemed to be the triumphant banquet upon these three human bodies, a barbarous feast indeed. But nothing more than, as I had observed, was usual with them. I observed also that they had landed, not where they had done when Friday made his escape, but nearer to my creek, where the shore was low, and where a thick wood came almost close down to the sea. This, with the abhorrence of the inhuman errand these wretches came about, filled me with such indignation that I came down again to Friday, and told him I was resolved to go down to them and kill them all, and asked him if he would stand by me. He had now got over his fright, and his spirits being a little raised with the dram I had given him, he was very cheerful, and told me, as before, he would die when I bid die. In this fit of fury I divided the arms which I had charged, as before, between us. I gave Friday one pistol to stick in his girdle, and three guns upon his shoulder, and I took one pistol and the other three guns myself, and in this posture we marched out. I took a small bottle of rum in my pocket, and gave Friday a large bag with more powder and bullets, and as to orders, I charged him to keep close behind me, and not to stir, or shoot, or do anything till I bid him, and in the meantime not to speak a word. In this posture I fetched a compass to my right hand of near a mile, as well to get over the creek as to get into the wood, so that I could come within shot of them before I should be discovered, which I had seen by my glass it was easy to do. While I was making this march, my former thoughts returning, I began to abate my resolution. I do not mean that I entertained any fear of their number, for as they were naked, unarmed wretches, it is certain I was superior to them, nay, though I had been alone. But it occurred to my thoughts, what call, what occasion, much less what necessity I was in to go and dip my hands in blood, to attack people who had neither done or intended me any wrong who, as to me, were innocent, and whose barbarous customs were their own disaster, being in them a token, indeed, of God's having left them, with the other nations of that part of the world, to such stupidity, 
and to such inhuman courses, but did not call me to take upon me to be a judge of their actions, much less an executioner of his justice, that whenever he thought fit he would take the cause into his own hands, and by national vengeance punish them as a people for national crimes. But that, in the meantime, it was none of my business, that it was true Friday might justify it, because he was a declared enemy and in a state of war with those very particular people, and it was lawful for him to attack them, but I could not say the same with regard to myself. These things were so warmly pressed upon my thoughts all the way as I went, that I resolved I would only go and place myself near them that I might observe their barbarous feast, and that I would act then as God should direct, but that unless something offered that was more a call to me than yet I knew of, I would not meddle with them. With this resolution I entered the wood, and with all possible weariness and silence, Friday, following close at my heels, I marched till I came to the skirts of the wood on the side which was next to them, only that one corner of the wood lay between me and them. Here I called softly to Friday, and showing him a great tree which was just at the corner of the wood, I bade him go to the tree, and bring me word if he could see there plainly what they were doing. He did so, and came immediately back to me, and told me they might be plainly viewed there, that they were all about their fire, eating the flesh of one of their prisoners, and that another lay bound upon the sand a little from them, whom he said they would kill next, and this fired the very soul within me. He told me it was not one of their nation, but one of the bearded men he had told me of, that came to their country in the boat. I was filled with horror at the very naming of the white bearded man, and going to the tree I saw plainly by my glass a white man, who lay upon the beach of the sea with his hands and feet tied with flags, or things like rushes, and that he was a European, and had clothes on. There was another tree and a little thicket beyond it, about fifty yards nearer to them than the place where I was, which, by going a little way about, I saw I might come at, undiscovered, and that then I should be within half a shot of them. So I withheld my passion, though I was indeed enraged to the highest degree. And going back about twenty paces, I got behind some bushes, which held all the way till I came to the other tree and then came to a little rising ground, which gave me a full view of them at the distance of about eighty yards. I had now not a moment to lose, for nineteen of the dreadful wretches sat upon the ground, all close huddled together, and had just sent the other two to butcher the poor Christian, and to bring him perhaps limb by limb to their fire, and they were stooping down to untie the bands at his feet. I turned to Friday. Now, Friday, said I, do as I bid thee. Friday said he would. Then Friday, says I, do exactly as you see me do, fail in nothing. So I set down one of the muskets and the fowling piece upon the ground, and Friday did the like by his, and with the other musket I took my aim at the savages, bidding him to do the like. Then asking him if he was ready, he said, yes. Then fire at them, said I, and at the same moment I fired also. Friday took his aim so much better than I, that on the side that he shot he killed two of them, and wounded three more, and on my side I killed one and wounded two. They were, you may be sure, in a dreadful consternation, and all of them that were not hurt jumped upon their feet, but did not immediately know which way to run, or which way to look, for they knew not from whence their destruction came. Friday kept his eyes close upon me, that, as I had bid him, he might observe what I did. So, as soon as the first shot was made, I threw down the piece, and took up the fowling piece, and Friday did the like. He saw me cock and present. He did the same again. "'Are you ready, Friday?' said I. "'Yes,' says he. "'Let fly, then,' says I, "'in the name of God!' And with that I fired again among the amazed wretches, and so did Friday. And as our pieces were now loaded with what I call swan-shot, or small pistol-bullets, we found only two drop, but so many were wounded that they ran about yelling and screaming like mad creatures, all bloody, and most of them miserably wounded, whereof three more fell quickly after, though not quite dead. Now, Friday, says I, laying down the discharged pieces and taking up the musket which was yet loaded, follow me. 
which he did with a great deal of courage, upon which I rushed out of the wood and showed myself, and fried a close at my foot. As soon as I perceived they saw me, I shouted as loud as I could, and bade Friday do so too, and running as fast as I could, which, by the way, was not very fast, being loaded with arms as I was, I made directly towards the poor victim, who was, as I said, lying upon the beach or shore, between the place where they sat and the sea. The two butchers who were just going to work with him had left him at the surprise of our first fire, and fled in a terrible fright to the seaside, and had jumped into a canoe, and three more of the rest made the same way. I turned to Friday, and bade him step forwards and fire at them. He understood me immediately, and running about forty yards to be nearer them, he shot at them, and I thought he had killed them all, for I saw them all fall of a heap into the boat, though I saw two of them up again quickly. However, he killed two of them, and wounded the third, so that he lay in the bottom of the boat, as if he had been dead. While my man Friday fired at them, I pulled out my knife and cut the flags that bound the poor victim, and loosing his hands and feet I lifted him up and asked him in the Portuguese tongue what he was. He answered in Latin, Christianus, but was so weak and faint that he could scarce stand or speak. I took my bottle out of my pocket and gave it him, making signs that he should drink, which he did, and I gave him a piece of bread, which he ate. Then I asked him what countryman he was, and he said, Espanol, and being a little recovered, let me know, by all the signs he could possibly make, how much he was in my debt for his deliverance. Senor, said I, with as much Spanish as I could make up, we will talk afterwards, but we must fight now. If you have any strength left, take this pistol and sword and lay about you. He took them very thankfully, and no sooner had he the arms in his hands, but— as if they had put new vigour into him, he flew upon his murderers like a fury, and had cut two of them in pieces in an instant, for the truth is, as the whole was a surprise to them, so the poor creatures were so much frightened with the noise of our pieces that they fell down for mere amazement and fear, and had no more power to attempt their own escape than their flesh had to resist our shot, and that was the case of those five that Friday shot at in the boat, for as three of them fell with the hurt they received, so the other two fell with a fright. I kept my piece in my hand, still without firing, being willing to keep my charge ready, because I had given the Spaniard my pistol and sword. So I called to Friday, and bade him run up to the tree from whence we first fired, and fetch the arms which lay there that had been discharged, which he did with great swiftness, and then giving him my musket, I sat down myself to load all the rest again, and bade them come to me when they wanted— while I was loading these pieces, there happened a fierce engagement between the Spaniard and one of the savages, who made at him with one of their great wooden swords, the weapon that was to have killed him before, if I had not prevented it. The Spaniard, who was as bold and brave as could be imagined, though weak, had fought the Indian a good while, and had cut two great wounds on his head, but the savage being a stout, lusty fellow, closing in with him, had thrown him down, being faint, and was wringing my sword out of his hand, when the Spaniard, though undermost, wisely quitting the sword, drew the pistol from his girdle, shot the savage through the body, and killed him upon the spot, before I, who was running to help him, could come near him. Friday, being now left to his liberty, pursued the flying wretches, with no weapon in his hand but his hatchet, and with that he dispatched those three, who, as I said before, were wounded at first, and fallen, and all the rest he could come up with. And the Spaniard coming to me for a gun, I gave him one of the fowling pieces, with which he pursued two of the savages, and wounded them both. But as he was not able to run, they both got from him into the wood, where Friday pursued them, and killed one of them, but the other was too nimble for him, and though he was wounded, yet had plunged himself into the sea, and swam with all his might off to those two who were left in the canoe, which three in the canoe, with one wounded, that we knew not whether he died or no, were all that escaped our hands of one in twenty. The account of the whole is as follows. Three killed at our first shot from the tree, two killed at the next shot, two killed by Friday in the boat, two killed by Friday of those at first wounded, one killed by Friday in the wood, three killed by the Spaniard, 
four killed, being found dropped here and there, of the wounds, or killed by Friday in his chase of them, four escaped in the boat, whereof one wounded, if not dead, twenty-one in all. Those that were in the canoe worked hard to get out of gunshot, and though Friday made two or three shots at them, I did not find that he hit any of them. Friday would fain have had me take one of their canoes and pursue them, and indeed I was very anxious about their escape, lest, carrying the news home to their people, they should come back perhaps with two or three hundred of the canoes and devour us by mere multitude. So I consented to pursue them by sea, and running to one of their canoes, I jumped in and bade Friday follow me. But when I was in the canoe I was surprised to find another poor creature lie there, bound hand and foot, as the Spaniard was, for the slaughter, and almost dead with fear, not knowing what was the matter, for he had not been able to look up over the side of the boat, but he was tied so hard, neck and heels, and had been tied so long that he had really but little life in him. I immediately cut the twisted flags or rushes which they had bound him with, and would have helped him up, but he could not stand or speak, but groaned most piteously, believing, it seems, still, that he was only unbound in order to be killed. When Friday came to him, I bade him speak to him, and tell him of his deliverance, and pulling out my bottle, made him give the poor wretch a dram, which, with the news of his being delivered, revived him, and he sat up in the boat." but when Friday came to hear him speak and look in his face, it would have moved any one to tears to have seen how Friday kissed him, embraced him, hugged him, cried, laughed, hallooed, jumped about, danced, sang, then cried again, wrung his hands, beat his own face and head, and then sang and jumped about again like a distracted creature. It was a good while before I could make him speak to me, or tell me what was the matter, but when he came a little to himself, he told me that it was his father. It is not easy for me to express how it moved me to see what ecstasy and filial affection had worked in this poor savage at the sight of his father, and of his being delivered from death. Nor indeed can I describe half the extravagances of his affection after this, for he went into the boat and out of the boat a great many times. When he went into him, he would sit down by him, open his breast, and hold his father's head close to his bosom for many minutes together, to nourish it. Then he took his arms and ankles, which were numbed and stiff with the binding, and chafed and rubbed them with his hands, and I, perceiving what the case was, gave him some rum out of my bottle to rub them with, which did them a great deal of good. This affair put an end to our pursuit of the canoe with the other savages who were now almost out of sight, and it was happy for us that we did not, for it blew so hard within two hours after, and before they could be got a quarter of their way, and continued blowing so hard all night, and that from the northwest which was against them, that I could not suppose their boat could live, or that they ever reached their own coast. But to return to Friday. He was so busy about his father that I could not find in my heart to take him off for some time, but after I thought he could leave him a little, I called him to me, and he came jumping and laughing, and pleased to the highest extreme. Then I asked him if he had given his father any bread. He shook his head, and said, "'None! Ugly dog eat up all self!' I then gave him a cake of bread out of a little pouch I carried on purpose, I also gave him a dram for himself, but he would not taste it, but carried it to his father. I had in my pocket two or three bunches of raisins, so I gave him a handful of them for his father. He had no sooner given his father these raisins, but I saw him come out of the boat, and run away as if he had been bewitched, for he was the swiftest fellow on his feet that ever I saw. I say, he ran at such a rate that he was out of sight, as it were, in an instant and though I called, and hallooed out, too, after him, it was all one, away he went, and in a quarter of an hour I saw him come back again, though not so fast as he went, and as he came nearer I found his pace slacker, because he had something in his hand. When he came up to me I found he had been quite home for an earthen jug or pot, to bring his father some fresh water, and that he had got two more cakes or loaves of bread, the bread he gave me, but the water he carried to his father. However, as I was very thirsty too, I took a little of it. 
the water revived his father more than all the rums or spirits I had given him, for he was fainting with thirst. When his father had drunk, I called to him to know if there was any water left. He said, Yes, and I bade him give it to the poor Spaniard, who was in as much want of it as his father, and I sent one of the cakes that Friday brought to the Spaniard too, who was indeed very weak, and was reposing himself upon a green place under the shade of a tree, and whose limbs were also very stiff, and very much swelled with the rude bandage he had been tied with. When I saw that upon Friday's coming to him with the water he sat up and drank, and took the bread and began to eat, I went to him, and gave him a handful of raisins. He looked up in my face with all the tokens of gratitude and thankfulness that could appear in any countenance, but was so weak, notwithstanding he had so exerted himself in the fight, that he could not stand up upon his feet. He tried to do it two or three times, but was really not able. His ankles were so swelled and so painful to him. So I bade him sit still, and caused Friday to rub his ankles, and bathe them with rum, as he had done his father's. I observed the poor, affectionate creature, every two minutes, or perhaps less, all the while he was here, turn his head about to see if his father was in the same place and posture as he left him sitting, and at last he found he was not to be seen, at which he started up, and without speaking a word, flew with that swiftness to him that one could scarce perceive his feet to touch the ground as he went. But when he came, he only found he had laid himself down to ease his limbs, so Friday came back to me presently. And then I spoke to the Spaniard to let Friday help him up, if he could, and lead him to the boat, and then he should carry him to our dwelling, where I would take care of him. But Friday, a lusty, strong fellow, took the Spaniard upon his back, and carried him away to the boat, and set him down softly upon the side or gunwale of the canoe, with his feet in the inside of it, and then lifting him quite in, he set him close to his father, and presently stepping out again, launched the boat off, and paddled it along the shore faster than I could walk, though the wind blew pretty hard, too. So he brought them both safe into our creek, and leaving them in the boat, ran away to fetch the other canoe. As he passed me, I spoke to him, and asked him whither he went. He told me, "'Go fetch more boat!' So away he went like the wind, for sure never man or horse ran like him, and he had the other canoe in the creek almost as soon as I got to it by land. So he wafted me over, and then went to help our new guests out of the boat, which he did. But they were neither of them able to walk, so that poor Friday knew not what to do. To remedy this, I went to work in my thought, and calling to Friday to bid them sit down on the bank when he came to me, I soon made a kind of hand-barrow to lay them on, and Friday and I carried them both up together upon it between us. But when we got them to the outside of our wall, or fortification, we were at a worse loss than before, for it was impossible to get them over, and I was resolved not to break it down. So I set to work again, and Friday and I, in about two hours' time, made a very handsome tent, covered with old sails, and above that with boughs of trees, being in the space without our outward fence, and between that and the grove of young wood which I had planted. And here we made them two beds of such things as I had, that is, of good rice straw, with blankets laid upon it to lie on, and another to cover them on each bed. My island was now peopled and I thought myself very rich in subjects, and it was a merry reflection, which I frequently made, how like a king I looked. First of all, the whole country was my own property, so that I had an undoubted right of dominion. Secondly, my people were perfectly subjected. I was absolutely lord and lawgiver. They all owed their lives to me, and were ready to lay down their lives, if there had been occasion for it, for me. It was remarkable, too, I had but three subjects, and they were of three different religions. My man Friday was a Protestant, his father was a pagan and a cannibal, and the Spaniard was a papist. However, I allowed liberty of conscience throughout my dominions, but this is by the way. As soon as I had secured my two weak, rescued prisoners, and given them shelter, and a place to rest them upon, I began to think of making some provision for them and the first thing I did, I ordered Friday to take a yearling goat, betwixt a kid and a goat, 
out of my particular flock, to be killed. When I cut off the hinder quarter, and chopping it into small pieces, I set Friday to work boiling and stewing, and made them a very good dish, I assure you, of flesh and broth. And as I cooked it without doors, for I made no fire within my inner wall, so I carried it all into the new tent, and having set a table there for them, I sat down and ate my own dinner also with them, and, as well as I could, cheered them and encouraged them. Friday was my interpreter, especially to his father, and indeed to the Spaniard too, for the Spaniard spoke the language of the savages pretty well. After we had dined, or rather supped, I ordered Friday to take one of the canoes, and go and fetch our muskets and other firearms, which, for want of time, we had left upon the place of battle, and the next day I ordered him to go and bury the dead bodies of the savages, which lay open to the sun, and would presently be offensive. I also ordered him to bury the hard remains of their barbarous feast, which I could not think of doing myself. Nay, I could not bear to see them if I went that way. All which he punctually performed, and effaced the very appearance of the savages being there, so that when I went again, I could scarce know where it was, otherwise than by the corner of the wood pointing to the place. I then began to enter into a little conversation with my two new subjects, and first I set Friday to inquire of his father what he thought of the escape of the savages in that canoe, and whether we might expect a return of them, with a power too great for us to resist. His first opinion was, that the savages in the boat never could live out the storm which blew that night they went off, but must of necessity be drowned, or driven south to those other shores, where they were as sure to be devoured as they were to be drowned if they were cast away, but as to what they would do if they came safe on shore, he said he knew not. But it was his opinion that they were so dreadfully frightened with the manner of their being attacked, the noise and the fire, that he believed they would tell the people they were all killed by thunder and lightning, not by the hand of man, and that the two which appeared, that is, Friday and I, were two heavenly spirits or furies come down to destroy them, and not men with weapons." This, he said, he knew, because he heard them all cry out so, in their language, one to another, for it was impossible for them to conceive that a man could dart fire, and speak thunder, and kill at a distance, without lifting up the hand, as was done now. And this old savage was in the right, for, as I understood since, by other hands, the savages never attempted to go over to the island afterwards, they were so terrified with the accounts given by those four men for it seems they did escape the sea, that they believed whoever went to that enchanted island would be destroyed with fire from the gods. This, however, I knew not, and therefore was under continual apprehensions for a good while, and kept always upon my guard with all my army, for as there were now four of us, I would have ventured upon a hundred of them, fairly in the open field, at any time. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of Robinson Crusoe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. Chapter 17 Visit of Mutineers. In a little time, however, no more canoes appearing, the fear of their coming wore off and I began to take my former thoughts of a voyage to the main into consideration, being likewise assured by Friday's father that I might depend upon good usage from their nation, on his account, if I would go. But my thoughts were little suspended when I had a serious discourse with the Spaniard, and when I understood that there were sixteen more of his countrymen and Portuguese, who, having been cast away and made their escape to that side, lived there at peace, indeed, with the savages, but were very sore put to it for necessaries, and indeed for life. I asked him all the particulars of their voyage, and found they were a Spanish ship, bound from the Rio de la Plata to the Havana, being directed to leave their loading there, which was chiefly hides and silver, and to bring back what European goods they could meet with there. 
that they had five Portuguese seamen on board, whom they took out of another wreck, that five of their own men were drowned when first the ship was lost, and that these escaped through infinite dangers and hazards, and arrived, almost starved, on the cannibal coast, where they expected to have been devoured every moment. He told me they had some arms with them, but they were perfectly useless, for that they had neither powder nor ball, the washing of the sea having spoiled all their powder but a little, which they used at their first landing to provide themselves with some food. I asked him what he thought would become of them there, and if they had formed any design of making their escape. He said they had many consultations about it, but that having neither vessel nor tools to build one, nor provisions of any kind, their counsels always ended in tears and despair. I asked him how he thought they would receive a proposal from me, which might tend towards an escape, and whether, if they were all here, it might not be done. I told him with freedom, I feared mostly their treachery and ill-usage of me, if I put my life in their hands, for that gratitude was no inherent virtue in the nature of man, nor did men always square their dealings by the obligations they had received so much as they did by the advantages they expected. I told him it would be very hard that I should be made the instrument of their deliverance, and that they should afterwards make me their prisoner in New Spain, where an Englishman was certain to be made a sacrifice, what necessity or what accident soever brought him thither, and that I had rather be delivered up to the savages and be devoured alive than to fall into the merciless claws of the priests and be carried into the Inquisition. I added that, otherwise, I was persuaded, if they were all here, we might, with so many hands, build a bark large enough to carry us all away, either to the Brazils southward, or to the islands or Spanish coast northward, but that if, in requital, they should, when I had put weapons into their hands, carry me by force among their own people, I might be ill-used for my kindness to them, and make my case worse than it was before. He answered, with a great deal of candour and ingenuousness, that their condition was so miserable, and that they were so sensible of it, that he believed they would abhor the thought of using any man unkindly that should contribute to their deliverance, and that, if I pleased, he would go to them with the old man, and discourse with them about it, and return again and bring me their answer, that he would make conditions with them upon their solemn oath, that they should be absolutely under my direction as their commander and captain, and they should swear upon the holy sacraments and gospel to be true to me, and go to such Christian country as I should agree to, and no other, and to be directed wholly and absolutely by my orders till they were landed safely in such country as I intended, and that he would bring a contract from them, under their hands, for that purpose. Then he told me he would first swear to me himself that he would never stir from me as long as he lived till I gave him orders, and that he would take my side to the last drop of his blood if there should happen the least breach of faith among his countrymen. He told me they were all of them very civil, honest men, and they were under the greatest distress imaginable, having neither weapons nor clothes, nor any food, but at the mercy and discretion of the savages, out of all hopes of ever returning to their own country, and that he was sure, if I would undertake their relief, they would live and die by me. Upon these assurances, I resolved to venture to relieve them, if possible, and to send the old savage and this Spaniard over to them to treat. But when we had got all things in readiness to go, the Spaniard himself started an objection, which had so much prudence in it on one hand, and so much sincerity on the other hand, that I could not but be very well satisfied in it, and, by his advice, put off the deliverance of his comrades for at least half a year. The case was thus. He had been with us now about a month, during which time I had let him see in what manner I had provided, with the assistance of Providence, for my support, and he saw evidently what stock of corn and rice I had laid up, which, though it was more than sufficient for myself, yet it was not sufficient, without good husbandry, for my family, now it was increased to four, but much less would it be sufficient if his countrymen, who were, as he said, sixteen, still alive, should come over, and least of all would it be sufficient to victual our vessel, if we should build one, 
for a voyage to any of the Christian colonies of America. So he told me he thought it would be more advisable to let him and the other two dig and cultivate some more land, as much as I could spare seed to sow, and that we should wait another harvest, that we might have a supply of corn for his countrymen when they should come, for want might be a temptation to them to disagree, or not to think themselves delivered, otherwise than out of one difficulty into another. You know, says he, the children of Israel, though they rejoiced at first for their being delivered out of Egypt, yet rebelled even against God himself, that delivered them, when they came to want bread in the wilderness. His caution was so seasonable, and his advice so good, that I could not but be very well pleased with his proposal, as well as I was satisfied with his fidelity. So we fell to digging, all four of us, as well as the wooden tools we were furnished with, permitted, and in about a month's time, by the end of which it was seed time, we had got as much land cured and trimmed up as we sowed two and twenty bushels of barley on, and sixteen jars of rice, which was, in short, all the seed we had to spare. Indeed, we left ourselves barely sufficient for our own food for the six months that we had to expect our crop, that is to say, reckoning from the time we set our seed aside for sowing, for it is not to be supposed it is six months in the ground in that country. Having now society enough, and our numbers being sufficient to put us out of fear of the savages, if they had come, unless their number had been very great, we went freely all over the island, whenever we found occasion, and as we had our escape or deliverance upon our thoughts, it was impossible, at least for me, to have the means of it out of mine. For this purpose I marked out several trees, which I thought fit for our work, and I set Friday and his father to cut them down, and then I caused the Spaniard, to whom I imparted my thoughts on that affair, to oversee and direct their work. I showed them with what indefatigable pains I had hewed a large tree into single planks, and I caused them to do the like, till they made about a dozen large planks, of good oak, near two feet broad, thirty-five feet long, and from two inches to four inches thick. What prodigious labour it took up, any one may imagine. At the same time I contrived to increase my little flock of tame goats as much as I could, and for this purpose I made Friday and the Spaniard go out one day, and myself with Friday the next day, for we took our turns, and by this means we got about twenty young kids to breed up with the rest, for whenever we shot the dam we saved the kids, and added them to our flock. But above all, the season for curing the grapes coming on, I caused such a prodigious quantity to be hung up in the sun, that, I believe, had we been at Alicante, where the raisins of the sun are cured, we could have filled sixty or eighty barrels, and these, with our bread, formed a great part of our food. Very good living, too, I assure you, for they are exceedingly nourishing. It was now harvest, and our crop in good order. It was not the most plentiful increase I had seen in the island, but, however, it was enough to answer our end. For, from twenty-two bushels of barley we brought in and thrashed out above two hundred and twenty bushels, and the like in proportion of the rice, which was store enough for our food to the next harvest, though all sixteen Spaniards had been on shore with me. Or, if we had been ready for a voyage, it would very plentifully have victualled our ship to have carried us to any part of the world, that is to say, any part of America. When we had thus housed and secured our magazine of corn, we fell to work to make more wicker ware, that is, great baskets, in which we kept it, and the Spaniard was very handy and dexterous at this part, and often blamed me that I did not make some things for defence of this kind of work, but I saw no need of it. And now, having a full supply of food for all the guests I expected, I gave the Spaniard leave to go over to the main, to see what he could do with those he had left behind him there. I gave him a strict charge not to bring any man who would not first swear in the presence of himself and the old savage, that he would in no way injure, fight with, or attack the person he should find in the island, who was so kind as to send for them in order to their deliverance, but that they would stand by him and defend him against all such attempts, and wherever they went would be entirely under and subjected to his command, and that this should be put in writing and signed in their hands. 
How they were to have done this, when I knew they had neither pen nor ink, was a question which we never asked. Under these instructions, the Spaniard and the old savage, the father of Friday, went away in one of the canoes which they might be said to have come in, or rather were brought in, when they came as prisoners to be devoured by the savages. I gave each of them a musket with a firelock on it, and about eight charges of powder and ball, charging them to be very good husbands of both, and not to use either of them but upon urgent occasions. This was a cheerful work, being the first measures used by me in view of my deliverance for now twenty-seven years and some days. I gave them provisions of bread and of dried grapes, sufficient for themselves for many days, and sufficient for all the Spaniards, for about eight days' time, and wishing them a good voyage, I saw them go, agreeing with them about a signal they should hang out at their return, by which I should know them again when they came back, at a distance, before they came on shore. They went away with a fair gale on the day that the moon was at full, by my account, in the month of October, but as for an exact reckoning of days, after I had once lost it I could never recover it again, nor had I kept even the number of years so punctually as to be sure I was right, though, as it proved when I afterwards examined my account, I found I had kept a true reckoning of years. It was no less than eight days I had waited for them, when a strange and unforeseen accident intervened, of which the like has not perhaps been heard of in history. I was fast asleep in my hutch one morning, when my man Friday came running into me, and called aloud, "'Master! Master! They are come! They are come!' I jumped up, and regardless of danger I went, as soon as I could get my clothes on, through my little grove, which, by the way, was by this time grown to be a very thick wood. I say, regardless of danger I went without my arms, which was not my custom to do, but I was surprised when, turning my eyes to the sea, I presently saw a boat at about a league and a half distance, standing in for the shore, with a shoulder of mutton sail, as they call it, and the wind blowing pretty fair to bring them in. Also I observed presently that they did not come from that side which the shore lay on, but from the southernmost end of the island. Upon this I called Friday in, and bade him lie close, for these were not the people we looked for, and that we might not know yet whether they were friends or enemies. In the next place I went in to fetch my perspective-glass to see what I could make of them, and having taken the ladder out, I climbed to the top of the hill, as I used to do when I was apprehensive of anything, and to take my view the plainer without being discovered. I had scarce set my foot upon the hill when my eye plainly discovered a ship lying at anchor, at about two leagues and a half distance from me, south-southeast, but not above a league and a half from the shore. By my observation it appeared plainly to be an English ship, and the boat appeared to be an English longboat. I cannot express the confusion I was in, though the joy of seeing a ship, and one that I had reason to believe was manned by my own countrymen, and consequently friends, was such as I cannot describe. But yet I had some secret doubts hung about me, I cannot tell from whence they came, bidding me keep upon my guard. In the first place, it occurred to me to consider what business an English ship could have in that part of the world, since it was not the way to or from any part of the world where the English had any traffic. And I knew there had been no storms to drive them in there, in distress, and that if they were really English, it was most probable that they were here upon no good design, and that I had better continue as I was, than fall into the hands of thieves and murderers. Let no man despise the secret hints and notices of danger which sometimes are given him, when he may think there is no possibility of its being real. That such hints and notices are given us, I believe few that have made any observation of things can deny, that they are certain discoveries of an invisible world, and a converse of spirits, we cannot doubt. And if the tendency of them seems to be to warn us of danger, why should we not suppose they are from some friendly agent, whether supreme or inferior and subordinate is not the question, and that they are given for our good. The present question abundantly confirms me in the justice of this reasoning, 
for had I not been made cautious by this secret admonition, come it from whence it will, I had been done inevitably and in a far worse condition than before, as you will see presently. I had not kept myself long in this posture till I saw the boat draw near the shore, as if they looked for a creek to thrust in at, for the convenience of landing. However, as they did not come quite far enough, they did not see the little inlet where I formerly landed my rafts, but ran their boat on shore upon the beach, at about a half a mile from me, which was very happy for me, for otherwise they would have landed just at my door, as I may say, and would soon have beaten me out of my castle, and perhaps have plundered me of all I had. When they were on shore I was fully satisfied they were Englishmen, at least most of them. One or two, I thought, were Dutch, but it did not prove so. There were in all eleven men, whereof three of them I found were unarmed, and, as I thought, bound, and when the first four or five of them were jumped on shore, they took those three out of the boat as prisoners. One of the three I could perceive using the most passionate gestures of entreaty, affliction, and despair, even to a kind of extravagance. The other two, I could perceive, lifted up their hands sometimes, and appeared concerned indeed, but not to such a degree as the first. I was perfectly confounded at the sight, and knew not what the meaning of it should be. Friday called out to me in English, as well as he could, "'Oh, master, you see Englishmans eat prisoner as well as savage mans.' "'Why, Friday,' says I, "'do you think they are going to eat them, then?' "'Yes,' says Friday, "'they will eat them.' "'No, no,' says I. "'Friday, I am afraid they will murder them, indeed, but you may be sure they will not eat them.' All this while I had no thought of what the matter really was, but stood trembling with the horror of the sight, expecting every moment when the three prisoners should be killed. Nay, once I saw one of the villains lift up his arm with a great cutlass, as the seamen call it, or sword, to strike one of the poor men, and I expected to see him fall every moment, at which all the blood in my body seemed to run chill in my veins. I wished heartily now for the Spaniard, and the savage that had gone with him, or that I had any way to have come undiscovered within shot of them, that I might have secured the three men, for I saw no firearms they had among them, but it fell out to my mind another way. After I had observed the outrageous usage of the three men by the insolent seamen, I observed the fellows run scattering about the island, as if they wanted to see the country. I observed that the three other men had liberty to go also where they pleased, but they sat down all three upon the ground, very pensive, and looked like men in despair. This put me in mind of the first time when I came on shore, and began to look about me, how I gave myself over for lost, how wildly I looked around me, what dreadful apprehensions I had, and how I lodged in the tree all night for fear of being devoured by wild beasts. As I knew nothing that night of the supply I was to receive by the providential driving of the ship, nearer the land by the storms and tide, by which I have since been so long nourished and supported, so these three poor desolate men knew nothing how certain of deliverance and supply they were, how near it was to them, and how effectually and really they were in a condition of safety, at the same time that they thought themselves lost and their case desperate. So little do we see before us in the world, and so much reason have we to depend cheerfully upon the great Maker of the world, that He does not leave His creatures so absolutely destitute, but that in the worst circumstances they have always something to be thankful for, and sometimes are nearer deliverance than they imagine, nay, are even brought to their deliverance by the means by which they seem to be brought to their destruction. It was just at high water when these people came on shore and while they rambled about to see what kind of a place they were in, they had carelessly stayed till the tide was spent, and the water was ebbed considerably away, leaving their boat aground. They had left two men in the boat, who, as I found afterwards, having drunk a little too much brandy, fell asleep. However, one of them waking a little sooner than the other, and finding the boat too fast aground for him to stir it, hallooed out for the rest, who were straggling about upon which they all soon came to the boat, but it was past all their strength to launch her, the boat being very heavy, 
and the shore on that side being a soft, oozy sand, almost like a quicksand. In this condition, like true seamen, who are perhaps the least of all mankind given to forethought, they gave it over, and away they strolled about the country again, and I heard one of them say aloud to another, calling them off from the boat, "'Why, let her alone, Jack, can't you? She'll float next tide,' by which I was fully confirmed in the main inquiry of what countrymen they were. All this while I kept myself very close, not once daring to stir out of my castle any farther than to my place of observation near the top of the hill, and very glad I was to think how well it was fortified. I knew it was no less than ten hours before the boat could float again, and by that time it would be dark, and I might be at more liberty to see their motions, and to hear their discourse, if they had any. In the meantime I fitted myself up for a battle as before, though with more caution, knowing I had to do with another kind of enemy than I had at first. I ordered Friday also, whom I had made an excellent marksman with his gun, to load himself with arms. I took myself two fowling pieces, and I gave him three muskets. My figure indeed was very fierce. I had my formidable goatskin coat on, with the great cap I have mentioned, two pistols in my belt, and a gun upon each shoulder. It was my design, as I said above, not to have made any attempt till it was dark, but about two o'clock, being the heat of the day, I found that they were all gone straggling into the woods, and, as I thought, laid down to sleep. The three poor distressed men, too anxious for their condition to get any sleep, had, however, sat down under the shelter of a great tree, at about a quarter of a mile from me, and, as I thought, out of sight of any of the rest. Upon this I resolved to discover myself to them, and learn something of their condition. Immediately I marched as above, my man Friday at a good distance behind me, as formidable for his arms as I, but not making quite so staring a spectre-like figure as I did. I came as near them undiscovered as I could, and then, before any of them saw me, I called aloud to them in Spanish, "'What are you, gentlemen?' They started up at the noise, but were ten times more confounded when they saw me and the uncouth figure that I made. They made no answer at all, but I thought I perceived them just going to fly from me when I spoke to them in English. "'Gentlemen,' said I, "'do not be surprised at me. Perhaps you may have a friend near when you did not expect it.' "'He must be sent directly from heaven, then,' said one of them very gravely to me and pulling off his hat at the same time to me, for our condition is past the help of man. "'All help is from heaven, sir,' said I. "'But can you put a stranger in the way to help you? For you seem to be in some great distress. I saw you when you landed, and when you seemed to make application to the brutes that came with you, I saw one of them lift up his sword to kill you.' The poor man, with tears running down his face and trembling, looked like one astonished, returned, "'Am I talking to God or man? Is it a real man or an angel?' "'Be it no fear about that, sir,' said I. "'If God had sent an angel to relieve you, he would have come better clothed, and armed after another manner than you see me. Pray lay aside your fears. I am a man, an Englishman, and disposed to assist you. You see I have one servant only, we have arms and ammunition. Tell us freely. Can we serve you? What is your case? Our case, sir, said he, is too long to tell you while our murderers are so near us. But in short, sir, I was commander of that ship. My men have mutinied against me. They have been hardly prevailed on not to murder me, and at last have set me on shore in this desolate place, with these two men with me, one my mate, the other a passenger where we expected to perish, believing the place to be uninhabited, and know not yet what to think of it. "'Where are these brutes, your enemies?' said I. "'Do you know where they are gone?' "'There they lie, sir,' said he, pointing to a thicket of trees. "'My heart trembles for fear they have seen us and heard you speak. If they have, they will certainly murder us all.' "'Have they any firearms?' said I. He answered, they had only two pieces, one of which they left in the boat. "'Well, then,' said I, "'leave the rest to me. 
I see they are all asleep. It is an easy thing to kill them all. But shall we rather take them prisoners? He told me there were two desperate villains among them that it was scarce safe to show any mercy to, but if they were secured, he believed all the rest would return to their duty. I asked him which they were. He told me he could not at that distance distinguish them, but he would obey my orders in anything I would direct. Well, says I, let us retreat out of their view or hearing, lest they awake, and we will resolve further. So they willingly went back with me till the woods covered us from them. "'Look you, sir,' said I, "'if I venture upon your deliverance, are you willing to make two conditions with me?' He anticipated my proposals by telling me that both he and the ship, if recovered, should be wholly directed and commanded by me in everything, and if the ship was not recovered, he would live and die with me in what part of the world soever I would send him, and the two other men said the same. "'Well,' says I, my conditions are but two. First, that while you stay in this island with me, you will not pretend to any authority here, and if I put arms in your hands, you will, upon all occasions, give them up to me, and do no prejudice to me or mine upon this island, and in the meantime be governed by my orders. Secondly, that if the ship is or may be recovered, you will carry me and my man to England passage-free." He gave me all the assurances that the invention or faith of man could devise that he would comply with these most reasonable demands, and besides would owe his life to me, and acknowledge it upon all occasions as long as he lived. "'Well, then,' said I, "'here are three muskets for you, with powder and ball. Tell me next what you think is proper to be done.' He showed all the testimonies of his gratitude that he was able, but offered to be wholly guided by me. I told him I thought it was very hard venturing anything, but the best method I could think of was to fire on them at once as they lay, and if any were not killed at the first volley, and offered to submit, we might save them, and so put it wholly upon God's providence to direct the shot. He said, very modestly, that he was loath to kill them if he could help it, but that those two were incorrigible villains, and had been the authors of all the mutiny in the ship, and if they escaped, we should be undone still, for they would go on board and bring the whole ship's company, and destroy us all. Well then, says I, necessity legitimates my advice, for it is the only way to save our lives. However, seeing him still cautious of shedding blood, I told him they should go themselves and manage as they found convenient. In the middle of this discourse we heard some of them awake, and soon after we saw two of them on their feet. I asked him if either of them were the heads of the mutiny. He said, No. Well then, said I, you may let them escape, and Providence seems to have awakened them on purpose to save themselves. Now, says I, if the rest escape you, it is your fault. Animated with this, he took the musket I had given him in his hand, and a pistol in his belt, and his two comrades with him, with each a piece in his hand. The two men who were with him going first made some noise, at which one of the seamen who was awake turned about, and seeing them coming, cried out to the rest, but was too late then, for the moment he cried out, they fired. I mean the two men, the captain wisely reserving his own piece. They had so well aimed their shot at the men they knew, that one of them was killed on the spot, and the other very much wounded, but not being dead he started up on his feet, and called eagerly for help to the other. But the captain, stepping to him, told him it was too late to cry for help, he should call upon God to forgive his villainy, and with that word knocked him down with the stock of his musket, so that he never spoke more. There were three more in the company, and one of them was slightly wounded. By this time I was come, and when they saw their danger, and that it was in vain to resist, they begged for mercy." The captain told them he would spare their lives if they would give him an assurance of their abhorrence of the treachery they had been guilty of, and would swear to be faithful to him in recovering the ship, and afterwards in carrying her back to Jamaica from whence they came. They gave him all the protestations of their sincerity that could be desired, and he was willing to believe them and spare their lives, which I was not against, 
only that I obliged him to keep them bound hand and foot while they were on the island. While this was doing, I sent Friday with the captain's mate to the boat with orders to secure her, and bring away the oars and sails, which they did, and by and by three straggling men, that were, happily for them, parted from the rest, came back upon hearing the guns fired, and seeing the captain who was before their prisoner, now their conqueror, they submitted to be bound also, and so our victory was complete. It now remained that the captain and I should inquire into one another's circumstances. I began first, and told him my whole story, which he heard with an attention even to amazement, and particularly at the wonderful manner of my being furnished with provisions and ammunition, and indeed, as my story is a whole collection of wonders, it affected him deeply. But when he reflected from thence upon himself, and how I seemed to have been preserved there on purpose to save his life, the tears ran down his face, and he could not speak a word more. After this communication was at an end, I carried him and his two men into my apartment, leading them in just where I came out, that is, at the top of the house, where I refreshed them with such provisions as I had, and showed them all the contrivances I had made during my long, long inhabiting that place. All I showed them, all I said to them, was perfectly amazing. But above all, the captain admired my fortification, and how perfectly I had concealed my retreat with a grove of trees, which having been now planted nearly twenty years, and the trees growing much faster than in England, was become a little wood, so thick that it was impassable in any part of it but at that one side where I had reserved my little winding passage into it. I told him this was my castle and my residence, but that I had a seat in the country, as most princes have, whither I could retreat upon occasion, and I would show him that too another time, but at present our business was to consider how to recover the ship. He agreed with me as to that, but told me he was perfectly at a loss what measures to take, for that there were still six and twenty hands on board, who, having entered into a cursed conspiracy, by which they had all forfeited their lives to the law, would be hardened in it now by desperation, and would carry it on, knowing that if they were subdued they would be brought to the gallows as soon as they came to England, or to any of the English colonies, and that therefore there would be no attacking them with so small a number as we were. I mused for some time on what he had said, and found it was a very rational conclusion, and that therefore something was to be resolved on speedily, as well to draw the men on board into some snare for their surprise, as to prevent their landing upon us and destroying us. Upon this it presently occurred to me that in a little while the ship's crew, wondering what was become of their comrades, and of the boat, would certainly come on shore in their other boat to look for them, and that then, perhaps, they might come armed, and be too strong for us. This he allowed to be rational. Upon this I told him the first thing we had to do was to stave the boat which lay upon the beach, so that they might not carry her off, and taking everything out of her, leave her so far useless as not to be fit to swim. Accordingly we went on board, took the arms which were left on board out of her, and whatever else we found there, which was a bottle of brandy, and another of rum, a few biscuit cakes, a horn of powder, and a great lump of sugar in a piece of canvas, the sugar was five or six pounds, all of which was very welcome to me, especially the brandy and sugar, of which I had had none left for many years. When we had carried all these things on shore, the oars, mast, sail, and rudder of the boat were carried away before, we knocked a great hole in her bottom, that if they had come strong enough to master us, yet they could not carry off the boat. Indeed, it was not so much in my thoughts that we could be able to recover the ship, but my view was that if they went away without the boat, I did not much question to make her again fit to carry as to the leeward islands, and call upon our friends the Spaniards in my way, for I had them still in my thoughts. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of Robinson Crusoe 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe Chapter 18 The Ship Recovered While we were thus preparing our designs, and had first, by main strength, heaved the boat upon the beach, so high that the tide would not float her off at high water mark, and besides had broke a hole in her bottom too big to be quickly stopped, and were set down musing what we should do, we heard the ship fire a gun, and make a waft with her ensign as a signal for the boat to come on board. But no boat stirred, and they fired several times, making other signals for the boat. At last, when all their signals and firing proved fruitless, and they found the boat did not stir, we saw them, by the help of my glasses, hoist another boat out and row towards the shore, and we found, as they approached, that there were no less than ten men in her, and that they had firearms with them. As the ship lay almost two leagues from the shore, we had a full view of them as they came, and a plain sight even of their faces, because the tide having set them a little to the east of the other boat, they rowed up under shore, to come to the same place where the other had landed, and where the boat lay. By this means I say we had a full view of them, and the captain knew the persons and characters of all the men in the boat, of whom he said, there were three very honest fellows, who, he was sure, were led into this conspiracy by the rest, being overpowered and frightened. But that is for the boatswain, who it seems was the chief officer among them, and all the rest, they were as outrageous as any of the ship's crew, and were no doubt made desperate in their new enterprise, and terribly apprehensive he was that they would be too powerful for us. I smiled at him, and told him that men in our circumstances were past the operation of fear, that seeing almost every condition that could be was better than that which we were supposed to be in. We ought to expect that the consequence, whether death or life, would be sure to be a deliverance. I asked him what he thought of the circumstances of my life, and whether a deliverance were not worth venturing for. "'And where, sir,' said I, is your belief of my being preserved here on purpose to save your life, which elevated you a little while ago? For my part,' said I, "'there seems to be but one thing amiss in all the prospect of it.' "'What is that?' say he. "'Why,' said I, "'it is that as you say there are three or four honest fellows among them which should be spared, had they been all of the wicked part of the crew, I should have thought God's providence had singled them out to deliver them into your hands. For depend upon it, every man that comes ashore is our own, and shall die or live as they behave to us. As I spoke this with a raised voice and cheerful countenance, I found it greatly encouraged him, so we set vigorously to our business. We had, upon the first appearance of the boats coming from the ship, considered of separating our prisoners, and we had indeed secured them effectually. Two of them, of whom the captain was less assured than ordinary, I sent with Friday, and one of the three delivered men, to my cave, where they were remote enough and out of danger of being heard or discovered, or of finding their way out of the woods if they could have delivered themselves. Here they left them bound, but gave them provisions, and promised them, if they continued there quietly, to give them their liberty in a day or two, but that if they attempted their escape they should be put to death without mercy. They promised faithfully to bear their confinement with patience, and were very thankful that they had such good usage as to have provisions and light left them, for Friday gave them candles, such as we made ourselves, for their comfort, and they did not know but that he stood sentinel over them at the entrance. The other prisoners had better usage. Two of them were kept pinioned, indeed, because the captain was not able to trust them, but the other two were taken into my service, upon the captain's recommendation, and upon their solemnly engaging to live and die with us. So with them and the three honest men we were seven men, well armed, and I made no doubt we should be able to deal well enough with the ten that were coming, considering that the captain had said there were three or four honest men among them also. As soon as they got to the place where their other boat lay, they ran their boat into the beach, and came all on shore, hauling the boat up after them, 
which I was glad to see, for I was afraid they would rather have left the boat at an anchor some distance from the shore, with some hands in her to guard her, and so we should not be able to seize the boat. Being on shore, the first thing they did, they ran all to their other boat, and it was easy to see they were under a great surprise to find her stripped, as above, of all that was in her, and a great hole in her bottom. After they had mused a while upon this, they set up two or three great shouts, hallooing with all their might, to try if they could make their companions hear. But all was to no purpose. Then they came all close in a ring, and fired a volley of their small arms, which indeed we heard, and the echoes made the woods ring. But it was all one. Those in the cave we were sure could not hear, and those in our keeping, though they heard it well enough, yet durst give no answer to them. They were so astonished at the surprise of this, that, as they told us afterwards, they resolved to go all on board again to their ship, and let them know that the men were all murdered, and the longboat staved. Accordingly, they immediately launched their boat again, and got all of them on board. The captain was terribly amazed, and even confounded at this, believing they would go on board the ship again and set sail, giving their comrades over for lost, and so we should still lose the ship, which he was in hopes we should have recovered. But he was quickly as much frightened the other way. They had not been long put off with the boat when we perceived them all coming on shore again, but with this new measure in their conduct, which it seems they consulted together upon, that is, to leave three men in the boat, and the rest to go on shore, and go up into the country to look for their fellows. This was a great disappointment to us, for now we were at a loss what to do, as our seizing those seven men on shore would be no advantage to us if we let the boat escape because they would row away to the ship, and then the rest of them would be sure to weigh and set sail, and so our recovering the ship would be lost. However, we had no remedy but to wait and see what the issue of things might present. The seven men came on shore, and the three who remained in the boat put her off to a good distance from the shore, and came to an anchor to wait for them, so that it was impossible for us to come at them in the boat. Those that came on shore kept close together, marching towards the top of the little hill under which my habitation lay, and we could see them plainly, though they could not perceive us. We should have been very glad if they would have come nearer us, so that we might have fired at them, or that they would have gone farther off, that we might come abroad. But when they were come to the brow of the hill where they could see a great way into the valleys and woods, which lay towards the northeast part, and where the island lay lowest, they shouted and hallooed till they were weary, and, not caring, it seems, to venture far from the shore, nor far from one another, they sat down together under a tree to consider it. Had they thought fit to have gone to sleep there, as the other part of them had done, they had done the job for us. But they were too full of apprehensions of danger to venture to go to sleep, though they could not tell what the danger was they had to fear. The captain made a very just proposal to me upon this consultation of theirs, that is, that perhaps they would all fire a volley again, to endeavour to make their fellows hear, and that we should all sally upon them just at the juncture when their pieces were all discharged, and they would certainly yield, and we should have them without bloodshed. I liked this proposal, provided it was done while we were near enough to come up to them before they could load their pieces again. But this event did not happen, and we lay still a long time, very irresolute what course to take. At length I told them there would be nothing done, in my opinion, till night, and then, if they did not return to the boat, perhaps we might find a way to get between them and the shore, and so might use some stratagem with them in the boat to get them on shore. We waited a great while, though very impatient for their removing, and were very uneasy when, after long consultation, we saw them all start up and march down towards the sea. It seems they had such dreadful apprehensions of the danger of the place, that they resolved to go on board the ship again, give their companions over for lost, and so go on with their intended voyage with the ship. As soon as I had perceived them go towards the shore, I imagined it to be as it really was that they had given over their search, and were going back again, 
and the captain, as soon as I told him my thoughts, was ready to sink at the apprehensions of it. But I presently thought of a stratagem to fetch them back again, and which answered my end to a tittle. I ordered Friday and the captain's mate to go over the little creek westward, towards the place where the savages came on shore, when Friday was rescued, and so soon as they came to a little rising ground, at about half a mile distant, I bid them halloo out, as loud as they could, and wait till they found the seamen heard them, that as soon as ever they heard the seamen answer them, they should return it again, and then, keeping out of sight, take a round, always answering when the others hallooed, to draw them as far into the island and among the woods as possible, and then wheel about again to me by such ways as I directed them. They were just going into the boat when Friday and the mate hallooed, and they presently heard them, and answering, ran along the shore westward, towards the voice they heard, when they were stopped by the creek, where, the water being up, they could not get over, and called for the boat to come up and set them over, as indeed I expected. When they had set themselves over, I observed that the boat being gone a good way into the creek, and as it were, in a harbour within the land, they took one of the three men out of her to go along with them, and left only two in the boat, having fastened her to the stump of a little tree on the shore. This was what I wished for, and immediately leaving Friday and the captain's mate to their business, I took the rest with me, and crossing the creek out of their sight, we surprised the two men before they were aware, one of them lying on the shore, and the other being in the boat. The fellow on shore was between sleeping and waking, and going to start up, the captain, who was foremost, ran in upon him and knocked him down, and then called out to him in the boat to yield or he was a dead man. They needed very few arguments to persuade a single man to yield, when he saw five men upon him and his comrade knocked down. Besides, this was, it seems, one of the three who were not so hardy in the mutiny as the rest of the crew, and therefore was easily persuaded not only to yield, but afterwards to join very sincerely with us. In the meantime, Friday and the captain's mate so well managed their business with the rest that they drew them, by hallooing and answering, from one hill to another, and from one wood to another, till they not only heartily tired them, but left them where they were, very sure they could not reach back to the boat before it was dark, and indeed, they were heartily tired themselves also, by the time they came back to us. We had nothing now to do but to watch for them in the dark, and to fall upon them, so as to make sure work with them. It was several hours after Friday came back to me before they came back to their boat, and we could hear the foremost of them, long before they came quite up, calling to those behind to come along, and could also hear them answer, and complain how lame and tired they were, and not able to come any faster, which was very welcome news to us. At length they came up to the boat, but it is impossible to express their confusion when they found the boat fast aground in the creek, the tide ebbed out, and their two men gone. We could hear them call one to another in a most lamentable manner, telling one another they were got into an enchanted island, that either there were inhabitants in it, and they should all be murdered, or else there were devils and spirits in it, and they should all be carried away and devoured. They hallooed again and called their two comrades by their names a great many times, but no answer. After some time we could see them, by the little light there was, run about, wringing their hands like men in despair, and sometimes they would go and sit down in the boat to rest themselves, then come ashore again, and walk about again, and so the same thing over again. My men would fain have had me give them leave to fall upon them at once in the dark, but I was willing to take them at some advantage, so as to spare them, and kill as few of them as I could. And especially I was unwilling to hazard the killing of any of our men, knowing the others were very well armed. I resolved to wait, to see if they did not separate, and therefore, to make sure of them, I drew my ambuscade nearer, and ordered Friday and the captain to creep upon their hands and feet, as close to the ground as they could, that they might not be discovered and get as near them as they possibly could before they offered to fire. They had not been long in that posture when the boatswain, who was the principal ringleader of the mutiny, had now shown himself the most 
dejected and dispirited of all the rest, came walking towards them with two more of the crew. The captain was so eager at having this principal rogue so much in his power, that he could hardly have patience to let him come so near as to be sure of him, for they only heard his tongue before. But when they came nearer, the captain and Friday, starting up on their feet, let fly at them. The boatswain was killed upon the spot. The next man was shot in the body, and fell just by him, though he did not die till an hour or two after, and the third ran for it. At the noise of the fire I immediately advanced with my whole army, which was now eight men, with myself, General Lissimo, Friday, my lieutenant-general, the captain and his two men, and the three prisoners of war whom we had trusted with arms. We came upon them indeed in the dark, so that they could not see our number, and I made the man they had left in the boat, who was now one of us, to call them by name, to try if I could bring them to a parley, and so perhaps might reduce them to terms, which fell out just as we desired. For indeed it was easy to think, as their condition then was, they would be very willing to capitulate. So he calls out as loud as he could to one of them, "'Tom Smith! Tom Smith!' Tom Smith answered immediately, "'Is that Robinson?' For it seems he knew the voice. The other answered, "'Aye, aye, for God's sake, Tom Smith! Throw down your arms and yield, or you are all dead men this moment!' "'Who must we yield to? Where are they?' said Smith again. "'Here they are,' says he. "'Here's our captain and fifty men with him. Had been hunting you these two hours. The boatswain is killed, Will Fry is wounded, and I am a prisoner, and if you do not yield, you are all lost.' "'Will they give us quarter, then?' says Tom Smith. "'And we will yield.' "'I'll go and ask if you promise to yield,' says Robinson. So he asked the captain, and the captain himself then calls out, "'You, Smith, you know my voice. If you lay down your arms immediately and submit, you shall have your lives, all but Will Atkins.' Upon this Will Atkins cried out, "'For God's sake, Captain, give me quarter. What have I done? They have all been as bad as I.' Which, by the way, was not true, for it seems this Will Atkins was the first man that laid hold of the captain when they first mutinied, and used him barbarously in tying his hands and giving him injurious language. However, the captain told him he must lay down his arms at discretion, and trust to the governor's mercy, by which he meant me, for they all call me governor. In a word, they all laid down their arms and begged their lives, and I sent the man that had parlayed with them, and two more who bound them all, and then my great army of fifty men, which, with those three, were in all but eight, came up and seized upon them, and upon their boat, only that I kept myself and one more out of sight for reasons of state. Our next work was to repair the boat, and think of seizing the ship, and as for the captain, now he had leisure to parley with them, he expostulated with them upon the villainy of their practices with him, and upon the further wickedness of their design, and how certainly it must bring to them misery and distress in the end, and perhaps to the gallows. They all appeared very penitent, and begged hard for their lives. As for that, he told them that they were not his prisoners, but the commanders of the island, that they thought they had set him on shore in a barren, uninhabited island, but it had pleased God so to direct them that it was inhabited, and that the governor was an Englishman, that he might hang them all there, if he pleased, but as he had given them all quarter, he supposed he would send them to England, to be dealt with there as justice required, except Atkins, whom he was commanded by the governor to advise to prepare for death, for that he would be hanged in the morning. Though this was all but a fiction of his own, yet it had its desired effect. Atkins fell upon his knees to beg the captain to intercede with the governor for his life, and all the rest begged of him, for God's sake, that they might not be sent to England. It now occurred to me that the time of our deliverance was come, and that it would be a most easy thing to bring these fellows in to be hearty in getting possession of the ship. So I retired in the dark from them, that they might not see what kind of a governor they had, and called the captain to me. When I called at a good distance, one of the men was ordered to speak again, and say to the captain, "'Captain, the commander calls for you.' 
and presently the captain replied, "'Tell His Excellency I am just coming.' This more perfectly amazed them, and they all believed that the commander was just by, with his fifty men. Upon the captain coming to me, I told him my project for seizing the ship, which he liked wonderfully well, and resolved to put it in execution the next morning. But in order to execute it with more art, and to be secure of success, I told him we must divide the prisoners, and that he should go and take Atkins, and two more of the worst of them, and send them pinion to the cave where the others lay. This was committed to Friday and the two men who came on shore with the captain. They conveyed them to the cave as to a prison, and it was indeed a dismal place, especially to men in their condition. The others I ordered to my bower, as I called it, of which I have given a full description, and as it was fenced in, and they pinioned, the place was secure enough, considering they were upon their behaviour. To these in the morning I sent the captain, who was to enter into a parley with them, in a word, to try them, and tell me whether they thought they might be trusted or not, to go on board and surprise the ship. He talked to them of the injury done him, of the condition they were brought to, and that though the governor had given them quarter for their lives as to the present action, yet that if they were sent to England they would all be hanged in chains, but that if they would join in so just an attempt as to recover the ship, he would have the governor's engagement for their pardon. Any one may guess how readily such a proposal would be accepted by men in their condition. They fell down on their knees to the captain, and promised, with the deepest imprecations, that they would be faithful to him to the last drop, and that they should owe their lives to him, and would go with him all over the world, that they would own him as a father to them as long as they lived. Well, says the captain, I must go and tell the governor what you say, and see what I can do to bring him to consent to it. So he brought me an account of the temper he found them in, and that he verily believed they would be faithful. However, that we might be very secure, I told him he should go back again and choose out those five, and tell them that they might see he did not want men, that he would take out those five to be his assistants, and that the governor would keep the other two, and the three that were sent prisoners to the castle, my cave, as hostages for the fidelity of those five, and that if they proved unfaithful in the execution, the five hostages should be hanged in chains alive on the shore. This looked severe, and convinced them that the governor was in earnest. However, they had no way left but to accept it, and it was now the business of the prisoners, as much as of the captain, to persuade the other five to do their duty. Our strength was now thus ordered for the expedition. First, the captain, his mate and passenger. Second, the two prisoners of the first gang, to whom, having their character from the captain, I had given their liberty, and trusted them with arms. Third, the other two that I had kept till now in my bower, pinioned, but on the captain's motion had now released. Fourth, these five released at last, so that there were twelve in all, besides five we kept prisoners in the cave for hostages. I asked the captain if he was willing to venture with these hands on board the ship, but as for me and my man Friday, I did not think it was proper for us to stir, having seven men left behind, and it was employment enough for us to keep them asunder and supply them with victuals. As to the five in the cave, I resolved to keep them fast, but Friday went in twice a day to them, to supply them with necessaries, and I made the other two carry provisions to a certain distance, where Friday was to take them. When I showed myself to the two hostages, it was with the captain, who told them I was the person the governor had ordered to look after them, and that it was the governor's pleasure they should not stir anywhere but by my direction, that if they did, they would be fetched into the castle, and be laid in irons, so that as we never suffered them to see me as governor, I now appeared as another person, and spoke of the governor, the garrison, the castle, and the like, upon all occasions. The captain now had no difficulty before him, but to furnish his two boats, stop the breach of one, and man them. He made his passenger captain of one, with four of the men, and himself, his mate, and five more, went in the other and they contrived their business very well, for they came up to the ship about midnight. 
As soon as they came within call of the ship, he made Robinson hail them, and tell them they had brought off the men in the boat, but that it was a long time before they had found them, and the like, holding them in a chat till they came to the ship's side, when the captain and the mate entering first with their arms, immediately knocked down the second mate and carpenter with the butt-end of their muskets, being very faithfully seconded by their men. They secured all the rest that were upon the main and quarter-decks, and began to fasten the hatches, to keep them down that were below, when the other boat and their men, entering at the fore-chains, secured the forecastle of the ship, and the scuttle which went down into the cook-room, making three men they found there prisoners. When this was done, and all safe upon deck, the captain ordered the mate, with three men, to break into the roundhouse, where the new rebel captain lay, who, having taken the alarm, had got up, and with two men and a boy had got firearms in their hands, and when the mate, with a crow, split open the door, the new captain and his men fired boldly among them, and wounded the mate with a musket-ball, which broke his arm, and wounded two more of the men, but killed nobody. The mate, calling for help, rushed, however, into the roundhouse, wounded as he was, and with his pistol shot the new captain through the head, the bullet entering at his mouth, and came out again behind one of his ears, so that he never spoke a word more upon which the rest yielded, and the ship was taken effectually without any more lives lost. As soon as the ship was thus secured, the captain ordered seven guns to be fired, which was the signal agreed upon with me to give me notice of his success, which, you may be sure, I was very glad to hear, having sat watching upon the shore for it till near two o'clock in the morning. Having thus heard the signal plainly, I laid me down, and it having been a day of great fatigue to me, I slept very sound, till I was surprised with the noise of a gun, and presently starting up, I heard a man call me by the name of, "'Governor! Governor!' and presently I knew the captain's voice, when, climbing up to the top of the hill, there he stood, and pointing to the ship, he embraced me in his arms. "'My dear friend and deliverer,' says he, "'there's your ship!' for she is all yours, and so are we, and all that belong to her. I cast my eyes to the ship, and there she rode, within little more than half a mile of the shore, for they had weighed her anchor as soon as they were masters of her, and the weather being fair had brought her to an anchor just against the mouth of the little creek, and the tide being up, the captain had brought the pinnace in near the place where I had first landed my rafts, and so landed just at my door. I was at first ready to sink down with the surprise, for I saw my deliverance, indeed, visibly put into my hands, all things easy, and a large ship just ready to carry me away, whither I pleased to go. At first, for some time, I was not able to answer him one word, but as he had taken me in his arms I held fast by him, or I should have fallen to the ground. He perceived the surprise, and immediately pulled a bottle out of his pocket, and gave me a dram of cordial, which he had brought on purpose for me. After I had drunk it, I sat down upon the ground, and though it brought me to myself, yet it was a good while before I could speak a word to him. All this time the poor man was in as great an ecstasy as I, only not under any surprise as I was, and he said a thousand kind and tender things to me to compose and bring me to myself. But such was the flood of joy in my breast, that it put all my spirits into confusion. At last it broke out into tears, and in a little while after I recovered my speech. I then took my turn, and embraced him as my deliverer, and we rejoiced together. I told him I looked upon him as a man sent by heaven to deliver me and that the whole transaction seemed to be a chain of wonders, that such things as these were the testimonies we had of a secret hand of providence governing the world, and an evidence that the eye of an infinite power could search into the remotest corner of the world, and send help to the miserable whenever he pleased. I forgot not to lift up my heart in thankfulness to heaven, and what heart could forbear to bless him, who had not only in a miraculous manner provided for me in such a wilderness, and in such a desolate condition, but from whom every deliverance must always be acknowledged to proceed. When we had talked a while, 
the captain told me he had brought me some little refreshment, such as the ship afforded, and such as the wretches that had been so long his masters had not plundered him of. Upon this he called aloud to the boat, and bade his men bring the things ashore that were for the governor. And indeed, it was a present as if I had been one that was not to be carried away with them, but as if I had been to dwell upon the island still. First, he had brought me a case of bottles full of excellent cordial waters, six large bottles of Madeira wine, the bottles held two quarts each, two pounds of excellent good tobacco, twelve good pieces of the ship's beef, and six pieces of pork, with a bag of peas, and about a hundred weight of biscuit. He also brought me a box of sugar, a box of flour, a bag full of lemons, and two bottles of lime-juice, an abundance of other things. But besides these, and what was a thousand times more useful to me, he brought me six new clean shirts, six very good neckcloths, two pair of gloves, one pair of shoes, a hat, and one pair of stockings, with a very good suit of clothes of his own, which had not been worn but very little. In a word, he clothed me from head to foot. It was a very kind and agreeable present, as any one may imagine, to one in my circumstances, but never was anything in the world of that kind so unpleasant, awkward, and uneasy, as it was to me to wear such clothes at first. After these ceremonies were passed, and after all his good things were brought into my little apartment, we began to consult what was to be done with the prisoners we had, for it was worth considering whether we might venture to take them with us or no especially two of them, whom he knew to be incorrigible and refractory to the last degree. And the captain said he knew they were such rogues that there was no obliging them, and if he did carry them away, it must be in irons, as malefactors, to be delivered over to justice at the first English colony he could come to. And I found that the captain himself was very anxious about it. Upon this, I told him, if he desired it, I would undertake to bring the two men he spoke of, to make it their own request that he should leave them upon the island. "'I should be very glad of that,' says the captain, "'with all my heart.' "'Well,' says I, "'I will send for them up and talk with them for you.' So I caused Friday and the two hostages, for they were now discharged, their comrades having performed their promise, I say I caused them to go to the cave and bring up the five men, pinioned as they were, to the bower, and keep them there till I came. After some time I came thither dressed in my new habit, and now I was called governor again. Being all met, and the captain with me, I caused the men to be brought before me, and I told them I had got a full account of their villainous behaviour to the captain, and how they had run away with the ship, and were preparing to commit further robberies, but that Providence had ensnared them in their own ways, and that they were fallen into the pit which they had dug for others. I let them know that by my direction the ship had been seized, that she lay now in the road, and they might see by and by that their new captain had received the reward of his villainy, and that they would see him hanging at the yard-arm, that, as to them, I wanted to know what they had to say why I should not execute them as pirates taken in the fact, as by my commission they could not doubt but I had authority so to do. One of them answered in the name of the rest that they had nothing to say but this, that when they were taken the captain promised them their lives, and they humbly implored my mercy. But I told them I knew not what mercy to show them, for as for myself I had resolved to quit the island with all my men, and had taken passage with the captain to go to England, and as for the captain, he could not carry them to England other than his prisoners in irons, to be tried for mutiny and running away with the ship the consequence of which, they must needs know, would be the gallows. So that I could not tell what was best for them, unless they had a mind to take their fate in the island. If they desired that, as I had liberty to leave the island, I had some inclination to give them their lives, if they thought they could shift on shore. They seemed very thankful for it, and said they would much rather venture to stay there than to be carried to England to be hanged. So I left it on that issue." However, the captain seemed to make some difficulty of it, as if he durst not leave them there. Upon this I seemed a little angry with the captain, 
and told him that they were my prisoners, not his, and that seeing I had offered them so much favour, I would be as good as my word, and that if he did not think fit to consent to it, I would set them at liberty, as I found them, and if he did not like it he might take them again, if he could catch them. Upon this they appeared very thankful, and I accordingly set them at liberty, and bade them retire into the woods, to the place whence they came, and I would leave them some firearms, some ammunition, and some directions how they should live very well, if they thought fit. Upon this I prepared to go on board the ship, but told the captain I would stay that night to prepare my things, and desired him to go on board in the meantime, and keep all right in the ship, and send the boat on shore next day for me, ordering him at all events to cause the new captain, who was killed, to be hanged at the yard-arm, that these men might see him. When the captain was gone I sent for the men up to me to my apartment, and entered seriously into discourse with them on their circumstances. I told them I thought they had made a right choice, that if the captain had carried them away they would certainly be hanged. I showed them the new captain hanging at the yard-arm of the ship, and told them they had nothing less to expect. When they had all declared their willingness to stay, I then told them I would let them into the story of my living there, and put them into the way of making it easy to them. Accordingly I gave them the whole history of the place, and my coming to it, showed them my fortifications, the way I made my bread, planted my corn, cured my grapes, and, in a word, all that was necessary to make them easy. I told them the story also of the seventeen Spaniards that were to be expected, for whom I left a letter, and made them promise to treat them in common with themselves. Here it may be noted that the captain, who had ink on board, was greatly surprised that I never hit upon a way of making ink of charcoal and water, or of something else, as I had done things much more difficult. I left them my firearms, that is, five muskets, three fowling pieces, and three swords. I had above a barrel and a half of powder left, for after the first year or two I used but little, and wasted none. I gave them a description of the way I managed the goats, and directions to milk and fatten them, and to make both butter and cheese. In a word, I gave them every part of my own story, and told them I should prevail with the captain to leave them two barrels of gunpowder more, and some garden seeds, which I told them I would have been very glad of. Also, I gave them the bag of peas which the captain had brought me to eat, and bade them be sure to sow and increase them. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of Robinson Crusoe This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe Chapter 19 Return to England Having done all this, I left them the next day, and went on board the ship. We prepared immediately to sail, but did not weigh that night. The next morning early, two of the five men came swimming to the ship's side, and making the most lamentable complaint of the other three, begged to be taken into the ship for God's sake, for they should be murdered, and begged the captain to take them on board, though he hanged them immediately. Upon this the captain pretended to have no power without me, but after some difficulty, and after their solemn promises of amendment, they were taken on board, and were, some time after, soundly whipped and pickled, after which they proved very honest and quiet fellows. Some time after this the boat was ordered on shore, the tide being up, with the things promised to the men, to which the captain, at my intercession, caused their chests and clothes to be added, which they took and were very thankful for. I also encouraged them by telling them that if it lay in my power to send any vessel to take them in, I would not forget them. When I took leave of this island I carried on board, for relics, the great goatskin cap I had made, my umbrella, and one of my parrots. Also I forgot not to take the money I formerly mentioned, which had lain by me so long useless that it was grown rusty or tarnished, and could hardly pass for silver till it had been a little rubbed and handled, as also the money I found in the wreck of the Spanish ship. 
and thus I left the island, the 19th of December, as I found by the ship's account, in the year 1686, after I had been upon it eight and twenty years, two months, and nineteen days, being delivered from this second captivity the same day of the month that I first made my escape in the longboat from among the moors of Sally. In this vessel, after a long voyage, I arrived in England the 11th of June, in the year 1687, having been thirty-five years absent. When I came to England I was as perfect a stranger to all the world as if I had never been known there. My benefactor and faithful steward, whom I had left my money in trust with, was alive, but had had great misfortunes in the world, was become a widow the second time, and very low in the world. I made her very easy as to what she owed me, assuring her I would give her no trouble. But, on the contrary, in gratitude for her former care and faithfulness to me, I relieved her as my little stock would afford, which at that time would, indeed, allow me to do but little for her, but I assured her I would never forget her former kindness to me, nor did I forget her when I had sufficient to help her, as shall be observed in its proper place. I went down afterwards into Yorkshire, but my father was dead, and my mother and all the family extinct, except that I found two sisters, and two of the children of one of my brothers and as I had been long ago given over for dead, there had been no provision made for me, so that, in a word, I found nothing to relieve or assist me, and that the little money I had would not do much for me as to settling in the world. I met with one piece of gratitude indeed, which I did not expect, and this was, that the master of the ship, whom I had so happily delivered, and by the same means saved the ship and cargo, Having given a very handsome account to the owners of the manner how I had saved the lives of the men and the ship, they invited me to meet them and some other merchants concerned, and altogether made me a very handsome compliment upon the subject, and a present of almost two hundred pounds sterling. But after making several reflections upon the circumstances of my life, and how little way this would go towards settling me in the world, I resolved to go to Lisbon and see if I might not come at some information of the state of my plantation in the Brazils, and of what was become of my partner, who, I had reason to suppose, had some years past given me over for dead. With this view I took shipping for Lisbon, where I arrived in April following, my man Friday accompanying me very honestly in all these ramblings, and proving a most faithful servant upon all occasions. When I came to Lisbon I found out, by inquiry, and to my particular satisfaction, my old friend, the captain of the ship who first took me up at sea off the shore of Africa. He was now grown old, and had left off going to sea, having put his son, who was far from a young man, into his ship, and who still used the Brazil trade. The old man did not know me, and indeed <laughs> I hardly knew him, but I soon brought him to my remembrance, and as soon brought myself to his remembrance, when I told him who I was. After some passionate expressions of the old acquaintance between us, I inquired, you may be sure, after my plantation and my partner. The old man told me he had not been in the Brazils for about nine years, but that he could assure me that when he came away my partner was living, but the trustees whom I had joined with him to take cognizance of my part were both dead. That, however, he believed I would have a very good account of the improvement of the plantation, for that, upon the general belief of my being cast away and drowned, my trustees had given in the account of the produce of my part of the plantation to the procurator fiscal, who had appropriated it, in case I never came to claim it, one-third to the king and two-thirds to the monastery of St. Augustine, to be expended for the benefit of the poor, and for the conversion of the Indians to the Catholic faith but that if I appeared, or any one for me, to claim the inheritance, it would be restored, only that the improvement or annual production, being distributed to charitable uses, could not be restored. But he assured me that the steward of the king's revenue from lands, and the providore, or steward of the monastery, had taken great care all along that the incumbent, that is to say, my partner, gave every year a faithful account of the produce, of which they had duly received my moiety. I asked him if he knew to what height of improvement he had brought the plantation, and whether he thought it might be worth looking after. 
or whether, on my going thither, I should meet with any obstruction to my possessing my just right in the moiety. He told me he could not tell exactly to what degree the plantation was improved, but this he knew, that my partner was grown exceeding rich upon the enjoying of his part of it, and that, to the best of his remembrance, he had heard that the king's third of my part, which was, it seems, granted away to some other monastery or religious house, amounted to above two hundred moidores a year, that as to my being restored to a quiet possession of it, there was no question to be made of that, my partner being alive to witness my title, and my name being also enrolled in the register of the country. Also he told me that the survivors of my two trustees were very fair, honest people, and very wealthy, and he believed I would not only have their assistance for putting me in possession, but would find a very considerable sum of money in their hands for my account, being the produce of the farm, while their fathers held the trust, and before it was given up as above, which, as he remembered, was for about twelve years. I showed myself a little concerned and uneasy at this account, and inquired of the old captain how it came to pass that the trustees should thus dispose of my effects, when he knew that I had made my will, and had made him, the Portuguese captain, my universal heir, etc. He told me that was true, but that as there was no proof of my being dead, he could not act as executor until some certain account should come of my death and besides, he was not willing to intermeddle with a thing so remote. That it was true he had registered my will, and put in his claim, and could he have given any account of my being dead or alive, he would have acted by procuration, and taken possession of the ingenio, so they call the sugar-house, and have given his son, who was now at the Brazils, orders to do it. But, says the old man, I have one piece of news to tell you, which perhaps may not be so acceptable to you as the rest, and that is, believing you were lost, and all the world believing so also, your partner and trustees did offer to account with me, in your name, for the first six or eight years' profits, which I received. There being at that time great disbursements for increasing the works, building an ingenio, and buying slaves, it did not amount to near so much as afterwards it produced. However, says the old man, I shall give you a true account of what I have received in all, and how I have disposed of it. After a few days' further conference with this ancient friend, he brought me an account of the first six years' income of my plantation, signed by my partner and the merchant trustees, being always delivered in goods, that is, tobacco in roll, and sugar in chests, besides rum, molasses, etc., which is the consequence of a sugar work, and I found by this account that every year the income considerably increased, but, as above, the disbursements being large, the sum at first was small. However, the old man let me see that he was debtor to me four hundred and seventy moidores of gold, besides sixty chests of sugar and fifteen double rolls of tobacco, which were lost in his ship, he having been shipwrecked coming home to Lisbon about eleven years after my having the place. The good man then began to complain about his misfortunes, and how he had been obliged to make use of my money to recover his losses, and buy him a share in a new ship. However, my old friend, says he, you shall not want a supply in your necessity, and as soon as my son returns, you shall be fully satisfied. Upon this he pulls out an old pouch, and gives me one hundred and sixty Portugal moidores in gold, and giving the writings of his title to the ship, which his son was gone to the Brazils in, of which he was quarter part owner, and his son another, he puts them both into my hands for security of the rest. I was too much moved with the honesty and kindness of the poor man to be able to bear this, and remembering what he had done for me, how he had taken me up at sea, and how generously he had used me on all occasions, and particularly how sincere a friend he was now to me, I could hardly refrain weeping at what he had said to me. Therefore I asked him if his circumstances admitted him to spare so much money at that time, and if it would not straighten him. He told me he could not say, but it might straighten him a little. 
But, however, it was my money, and I might want it more than he. Everything the good man said was full of affection, and I could hardly refrain from tears while he spoke. In short, I took one hundred of the moidores, and called for a pen and ink to give him a receipt for them. Then I returned him the rest, and told him if ever I had possession of the plantation, I would return the other to him also, as indeed I afterwards did, and that as to the bill of sale of his part in his son's ship, I would not take it by any means, but that if I wanted the money, I found he was honest enough to pay me, and if I did not, but came to receive what he gave me reason to expect, I would never have a penny more from him. When this was passed, the old man asked me if he should put me into a method to make my claim to my plantation. I told him I thought to go over to it myself. He said I might do so, if I pleased, but that if I did not, there were ways enough to secure my right, and immediately to appropriate the profits to my use. And as there were ships in the river of Lisbon just ready to go away to Brazil, he made me enter my name in a public register, with his affidavit, affirming upon oath that I was alive, and that I was the same person who took up the land for the planting the said plantation at first. This being regularly attested by a notary, and a procuration affixed, he directed me to send it, with a letter of his writing, to a merchant of his acquaintance at the place, and then proposed my staying with him till an account came of the return. Never was anything more honourable than the proceedings upon this procuration, for in less than seven months I received a large packet from the survivors of my trustees, the merchants, for whose account I went to see, in which were the following particular letters and papers enclosed. First, there was the account current of the produce of my farm or plantation, from the year when their fathers had balanced with my old Portugal captain, being for six years. The balance appeared to be one thousand one hundred and seventy-four moidores in my favour. Secondly, there was the account of four years more, while they kept the effects in their hands, before the government claimed the administration, as being the effects of a person not to be found, which they called civil death, and the balance of this, the value of the plantation increasing, amounted to nineteen thousand four hundred and forty-six cruzados, being about three thousand two hundred and forty moidores. Thirdly, there was the prior of St. Augustine's account, who had received the profits for above fourteen years, but not being able to account for what was disposed of by the hospital, very honestly declared he had eight hundred and seventy-two moidores not distributed, which he acknowledged to my account. As to the king's part, that refunded nothing. There was a letter of my partner's, congratulating me very affectionately upon my being alive, giving me an account how the estate was improved, and what it produced a year, with the particulars of the number of squares, or acres, that it contained, how planted, how many slaves there were upon it, and making two and twenty crosses for blessings, told me he had said so many Ave Marias to thank the Blessed Virgin that I was alive, inviting me very passionately to come over and take possession of my own and in the meantime to give him orders to whom he should deliver my effects if I did not come myself, concluding with a hearty tender of his friendship and that of his family, and sent me as a present seven fine leopard-skins, which he had, it seems, received from Africa, by some other ship than he had sent thither, and which, it seems, had made a better voyage than I. He sent me also five chests of excellent sweetmeats, and a hundred pieces of gold uncoined, not quite so large as Moidores. By the same fleet my two merchant trustees shipped me one thousand two hundred chests of sugar, eight hundred rolls of tobacco, and the rest of the whole account in gold. I might well say now, indeed, that the latter end of Job was better than the beginning. It is impossible to express the flutterings of my very heart when I found all my wealth about me, for as the Brazil ships come all in fleets, the same ships which brought my letters brought my goods, and the effects were safe in the river before the letters came to my hand. In a word, I turned pale and grew sick, and, had not the old man run and fetched me a cordial, I believe the sudden surprise of joy had overset nature, and I had died upon the spot. Nay, after that, I continued very ill, 
and was so some hours, till a physician being sent for, and something of the real cause of my illness being known, he ordered me to be let blood, after which I had relief, and grew well. But I verily believe, if I had not been eased by event given in that manner to the spirits, I should have died. I was now master, all on a sudden, of about five thousand pounds sterling in money, and had an estate, as I might well call it, in the Brazils, of above a thousand pounds a year, as sure as an estate of lands in England, and, in a word, I was in a condition which I scarce knew how to understand, or how to compose myself for the enjoyment of it. The first thing I did was to recompense my original benefactor, my good old captain, who had been first charitable to me in my distress, kind to me in my beginning, and honest to me at the end. I showed him all that was sent to me. I told him that, next to the providence of heaven which disposed all things, it was owing to him, and that it now lay on me to reward him, which I would do a hundredfold. So I first returned to him the hundred moidores I had received of him, then I sent for a notary, and caused him to draw up a general release or discharge from the four hundred and seventy moidores, which he had acknowledged he owed me, in the fullest and firmest manner possible after which I caused a procuration to be drawn, empowering him to be the receiver of the annual profits of my plantation, and appointing my partner to account with him, and make the returns, by the usual fleets, to him in my name, and by a clause in the end made a grant of one hundred moidores a year to him during his life, out of the effects, and fifty moidores a year to his son after him, for his life, and thus I requited my old man. I had now to consider which way to steer my course next, and what to do with the estate that Providence had thus put into my hands. And indeed, I had more care upon my head now than I had in my state of life in the island, where I wanted nothing but what I had, and had nothing but what I wanted. Whereas I had now a great charge upon me, and my business was how to secure it. I had not a cave now to hide my money in or a place where it might lie without lock or key, till it grew mouldy and tarnished before anybody would meddle with it. On the contrary, I knew not where to put it, or whom to trust with it. My old patron, the captain, indeed, was honest, and that was the only refuge I had. In the next place, my interest in the Brazils seemed to summon me thither, but now I could not tell how to think of going thither till I had settled my affairs, and left my effects in some safe hands behind me. At first I thought of my old friend the widow, who I knew was honest, and would be just to me, but then she was in years, and but poor, and for aught I knew might be in debt, so that, in a word, I had no way but to go back to England myself and take my effects with me. It was some months, however, before I resolved upon this, and therefore, as I had rewarded the old captain fully, and to his satisfaction, who had been my former benefactor, so I began to think of the poor widow, whose husband had been my first benefactor, and she, while it was in her power, my faithful steward and instructor. So the first thing I did I got a merchant in Lisbon to write to his correspondent in London, not only to pay a bill, but to go find her out and carry her, in money, a hundred pounds from me, and to talk with her and comfort her in her poverty, by telling her she should, if I lived, have a further supply. At the same time I sent my two sisters in the country a hundred pounds each, they being, though not in want, yet not in very good circumstances, one having been married and left a widow, and the other having a husband not so kind to her as he should be. But among all my relations or acquaintances I could not yet pitch upon one to whom I durst commit the gross of my stock, that I might go away to the Brazils, and leave things safe behind me, and this greatly perplexed me. I had once a mind to have gone to the Brazils and have settled myself there, for I was, as it were, naturalized to the place, but I had some little scruple in my mind about religion, which insensibly drew me back. However, it was not religion that kept me from going there for the present, and as I had made no scruple of being openly of the religion of the country all the while I was among them, so neither did I yet, only that, now and then, having of late thought more of it than formerly, 
when I began to think of living and dying among them, I began to regret having professed myself a papist, and thought it might not be the best religion to die with. But, as I have said, this was not the main thing that kept me from going to the Brazils, but that really I did not know with whom to leave my effects behind me. So I resolved at last to go to England, where, if I arrived, I concluded that I should make some acquaintance, or find some relations that would be faithful to me, and accordingly I prepared to go to England with all my wealth. In order to prepare things for my going home, I first, the Brazil fleet being just going away, resolved to give answers suitable to the just and faithful account of things I had from thence, and, first, to the prior of St. Augustine, I wrote a letter full of thanks for his just dealings, and the offer of the eight hundred and seventy-two moidores which were undisposed of, which I desired might be given, five hundred to the monastery, and three hundred and seventy-two to the poor, as the prior should direct, desiring the good Padre's prayers for me, and the like. I wrote next a letter of thanks to my two trustees, with all the acknowledgment that so much justice and honesty called for. As for sending them any present, they were far above having any occasion of it. Lastly, I wrote to my partner, acknowledging his industry in the improving of the plantation, and his integrity in increasing the stock of the works, giving him instructions for his future government of my part, according to the powers I had left with my old patron, to whom I desired him to send whatever became due to me, till he should hear from me more particularly, assuring him that it was my intention not only to come to him, but to settle myself there for the remainder of my life. To this I added a very handsome present of some Italian silks for his wife and two daughters, for such the captain's son informed me he had, with two pieces of fine English broadcloth, the best I could get in Lisbon, five pieces of black bays, and some Flanders lace of a good value. Having thus settled my affairs, sold my cargo, and turned all my effects into good bills of exchange, my next difficulty was which way to go to England. I had been accustomed enough to the sea, and yet I had a strange aversion to go to England by the sea at that time, and yet I could give no reason for it. Yet the difficulty increased upon me so much, that though I had once shipped my baggage in order to go, yet I altered my mind, and that not once, but two or three times. It is true I had been very unfortunate by sea, and this might be one of the reasons. But let no man slight the strong impulses of his own thoughts in cases of such moment. Two of the ships which I had singled out to go in, I mean more particularly singled out than any other, having put my things on board one of them, and in the other having agreed with the captain, I say two of these ships miscarried. One was taken by the Algerines, and the other was lost on the start, near Torbay, and all the people drowned except three so that in either of those vessels I had been made miserable. Having been thus harassed in my thoughts, my old pilot, to whom I communicated everything, pressed me earnestly not to go by sea, but either to go by land to the Groin, and cross over the Bay of Biscay to Rochelle, from whence it was but an easy and safe journey by land to Paris, and so to Calais and Dover, or to go up to Madrid, and so all the way by land through France. In a word, I was so prepossessed against my going by sea at all, except from Calais to Dover, that I resolved to travel all the way by land, which, as I was not in haste, and did not value the charge, was by much the pleasanter way. And to make it more so, my old captain brought an English gentleman, the son of a merchant in Lisbon, who was willing to travel with me, after which we picked up two more English merchants also and two young Portuguese gentlemen, the last going to Paris only, so then in all there were six of us and five servants, the two merchants and the two Portuguese contenting themselves with one servant between two, to save the charge. And as for me, I got an English sailor to travel with me as a servant, besides my man Friday, who was too much a stranger to be capable of supplying the place of a servant on the road. In this manner I set out from Lisbon, and our company being very well mounted and armed, we made a little troop, whereof they did me the honour to call me Captain, as well because I was the oldest man as because I had two servants, and indeed was the origin of the whole journey. 
As I have troubled you with none of my sea journals, so I shall trouble you now with none of my land journals. But some adventures that happened to us in this tedious and difficult journey I must not omit. When we came to Madrid, we, being all of us strangers to Spain, were willing to stay some time to see the court of Spain, and what was worth observing. But it being the latter part of the summer, we hastened away, and set out from Madrid about the middle of October, but when we came to the edge of Navarre, we were alarmed, at several towns on the way, with an account that so much snow was falling on the French side of the mountains, that several travellers were obliged to come back to Pampelona, after having attempted at an extreme hazard to pass on. When we came to Pampeluna itself, we found it so indeed, and to me, that had been always used to a hot climate, and to countries where I could scarce bear any clothes on, the cold was insufferable. Nor, indeed, was it more painful than surprising to come but ten days before out of old Castile, where the weather was not only warm but very hot, and immediately to feel a wind from the Pyrenean mountains so very keen, so severely cold, as to be intolerable and to endanger benumbing and perishing of our fingers and toes. Poor Friday was really frightened when he saw the mountains all covered with snow, and felt cold weather, which he had never seen or felt before in his life. To mend the matter, when we came to Pampeluna it continued snowing with so much violence and so long, that the people said winter was come before its time, and the roads which were difficult before were now quite impassable. For, in a word, the snow lay in some places too thick for us to travel, and being not hard frozen, as is the case in the northern countries, there was no going without being in danger of being buried alive every step. We stayed no less than twenty days at Pampeluna, when, seeing the winter coming on, and no likelihood of its being better, for it was the severest winter all over Europe that had been known in the memory of man, I proposed that we should go away to Fontarabia, and there take shipping for Bordeaux, which was a very little voyage. But, while I was considering this, there came in four French gentlemen, who, having been stopped on the French side of the passes, as we were on the Spanish, had found out a guide, who, traversing the country near the head of Languedoc, had brought them over the mountains by such ways that they were not much incommoded with the snow. For where they met with snow in any quantity, they said it was frozen hard enough to bear them and their horses. We sent for this guide, who told us he would undertake to carry us the same way, with no hazard from the snow, provided we were armed sufficiently to protect ourselves from wild beasts. For, he said, in these great snows it was frequent for some wolves to show themselves at the foot of the mountains, being made ravenous for want of food, the ground being covered with snow. We told him we were well enough prepared for such creatures as they were, if he would ensure us from a kind of two-legged wolves, which we were told we were in most danger from, especially on the French side of the mountains. He satisfied us that there was no danger of that kind in the way that we were to go, so we readily agreed to follow him, as did also twelve other gentlemen with their servants, some French, some Spanish, who, as I said, had attempted to go, and were obliged to come back again. Accordingly, we set out from Pampeluna with our guide on the 15th of November, and indeed I was surprised when, instead of going forward, he came directly back with us on the same road that we came from Madrid, about twenty miles, when, having passed two rivers, and come into the plain country, we found ourselves in a warm climate again, where the country was pleasant, and no snow to be seen. But on a sudden, turning to his left, he approached the mountains another way, and though it is true the hills and precipices looked dreadful, yet he made so many tours, such meanders, and led us by such winding ways, that we insensibly passed the height of the mountains without being much encumbered with the snow. And all on a sudden he showed us the pleasant and fruitful provinces of Languedoc and Gascony, all green and flourishing, though at a great distance, and we had some rough way to pass still. We were a little uneasy, however, when we found it snowed one whole day and a night so fast that we could not travel. But he bid us be easy, we should soon be past it all. We found, indeed, that we began to descend every day, and to come more north than before, and so, depending upon our guide, we went on. 
It was about two hours before night when, our guide being something before us, and not just in sight, out rushed three monstrous wolves, and after them a bear, from a hollow way adjoining to a thick wood. Two of the wolves made at the guide, and had he been far before us he would have been devoured before we could have helped him. One of them fastened upon his horse, and the other attacked the man with such violence that he had not time or presence of mind enough to draw his pistol, but hallooed and cried out to us most lustily. My man Friday being next me, I bade him ride up and see what was the matter. As soon as Friday came in sight of the man, he hallooed out as loud as the other, "'Oh, master! Oh, master!' but like a bold fellow, rode directly up to the poor man, and with his pistol shot the wolf in the head that attacked him. It was happy for the poor man that it was my man Friday, for having been used to such creatures in his country, he had no fear upon him, but went close up to him and shot him, whereas any other of us would have fired at a farther distance, and have perhaps either missed the wolf or endangered shooting the man but it was enough to have terrified a bolder man than I, and indeed it alarmed all our company when, with the noise of Friday's pistol, we heard on both sides the most dismal howling of wolves, and the noise, redoubled by the echo of the mountains, appeared to us as if there had been a prodigious number of them. And perhaps there was not such a few as that we had no cause of apprehension. However, as Friday had killed this wolf, the other that had fastened upon the horse, left him immediately, and fled, without doing him any damage, having happily fastened upon his head, where the bosses of the bridle had stuck in his teeth. But the man was most hurt, for the raging creature had bit him twice, once in the arm, and the other time a little above his knee, and though he had made some defence, he was just tumbling down by the disorder of his horse, when Friday came up and shot the wolf. It is easy to suppose that at the noise of Friday's pistol we all mended our pace and rode up as fast as the way, which was very difficult, would give us leave to see what was the matter. As soon as we came clear of the trees, which blinded us before, we saw clearly what had been the case, and how Friday had disengaged the poor guide, though we did not presently discern what kind of creature it was he had killed. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20, the final chapter of Robinson Crusoe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. Chapter 20, Fight Between Friday and a Bear. But never was a fight managed so heartily and in such a surprising manner as that which followed between Friday and the bear, which gave us all, though at first we were surprised and afraid for him, the greatest diversion imaginable. As the bear is a heavy, clumsy creature, and does not gallop as the wolf does, who is swift and light, so he has two particular qualities, which generally are the rule of his actions. First, as to men, who are not his proper prey, he does not usually attempt them, except they first attack him, unless he be excessively hungry, which it is probable might now be the case, the ground being covered with snow. If you do not meddle with him, he will not meddle with you. But then you must take care to be very civil to him, and give him the road, for he is a very nice gentleman. He will not go a step out of his way for a prince. Nay, if you are really afraid, your best way is to look another way and keep going on, for sometimes if you stop and stand still, and look steadfastly at him, he takes it for an affront. But if you throw or toss anything at him, though it were but a bit of stick as big as your finger, he thinks himself abused, and sets all other business aside to pursue his revenge, and will have satisfaction in point of honour. That is his first quality. The next is, if he be once affronted, he will never leave you, night or day, till he has his revenge, but follows at a good round rate till he overtakes you. My man Friday had delivered our guide, and when we came up to him he was helping him off his horse, for the man was both hurt and frightened, when on a sudden we espied the bear come out of the wood, and a monstrous one it was, the biggest by far that ever I saw. 
We were all a little surprised when we saw him, but when Friday saw him, it was easy to see joy and courage in the fellow's countenance. "'Oh, oh, oh!' says Friday, three times, pointing to him. "'Oh, master, you give me to leave, me shake it to hand with him, me make a you good laugh!' I was surprised to see the fellow so well pleased. "'You fool,' says I, "'he will eat you up!' "'Eat a me up, eat a me up!' says Friday, twice over again. "'Me eat a him up, me make a you good laugh. You all stay here, me show you good laugh!' So down he sits, and gets off his boots in a moment, and puts on a pair of pumps, as we call the flat shoes they wear, and which he had in his pocket, gives my other servant his horse, and with his gun away he flew, swift like the wind. The bear was walking softly on, and offered to meddle with nobody, till Friday coming pretty near, calls to him, as if the bear could understand him. "'Hark ye, hark ye,' says Friday, "'me speak ye with you!' We followed at a distance, for now, being down on the Gascony side of the mountains, we were entered a vast forest, where the country was plain and pretty open, though it had many trees in it scattered here and there. Friday, who had, as we say, the heels of the bear, came up with him quickly, and took up a great stone and threw it at him, and hit him just on the head, but did him no more harm than if he had thrown it against a wall. But it answered Friday's end, for the rogue was so void of fear that he did it purely to make the bear follow him, and show us some laugh, as he called it. As soon as the bear felt the blow, and saw him, he turns about and comes after him, taking very long strides, and shuffling on at a strange rate, so as would have put a horse to a middling gallop. Away reigns Friday, and takes his course as if he ran towards us for help so we all resolved to fire at once upon the bear and deliver my man, though I was angry at him for bringing the bear back upon us when he was going about his own business another way, and especially I was angry that he had turned the bear upon us and then ran away, and I called out, "'You dog, is this your making us laugh? Come away and take your horse, that we may shoot the creature.' He heard me and cried out, "'No shoot, no shoot! Stand still, and you get much laugh!' and as the nimble creature ran two feet for the bear's one, he turned on a sudden on one side of us, and seeing a great oak tree fit for his purpose, he beckoned to us to follow, and doubling his pace, he got nimbly up the tree, laying his gun down upon the ground at about five or six yards from the bottom of the tree. The bear soon came to the tree, and we followed at a distance. The first thing he did, he stopped at the gun, smelt at it, but let it lie, and up he scrambles into the tree, climbing like a cat, though so monstrous heavy. I was amazed at the folly, as I thought it, of my man, and could not for my life see anything to laugh at, till seeing the bear get up the tree, we all rode near to him. When we came to the tree, there was Friday got out to the small end of a large branch, and the bear got about halfway to him. As soon as the bear got out to that part where the limb of the tree was weaker, ha! says he to us. Now you see me teach you the bear dance. So he began jumping and shaking the bough, at which the bear began to totter, but stood still, and began to look behind him to see how he should get back. Then, indeed, we did laugh heartily. But Friday had not done with him by a great deal. When seeing him stand still, he called out to him again, as if he had supposed the bear could speak English. What? You come no farther? Pray you come farther. So he left jumping and shaking the tree, and the bear, just as if he understood what he said, did come a little farther. Then he began jumping again, and the bear stopped again. We thought now was a good time to knock him in the head, and called to Friday to stand still and we should shoot the bear. But he cried out earnestly, "'Oh, pray, oh, pray, no shoot! Me shoot by and then!' He would have said by and by. However, to shorten the story— Friday danced so much, and the bear stood so ticklish, that we had laughing enough, but still could not imagine what the fellow would do. For first we thought he depended upon shaking the bear off, and we found the bear was too cunning for that too. For he would not go out far enough to be thrown down, but clung fast with his great broad claws and feet, so that we could not imagine what would be the end of it, and what the jest would be at last. But Friday put us out of doubt quickly for seeing the bear cling fast to the bough, and that he would not be persuaded to come any farther, 
"'Well, well,' says Friday. "'You come no farther, me go. "'You no come to me, me come to you.' "'And upon this he went out to the smaller end, "'where it would bend with his weight, "'and gently let himself down by it, "'sliding down the bow till he came near enough "'to jump down on his feet. "'And away he ran to his gun, took it up, and stood still. "'Well,' said I to him, "'Friday, what will you do now? "'Why don't you shoot him?' "'No shoot,' says Friday. "'No yet. Me shoot now, me no kill. Me stay, give you one more laugh.' And indeed so he did, for when the bear saw his enemy gone, he came back from the bow, where he stood, but did it very cautiously, looking behind him every step, and coming backward till he got into the body of the tree. Then, with the same hinder end foremost, he came down the tree, grasping it with his claws, and moving one foot at a time, very leisurely. At this juncture, and just before he could set his hind foot on the ground, Friday stepped up close to him, clapped the muzzle of his piece into his ear, and shot him dead. Then the rogue turned about to see if we did not laugh, and when he saw we were pleased by our looks, he began to laugh very loud. "'So we kill bear in my country,' says Friday. "'So you kill them?' says I. Why, you have no guns. No, says he, no gun, but shoot great much long arrow. This was a good diversion to us, but we were still in a wild place, and our guide very much hurt, and what to do we hardly knew. The howling of wolves ran much in my head, and indeed, except the noise I once heard on the shore of Africa, of which I have said something already, I never heard anything that filled me with so much horror. These things, and the approach of night, called us off, or else, as Friday would have had us, we should certainly have taken the skin of this monstrous creature off, which was worth saving. But we had near three leagues to go, and our guide hastened us, so we left him, and went forward on our journey. The ground was still covered with snow, though not so deep and dangerous as on the mountains, and the ravenous creatures, as we heard afterwards, were come down into the forest in plain country pressed by hunger to seek for food, and had done a great deal of mischief in the villages where they surprised the country people, killed a great many of their sheep and horses, and some people too. We had one dangerous place to pass, and our guide told us if there were more wolves in the country we should find them there, and this was a small plain surrounded with woods on every side, and a long narrow defile or lane which we were to pass to get through the wood, and then we should come to the village where we were to lodge. It was within half an hour of sunset when we entered the wood, and a little after sunset when we came into the plain. We met with nothing in the first wood, except that in a little plain within the wood, which was not above two furlongs over, we saw five great wolves cross the road full speed, one after another, as if they had been in chase of some prey, and had it in view. They took no notice of us, and were gone out of sight in a few moments. Upon this our guide, who, by the way, was but a faint-hearted fellow, bid us keep in a ready posture, for he believed there were more wolves a-coming. We kept our arms ready, and our eyes about us, but we saw no more wolves till we came through that wood, which was near half a league, and entered the plain. As soon as we came into the plain we had occasion enough to look about us first object we met with was a dead horse, that is to say, a poor horse which the wolves had killed, and at least a dozen of them at work, we could not say eating him, but picking his bones rather, for they had eaten up all the flesh before. We did not think fit to disturb them at their feast, neither did they take much notice of us. Friday would have let fly at them, but I would not suffer him by any means, for I found we were like to have more business upon our hands than we were aware of. We had not gone half over the plain when we began to hear the wolves howl in the wood on our left in a frightful manner, and presently after we saw about a hundred coming on directly towards us, all in a body, and most of them in a line, as regularly as an army drawn up by experienced officers. I scarce knew in what manner to receive them, but found to draw ourselves in a close line was the only way, so we formed in a moment, but that we might not have too much interval, I ordered that only every other man should fire, and that the others, who had not fired, should stand ready to give them a second volley immediately, 
if they continued to advance upon us, and then that those that had fired at first should not pretend to load their fusees again, but stand ready, every one with a pistol, for we were all armed with a fusee and a pair of pistols each man. So we were, by this method, able to fire six volleys, half of us at a time. However, at present we had no necessity, for upon firing the first volley, the enemy made a full stop, being terrified as well with the noise as with the fire. Four of them being shot in the head, dropped, several others were wounded, and went bleeding off, as we could see by the snow. I found they stopped, but did not immediately retreat. Whereupon, remembering that I had been told that the fiercest creatures were terrified at the voice of a man, I caused all the company to halloo as loud as they could, and I found the notion not altogether mistaken, for upon our shout they began to retire and turn about. I then ordered a second volley to be fired in their rear, which put them to the gallop, and away they went to the woods. This gave us leisure to charge our pieces again, and that we might lose no time, we kept going, but we had but little more than loaded our fusees, and put ourselves in readiness, when we heard a terrible noise in the same wood on our left, only that it was farther onward, the same way we were to go. The night was coming on, and the light began to be dusky, which made it worse on our side, but the noise increasing, we could easily perceive that it was the howling and yelling of those hellish creatures, and on a sudden we perceived three troops of wolves, one on our left, one behind us, and one in our front, so that we seemed to be surrounded with them. However, as they did not fall upon us, we kept our way forward as fast as we could make our horses go, which, the way being very rough, was only a good hard trot. In this manner we came in view of the entrance of a wood, through which we were to pass, at the farther side of the plain. But we were greatly surprised, when coming nearer the lane or pass, we saw a confused number of wolves standing just at the entrance. On a sudden, at another opening of the wood, we heard the noise of a gun, and looking that way, out rushed a horse, with a saddle and a bridle on him, flying like the wind, and sixteen or seventeen wolves after him, full speed. The horse had the advantage of them, but as we supposed that he could not hold it at that rate, we doubted not but they would get up with him at last. No question, but they did. But here we had a most horrible sight, for riding up to the entrance where the horse came out, we found the carcasses of another horse and of two men, devoured by the ravenous creatures. And one of the men was no doubt the same whom we had heard fire the gun, for there lay a gun just by him, fired off. But as to the man, his head and the upper part of his body was eaten up. This filled us with horror, and we knew not what course to take. But the creatures resolved us soon, for they gathered about us presently, in hopes of prey. And I verily believe there were three hundred of them. It happened, very much to our advantage, that at the entrance into the wood, but a little way from it, there lay some large timber trees, which had been cut down the summer before and I suppose lay there for carriage. I drew my little troop in among those trees, and placing ourselves in a line behind one long tree, I advised them all to alight, and keeping that tree before us for a breastwork, to stand in a triangle, or three fronts, enclosing our horses in the centre. We did so, and it was well we did, for never was a more furious charge than the creatures made upon us in this place. They came on with a growling kind of noise, and mounted the piece of timber, which, as I said, was our breastwork, as if they were only rushing upon their prey. And this fury of theirs, it seemed, was principally occasioned by their seeing our horses behind us. I ordered our men to fire as before, every other man, and they took their aim so sure that they killed several of the wolves at the first volley. But there was a necessity to keep a continual firing, for they came on like devils, those behind pushing on those before. When we had fired a second volley of our fusees, we thought they stopped a little, and I hoped they would have gone off, but it was but a moment, for others came forward again. So we fired two volleys of our pistols, and I believe in these four firings we had killed seventeen or eighteen of them, and lamed twice as many. Yet they came on again. I was loath to spend our shot too hastily, so I called my servant, not my man Friday, for he was better employed, for with the greatest dexterity imaginable, 
he had charged my fusee and his own while we were engaged. But, as I said, I called my other man, and giving him a horn of powder, I had him lay a train all along the piece of timber, and let it be a large train. He did so, and had but just time to get away, when the wolves came up to it, and some got upon it, when I, snapping an uncharged pistol close to the powder, set it on fire. Those that were upon the timber were scorched with it, and six or seven of them fell, or rather jumped in among us with the force and fright of the fire. We dispatched these in an instant, and the rest were so frightened with the light, which the night, for it was now very near dark, made more terrible that they drew back a little, upon which I ordered our last pistols to be fired off in one volley, and after that we gave a shout. Upon this the wolves turned tail, and we sallied immediately upon near twenty lame ones that we found struggling on the ground, and fell to cutting them with our swords, which answered our expectation, for the crying and howling they made was better understood by their fellows, so that they all fled and left us. We had, first and last, killed about three score of them, and had it been daylight, we had killed many more. The field of battle being thus cleared, we made forward again, for we still had near a league to go. We heard the ravenous creatures howl and yell in the woods as we went several times, and sometimes we fancied we saw some of them, but the snow dazzling our eyes, we were not certain. In about an hour more we came to the town where we were to lodge, which we found in a terrible fright and all in arms, for, it seems, the night before the wolves and some bears had broken into the village, and put them in such terror that they were obliged to keep guard night and day, but especially in the night, to preserve their cattle, and indeed their people. The next morning our guide was so ill, and his limbs swelled so much with the rankling of his two wounds, that he could go no farther. So we were obliged to take a new guide here, and go to Toulouse, where we found a warm climate, a fruitful, pleasant country, and no snow, no wolves, nor anything like them. But when we told our story at Toulouse, they told us it was nothing but what was ordinary in the great forest at the foot of the mountains, especially when the snow lay on the ground. But they inquired much what kind of guide we had got who would venture to bring us that way in such a severe season, and told us it was surprising we were not all devoured. When we told them how we placed ourselves and the horses in the middle, they blamed us exceedingly, and told us it was fifty to one, but we had been all destroyed, for it was the sight of the horses which made the wolves so furious, seeing their prey, and that at other times they were really afraid of a gun. But being excessively hungry, and raging on that account, the eagerness to come at the horses had made them senseless of danger, and that if we had not by the continual fire, and at last by the stratagem of the train of powder, mastered them, it had been great odds but that we had been torn to pieces. Whereas, had we been content to have sat still on horseback, and fired as horsemen, they would not have taken the horses so much for their own, when men were on their backs, as otherwise. And withal, they told us that at last, if we had stood all together, and left our horses, they would have been so eager to have devoured them, that we might have come off safe, especially having our firearms in our hands, being so many in number. For my part, I was never so sensible of danger in my life, for, seeing above three hundred devils come roaring and open mouth to devour us, and having nothing to shelter us or retreat to, I gave myself over for lost, and, as it was, I believe I shall never care to cross those mountains again. I think I would much rather go a thousand leagues by sea, though I was sure to meet with a storm once a week." I have nothing uncommon to take notice of in my passage through France, nothing but what other travellers have given an account of with much more advantage than I can. I travelled from Toulouse to Paris, and without any considerable stay came to Calais, and landed safe at Dover the 14th of January, after having had a severe cold season to travel in. I was now come to the centre of my travels and had in a little time all my new discovered estate safe about me, the bills of exchange which I brought with me having been currently paid. My principal guide and privy counsellor was my good ancient widow, who in gratitude for the money I had sent her, thought no pains too much nor care too great to employ for me, 
and I trusted her so entirely that I was perfectly easy as to the security of my effects. And indeed, I was very happy from the beginning, and now to the end, in the unspotted integrity of this good gentlewoman. And now, having resolved to dispose of my plantation in the Brazils, I wrote to my old friend at Lisbon, who, having offered it to the two merchants, the survivors of my trustees, who lived in the Brazils, they accepted the offer, and remitted thirty-three thousand pieces of eight to a correspondent of theirs at Lisbon to pay for it. In return I signed the instrument of sale in the form which they sent from Lisbon, and sent it to my old man, who sent me the bills of exchange for thirty-two thousand eight hundred pieces of eight for the estate, reserving the payment of one hundred moidores a year to him, the old man, during his life, and fifty moidores afterwards to his son for his life, which I had promised them, and which the plantation was to make good as a rent charge. And thus I have given the first part of a life of fortune and adventure, a life of providence's checker-work, and of a variety which the world will seldom be able to show the like of, beginning foolishly, but closing much more happily than any part of it ever gave me leave so much as to hope for. Any one would think that in this state of complicated good fortune I was past running any more hazards, and so indeed I had been, if other circumstances had concurred. But I was inured to a wandering life, had no family, nor many relations, nor, however rich, had I contracted fresh acquaintance, and though I had sold my estate in the Brazils, yet I could not keep that country out of my head, and had a great mind to be upon the wing again, especially I could not resist the strong inclination I had to see my island, and to know if the poor Spaniards were in being there. My true friend, the widow, earnestly dissuaded me from it, and so far prevailed with me, that for almost seven years she prevented my running abroad, during which time I took my two nephews, the children of one of my brothers, into my care. The eldest, having something of his own, I bred up as a gentleman, and gave him a settlement of some addition to his estate, after my decease. The other I placed with the captain of a ship, and after five years, finding him a sensible, bold, enterprising young fellow, I put him into a good ship, and sent him to sea, and this young fellow afterwards drew me in, as old as I was, to further adventures myself. In the meantime I in part settled myself here, for first of all I married, and that not either to my disadvantage or dissatisfaction, and had three children, two sons and one daughter, but my wife dying, and my nephew coming home with good success from a voyage to Spain, my inclination to go abroad and his importunity prevailed and engaged me to go in his ship as a private trader to the East Indies. This was in the year 1694. In this voyage I visited my new colony in the island, saw my successors the Spaniards, had the old story of their lives and of the villains I left there, how at first they insulted the poor Spaniards, how they afterwards agreed, disagreed, united, separated, and how at last the Spaniards were obliged to use violence with them, how they were subjected to the Spaniards, how honestly the Spaniards used them, a history, if it were entered into, as full of variety and wonderful accidents as my own part, particularly, also, as to their battles with the Caribbeans, who landed several times upon the island, and as to the improvement they made upon the island itself, and how five of them made an attempt upon the mainland, and brought away eleven men and five women prisoners, by which, at my coming, I found about twenty young children on the island. Here I stayed about twenty days, left them supplies of all necessary things, and particularly of arms, powder, shot, clothes, tools, and two workmen, which I had brought from England with me, that is, a carpenter and a smith. Besides this, I shared the lands into parts with them, reserved to myself the property of the whole, but gave them such parts respectively as they agreed on and having settled all things with them, and engaged them not to leave the place, I left them there. From thence I touched at the Brazils, from whence I sent a bark, which I bought there, with more people to the island, and in it, besides other supplies, I sent seven women, being such as I found proper for service, or for wives to such as would take them. 
As to the Englishmen, I promised to send them some women from England, with a good cargo of necessaries, if they would apply themselves to planting, which I afterwards could not perform. The fellows proved very honest and diligent after they were mastered, and had their properties set apart for them. I sent them also, from the Brazils, five cows, three of them being big with calf, some sheep, and some hogs, which when I came again were considerably increased. But all these things, with an account how three hundred carabees came and invaded them, and ruined their plantations, and how they fought with that whole number twice, and were at first defeated, and one of them killed, but at last, a storm destroying their enemies' canoes, they famished or destroyed almost all the rest, and renewed and recovered the possession of their plantation, and still lived upon the island. All these things, with some very surprising incidents and some new adventures of my own, for ten years more, I shall give a farther account of, in the second part of my story. This is the end of The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe. Thank you for listening.